t-shirt, pants, track pants, etc. Now, let us see about the features of Tirupur. First, Tirupur was connected with Coimbatore after the pop. Tirupur district as a single district on 22nd February 2009. Tirupur is located in a city of Indian states of Tamil Nadu. It is situated on the banks of Nodhiva. Long back ago, Tirupur was ruled by Cheras, Cholas, Pandyas, Mysore Kingdom and British. Tirupur is situated on the banks of Nodhiva. Tirupur is one of the biggest industries which has a major textile and knitwear hub contributing 90% of the total production part. Due to the availability of raw material population and source of water, Tirupur has developed and named as knitwear capital of India. The success story of Tirupur is made the hard work on entrepreneurship. Now, around 35 countries and known as town of export excellence. Approximately 246 mills are there in Tirupur. Totally, 6,250 units are present in Tirupur. So, Tirupur is a major textile industry. It is basically known as a traditional center for cotton ginning. Special industrial parks like Sitco have been developed. Tirupur has made the country proud. Textile industry is the second largest provider of Tirupur agriculture. Tirupur is also called as a small Japan. Next, how is textile industry formed in Tirupur? In 1921, the first ever cotton textile market was set up. In 1937, Ms. Gulam Kadar introduced knitting to the town through his venture. By the 1940s, the town for South India. By the 1978, when importer from Italy brought the first to Tirupur. They were impressed by the quality of cotton. By the 1980s, the exporters began to expand Tirupur, making Tirupur as the largest producer of cotton. Then, sustainable factors of Tirupur. There are three main sustainable factors of Tirupur. First one, conservation of water. Tirupur conserves the water by the wastewater treatment plant. They conserve it by the process of waste, which helps the people a lot. Second one, plantation. Tirupur has planted plants to reduce deforestation process. This was a great initiative which is took by Tirupur. Then, it's green energy plant. Tirupur has attracted the green energy plant which produces electricity. Water process in Tirupur. The bleaching and dyeing units has a large volume of water. They release the toxic substance dyeing water to the land or water causes land pollution or water pollution. Due to this, the government has several laws. An important law is PCB, which stands for Pollution Control Board. This Pollution Control Board cannot maintain this because there are n number of small units present there. So nowadays, the percentage was getting reduced. So soon, the government should take action and make Tirupur as a non-polluting land and a green city. Next, features of cotton. Cotton is derived from the Arabic word cuten. Arab merchants found cotton in Europe for the first ever time. In this valley civilization, cultivated in India for the first time. Chandrakanti Patel was a cottonist who first done experiment in cotton and named as father of cotton. Each cotton seed produces 20,000 fibers on the surface and a single ball contains 150,000 fibers. Cotton is also called as white gold because it is so precious and important raw material for cotton textile industry. It is also known as king of textile. Cotton can be classified into four main types, Gossypium herbacium, Gossypium hirsutum, Gossypium arboreum, and Gossypium barbandans. Pema is the best quality of cotton. Next, process of converting raw material into a valuable resource. Textile manufacturing begins cotton from the cotton plant. Then, 
The cotton is cleaned, sorted, and blended to prepare yarn. This process is called spinning. Then yarn is converted into fabric by the process of knitting. Then dyeing. Dyeing is the process of show the cloth very attractively to the kids. In dyeing, the two main types lies. One is washing as well as bleaching. Washing. Washing is the process of removing the dirt particles present in the cloth. This is done in the textile industries to make the cloth very in neat and tidy manner. Next one is bleaching. Bleaching is a process of color present in the cloth. This is done in some textile industry to prepare white cloth. Then printing. Printing is the process of to print different several designs in the cloth to show the cloth very attractively. Next, compacting. Compacting is the process of minimizing the shrinkness present in the cloth. This was an important process. Next, cutting. Cutting is also an important process which is done in textile industry. Cutting is the process of bringing the shape to the cloth. Next, stitching. Stitching is also known as apparel manufacturing. Without stitching, we can't wear a text cloth. Next is ironing. Ironing is the process of making the cloth very neat and tidy look to the cloth. Last but, the, but, the, but not the least is packing department. Packing is the process of packing the amount. Now I will share you an important note about the important processes. First one, spinning. James Hargraves from the spinning in the first ever time. Spinning can be divided into three main types. Wet spinning machine, dry spinning machine, and melt spinning machine. Second one is knitting. William Lee was the founder of knitting. 72 circular machines are there in Tirupur. Tirupur is also called as knitwear capital of India. In the statement, we can easily recognize that Tirupur is also famous for knitting. Next, dyeing. William Henry Perkin was the founder of first synthetic dye. Dyeing can be classified into three types. Cellulose fiber dyeing, protein fiber dyeing, synthetic fiber dyeing. Next is printing. Printing is the founder of Jonas Guttenberg. There are three main types of printing. Litho printing, digital printing and screen printing. Next, Tirupur Export Association. Tirupur Export Association is an organization which is mean in the year 1990s. It is mean for the cotton development of the city. Totally, there are 532 lifetime members and 150 associate members present in the organization. Today, I would like to share and that now they still follow. They always promote new textile industry in Tirupur. They also take care of the imports and exports of textile business in Tirupur. They always check the quality of cotton before they are preparing it to a fiber. They also take care of the cotton development of the city. Now, I will share needed or not. Organization is needed. For example, if yarn rate is very high, an organization can easily approach a government. So in my viewpoint, organization is needed. Next, problems faced by the cotton textile industry in Tirupur. The main problems and difficulties faced by the cotton textile in industry in Tirupur are due to the availability of easing, labor, subsidi subsidiary and alliary units such as taxation and other kind of agencies. History of textile industry. Richard Arkwright was the first who implemented the water power in 1771. Until the 19th century, the textile was woven or spun by hand. After the 19th century, the technology was improved as well as the New kind of machines also were implemented. For example, power looms, hand looms, and so on. Power looms gave the best quality of cotton ever. Asian Egyptians were the founder of textile. Next, evolution of textile business. The 
industry gained its significance due to the quality and excellence of cotton textile industry in Tirupur. The first ever cotton textile mill was started in Fort Gloucester near Kolkata in 1818. The textile industry is a group of related units which has a large varieties of natural fibers. History of in Tirupur. The textile industry led to an internet work working of the small scale industry into a major textile hub. The knitwear industrial complex of Tirupur were implemented in the year 1992, which is established by the owner of Tirupur Textile Industries. The owner of Tirupur Textile Industries is Tirupur Textile Private Limited Group. Then, evolution of textile business in Tirupur. So the businessmen started their capital with their small capital of 2 to 3 lakh that time and now they have achieved up to 200 million today. Edmund Cartwright was the looms and Indus Valley Civilization was the founder of handlooms. Famous mills in Tirupur. There are several famous mills in Tirupur. In the list, the three main famous mills lies. KPR Mills. The owner of KPR Mills is Ms. K. R. Ramasamy. Totally, they have four lakh pencils in their mills. This was a great achievement. And, and another important point to share about the mill is 95% of the women workers were working there. Eight hours of job and eight hours of education. This was a great achievement. Second one, SSM Mills. The owner of SSM Mills is Totally, they have 48,500 pencils in their mill. This also were a great achievement to SSM mills. Third, best groups of mills. The owner of best groups of mills is our Rajkumar Sam Ramasamy. Population in Tirupur. Totally, 14 lakh people were populated in Tirupur. In 14 lakh people, 10 lakh people were engaged in cotton textile industry, and other 4 lakh people were engaged in other sort of activities such as agriculture, farming, fishing and other sort of activities. Industrial Revolution Industrial Revolution is a series of changes brought by the government in the transition of small scale industry into a large scale industry, the ha production by hand into production by machine and handmade goods into machine made goods. It was started in the Great Britain in mid 18th century and early 19th century and later spread all over the world. So in Tirupur, the first aim was agriculture that in the past. So after some years, the textile industry was grown up literally. Now, textile industry second largest provider of Tirupur after agriculture. This was a great achievement to Tirupur. Then, the advantages of industrial revolution. The advantages of industrial revolution are improved quality of life, availability of goods, and availability of jobs. The year of this industrial revolution, which is that time, is 1740s to 1820s. Then, Economy of textile business in India and Tirupur. The economy of textile business in India in the year 2022 is 272.04 lakh crore. This was a great achievement. And the economy of textile business in Tirupur in the year 2022 is 29,043 lakh, which also were a great achievement to Tirupur. Then, what is GDP? GDB is termed as gross domestic product. GDB is the monetary value of services in the geographical boundaries of a nation in a financial year is termed as GDB. So totally, India contributes 14 percentage of total GDB and Tirupur contributes 2 percentage of the total GDB, which was a great achievement. The benefits of GDB are better facility development, social development, improved quality of life, and so on. Condition of Tirupur in COVID-19. This COVID-19 led to a drawback for many people. Many owners left their job because they can't run their family easily. Many laborers also dropped their job because of the unavailability of from jobs, money, food, and so on. So this led to a drawback for many owners. 
textile industries. So due to this, now, now also the textile industry was not grown fast. Another important point is due to the Russia and Ukraine war, textile industry is not good now. Then, checking and packing department. Checking and packing department is an important process in the cotton textile industry. Checking department is the process of checking whether a cloth has an environmental factor like a damage or not. So this was an important process in industry. Packing department is a process of packing it with the covers, sealing it, making the price and sending to the customers and finally they return the amount. Forms of market. Market can be classified into three main types. Local market. Local market is done all over a town or a city. The quality and price will be very low. National market. National market is done in the, all over the nation. The quality and price will be medium. International market. International market is done all over the world. The quality and price will be very high. What is yarn and what are the types of yarn? Yarn is a thread which is made in cotton textile industry. Yarn can be classified into several types. Today, I would like to share the two main important types of yarn. One is staple yarn, another one is filament yarn. Staple yarn. Staple yarn is a short fiber which is mostly made up of natural fibers such as flax seeds, cotton, silk, jute, linen and so on. Filament yarn. Filament yarn is the mostly made of handmade fibers which is very long and continuous yarn. So it is mostly made up of handmade fibers such as polyester, nylon, rayon and so on. Next, embroidery. Embroidery is an art of adding the thread in the cloth. This is implemented by the Near East and China for the first ever time. Embroidery can be classified into several varieties. Today, I would like to share six to seven types of embroidery. Pulkari embroidery, Gotha embroidery, Ari work embroidery, uh, stump work embroidery, ribbon work embroidery, cruel embroidery, downstitch embroidery, and so on. Uses of embroidery. The uses of embroidery is to add up the texture, color, dimension, richness to the textile. Types of embroidery. Embroidery can be classified into two main types. One is handmade, another one is machine made. In machine made, the two main types lies free motion as well as computerized. Why is the textile industry known as the second largest after agriculture? Cotton textile industry provides 14.6 percentage of the total production. It earns foreign exchanges up to 24.6 percentage the total number of varieties and 14.6% per, of GDP because in India the land is so fertile. It employs 35 million people directly and known as second largest after agriculture. Is textile industry a good investment or not? In my viewpoint, a textile industry is a good investment. So the textile in, in the textile industries contributes good results to the investors. So it contributes 2% of the GD and it employs 35 billion people directly. Conclusion. Tirupur is the Manchester of South India. It gave job for many families and contribute 2% of GDP. We all join our hands and make Tirupur as a non-polluting land and a green city. By telling a quote, I would like to conclude my topic. A quote said by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. Thinking is the capital, enterprise is the solution. So hard work never fails. Work hard and achieve in your life. I thank my school management for giving me this wonderful opportunity to showcase my talents. I also extend my thankness to my teachers, parents, and all friends and cooperative teachers. Thank you. My warm greetings. To, my warm greetings to the gathering. I am Akshna of Grade 9B. I am delighted to have the opportunity to speak in front of you today. I am excited to dive into the topic, the evolution of computers and computing, with you all today. 
In this session, you will get to know about the differentiation between computer and computing, then generations of computers and computing. After that, differentiation between computer and computing, then development of computers to laptops as well as smartphones. Then about the father of computer, then we will conclude our today's session. First, what is evolution? Here, evolution refers to the ongoing development and improvement of computer hardware and software over time, as well as the process of innovation and progress within the computer industry. The evolution of computer hardware involves the gradual development and improvement of various components that make up a computer, such as the CPU, memory, and storage devices. The evolution of computer hardware are more faster, more powerful, and more efficient than ever before. Software evolution refers to the ongoing development and improvement of computer programs, operating systems, and other software applications. This includes the addition of new features, functionality, as well as bug fixes and security updates. The evolution of computer industry as a whole emerges the new trends, technologies, business, and models. For example, the rise of cloud computing and mobile devices had a significant impact on the way the business and individuals use computers. Overall, the evolution of computer industry has been a rapid and ongoing process driven by advances in technologies. As a result, computers have become an essential part in our modern life. Second word, computer. A computer is an electronic device designed to process, store, and retrieve data. It can perform a wide variety of tasks, like ranking from simple calculations and data entry to complex operations, like running software applications, playing games, and creating multimedia content. Computer requires CPU to execute instructions, memory to hold the data and instructions temporarily, and then storage devices like hard drives or solid state drives to hold the data and instructions permanently. Computer also requires keyboard and mouse as well as output devices like printers and speakers to send and provide feedback to the users of computers. Today, we have personal computers, supercomputers, microcomputers, servers, laptops, mobile phones or smartphones, and tablets, and many more devices. Each type of computer has different features and capabilities depending on its intent use and design. Overall, computers have become an uh, essential part to our modern lives by powering everything from education and entertainment to commerce and scientific research. Third word, computing. Computing refers to the use of computer technology to store and manage data, information, and other resources. Nowadays, computer, computing are available in different fields, including science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and many more. It is utilization of the hardware, software, and networks to perform tasks like ranking from basic calculations and data entry to complex operations like data analysis, modeling, and simulation. With the increasing availability of computing technology, it has become an integral part in our modern society, facilitating communication, innovation, and progress. I hope that my explanation has provided clearer understanding on the topic. Now, let me differentiate computer and computing in short. While the terms computer and computing are related, they slightly differ to their concepts. In short, a computer is an electronic device used for computing technology, whereas computer, computing is a more general concept used in different activities related to the use of computer technology. Now, let us get into the topic, the evolution of computers and computing. 
the evolution of computers began with the invention of abacus, a simple counting device used by Asian civilizations over 2,000 years ago. The next major development came up in 19th century within the invention of mechanical calculators like difference engine and analytical engine. Now, let us see the generations of computers. First generation computer is also known as vacuum tube computer. These vacuum tubes are the primary electronic component for the first generation computer. These vacuum tubes were very large, expensive, and required a lot of space, and it also generated a lot of heat and smoke, which led to frequent failures and maintenance issues. One of the key inventors of the first generation computer is John ba Marchulli. He is an American physicist and computer scientist. He is credited with co-inventing the ENIAC, that is Electronic Numerical Integrated and Computer with J. Presper Eckert in 1945. John Marchulli went on to develop other computers like UNIVAC, which was the first general purpose computer, and then ENIAC was the first commercial purpose computer which used vacuum tubes. These early computers played a crucial role in the development of modern day computers, and their inventors are considered as the pioneers in their field. Now, second generation computer. Second generation computer used transistors in place of vacuum tubes. These transistors were smaller, faster, more reliable, and less power hungry compared to the first generation computer. The key inventor, one of the key inventors of the second generation computer is John Baden. He is also an American physicist and computer scientist. He is credited with co-inventing the transistors with Walter Brayton and William Shockley in 1954. John Baden went on to develop other computers, in, uh, other computers like a transdrized computer named Tradic in 1957. These second generation computer laid the foundation for the further development in the computing field. Now, third generation computer. Third generation computer used integrated circuits, that is ICs, in place of uh, uh, transistors. These ICs were developed during 1960s to 1970s. These ICs consist of many transistors, resistors, capacitors, and along with associated security. These ICs were smaller, faster, more powerful, and more reliable compared to the old generation computer. In this generation, they used real-time sharing, social networking, and operating systems were used. One of the key inventors of the third generation computer is Jack Kilby. All the high-level languages like Fortran 224, COBOL, ALGOL 68, Pascal, and many more were used in this generation computers. Now, fourth generation computer. Fourth generation computer used VLSI technology circuits, which were developed during 1970s to 1980s. The VLSI are the microprocessor chips. VLSI stands for very large scale integrated circuits. These VLSA circuits has nearly 5,000 transistors, resistors, and capacitors along with associated security. These VLSA circuits were smaller, more reliable, and more powerful compared to the ICs. The, one of the key inventors of the fourth generation computer is Federico Fagin and Intel Corporation. In this generation, they used real-time networks, multi-programming operating systems, and social networking. All the, all the I-level languages like C, C++, DBase, and many more were used. Now, fifth generation computer. Fifth generation computer began by the Japanese Ministry for International Trade and Industry in 1982. In this generation, VLSI technology has advanced and became ULSI technology, which stands for ultra-large-scale integrated circuits. 
most of the computers were based upon uh, logical programming and massively parallel computing. This fifth generation computer was based upon massively parallel computing hardware and AI, that is artificial intelligence software. Artificial intelligence has the ability to illustrate the means and methods of computers to think the same as human beings. Nowadays, artificial intelligence are applied in each and every field, including auto automobiles. In this generation, all uh, high-level languages like C, C++, .NET, Java, and many more were used. Now, let us see the development of computers to laptops. The development of computers to laptops represent a significant evolution in computing technology. Initially, computers were large and bulky, but efforts were made to reduce their size and improve portability. Personal computers brought powering to the individuals and small businesses. Personal computers, for portable computer is also known as luggageable computers, were introduced, followed by the development of laptops in 1990s. Laptops form a compact form, lightweight design, and built-in battery power. They have continued to evolve, becoming thinner, lighter, and more powerful. The development of computers to laptops represent a milestone in the histories. Nowadays, laptops have become an essential tools for the students, workers, enabling the work on the go to work, study, and do various activities from anywhere. Now, let us see the development of smartphones. The development of smartphones is a groundbreaking advancement in communication and computing field. They have continued to evolve. They have continued to evolve from the basic mobile phones to offer internet connectivity, app stores, touch screens, and powerful hardware. These smartphones have transformed many industries such as e-commerce, banking, insurance, healthcare, and navigation to give connectivity to the users of computers. The development of smartphones has bridged the gap between the communication and computing technology with the powerful and portable devices that we use today. The, these, were, these were used as, these smartphones were helped us in connected, informed, and entertained wherever we go. Now, let us see a short note on the Charles Babbage. He was born on December 26, 1791 in, uh, 1791 in London and died on October 18, 1871 in London. He was an English mathematician. He played a key role in the development of the modern day postal system in England, revolutionizing communication and mail delivery. He invented he invented speedometer and designed a locomotive calculator, a device used to clear the obstacles in the railroad tracks. He is known as the father of the computer because he was the first to invent the analytical engine, which, was, which led to the creation of the modern day computers. Charles Babbage's enduring legacy lies in his conception of the uh, lies in the conception of the modern day computers. Ada Lovelace's collaboration with Anna Charles Babbage is a noteworthy. Ada Lovelace's translation of a French paper to the Charles Babbage's analytical engine added her own annotations, added her own utter annotations to execute how the sequence of the calculations work. This is a groundbreaking work. Overall, Charles Babbage's enduring work not only lasted in computer or computing field, it also represented in mathematics, engineering, science, technology, commerce, business, and many more, many more fields. Overall, Charles Babbage's collaboration with Ada Lovelace is an everlasting impact. Conclusion. Let me conclude by summarizing the remarkable journey let me conclude by summarizing the remarkable journey, the evolution of computers and computing. Uh, though the mod
though the early days computers were powerful, but these modern days computers have changed our lives in countless ways. For, though, although the first generation computer is expensive and very large, it laid the foundation for the further development in the field. Then second generation computer used transistors and they have played a crucial role and their inventors are considered as the pioneers in the field. Third generation computers made the users to afford it. Fourth generation computer is a global internet connectivity computers. And then fifth generation computer is an ambitious goal to each and every users of the computers and especially to the computer scientists. Overall, as we stand on the shoulders of the Jains who came before us, we have the opportunity to shape the future of the computing field, to shape the computing field for the benefits of all. Thank you. Good afternoon to esteemed guests, my dear friends and teachers. I'm glad to introduce myself on this wonderful occasion. Myself, B. Devamitra of grade 9B, standing before you to deliver on the topic, the history and future of space tourism. I'm confident that we'll be having a clear understanding of my topic at the end of this session. Throughout my lecture, you'll be understanding what is space tourism, the first space tourist, the second man to go to space as space tourist, first woman to go to space as space tourist, a man who went to space twice within two weeks, present space tourism, and also the history of space tourism. To begin, let me start with a beautiful and famous quote. Space tourism is a logical outwin for an adventure tourism market. There are many reasons why I started with them quotes. Through this, I'm going to explain you what is space tourism before entering into our topic. So with this quotes, I'm going to explain what is space tourism. Space tourism is not only your physical fitness, it is also your mental fitness. If you are a person who likes adventure, you can visit space. This is a clear choice for you. And this quote is said by a famous space tourist named Mark Shuttleworth. We will be also learning about him in this session. We have visited many tourist spots and heard of many tourist spots. But space is a new kind of tourist spot which we never heard of. And would is both interesting and captivating topic. For a better understanding of history and future of space tourism, first let me explain what is space tourism. Space tourism refers to the activity of traveling into space for recreational purposes. Sometimes it is also called as citizen space exploration, commercial human space flights, and personal human space flights that covers orbital, suborbital, and even beyond Earth's orbit. On April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin was the first man who went to space as space. However, it is important to clarify that as he was not a space tourist, and his mission was a government-identified mission. So here, here our topic is only about space tourism, not about the man who went to space first. We'll also be learning about our first man who went to space, a space tourist. And since less than, however, since less than 600 members got chance to visit space, they did not use the chance properly. So that Yuri Gagarin was the first man to visit space. So, as I said earlier, there are three types of space tourism, orbital, suborbital, and Earth's orbit. First, we're going to see about orbital space tourism, and also the man went to space as space tourist. The advent of space tourism occurred at the end of the 1990s with a deal between the Russian company and American company. The American company named Space Adventures and the Russian company named Mirkrop. Mirkrop is a private venture with charges to space station Mir. To generate income for the aging space station, Mirkrop decided to sell a trip to Mir and Tito was the first paying passenger. However, before Tito could make a trip, the decision was made to de of Bittel Mir. After the intervention of Space Adventures, the mission 
was diverted to ISS, which means International Space Station. This is a mission where arranged by government where every individual space tourist gets certified by some tests and also private space tourism companies get certificate for their own spacecraft. Why they got approval for their own spacecraft is because like in 2020 there was a crash in the orbital issues so that it is difficult for the passengers to travel so that only ISS will certify each private space tourism companies to go to space. Janus Tito, a person who paid $20 million to book a seat. His trip was also arranged by Space Adventures, as we saw before. A person who spent seven whole days. Next, let me describe a few words about the spaceship in which he went. The spaceship named Sios TM-32. The spaceship is 50 meter tall and stainless steel lasting anywhere from few minutes to few hours. Few minutes to few hours. Launched from Bakuri Bayan Sios U rocket at 7.39 p.m. Sios TM-32 is a passenger, Russian passenger aircraft. And however, it was the first trip for every private space tourism companies, and Inesito was the first man, SpaceX hopes to launch it on anchored Earth's orbit. SpaceX is founded by Elon Musk. And he was a successful businessman from the continent of Africa. There are more things to say about him, but here the lecture is about the space tourism. So that, let's move on to other topics. Now, I'm going to say about, I'm proud to say about our history. It's nothing but the first Indian to visit space a space tourist. The first Indian to go to space as a space tourist was Santos George Kulangra, who is an Indian who went to space as a space tourist. After paying the whole span, 20 lakh dollar to book a seat in Virgin Galactic. Virgin Galactic is founded by Richard Branson. Virgin Galactic is founded by Richard Branson. In 2005, he came across the ad in the British newspaper about the possibilities of a person to go to space. After that, in the year 2007, he mailed about his interest of space tourism. After a few years passed, he did not get any chance. After again, he mailed. After this only, in the year 2007, he got a chance to visit the organization. And he was passed in every test conducted by the organization in the year 2011. After a few days passed, due to COVID pandemic, his mission was failed. But Richard Branson successful flight into space on the year 2022, July 11, Sunday was successful. Reports say 10 members including Santosh will fly in upcoming months. Santosh George Kulangara is a resident of Kerala. We can know this by its name itself. And Kerala people and the government, which is ISS, was very happy on the first space tourist from India. After that, Kerala people has been celebrated this as a festival in their own. Santos George Kulangara is a YouTuber where he posted every photos and videos which has been taken in space once he returned back. Next, we're going to see about the second space tourist. So the second space tourist is Mark Shuttleworth. Once Dennis Tito showed a new form of tourism is possible, within a year, quickly many people followed this. Within a year, Mark Shuttleworth was the second man who went to space as space tourist. He was also the first man. How you will be having a doubt if, was a, if he was the second man to go to space, how he will be the first man? I'll clarify your doubts. He was the first man to go to space in the outer space from the continent of Africa. 
On April 12, 2005, he began his journey upwards to ISS as a part of Sears TM-34. As we saw in as we saw before, for Dennis Tito's trip, the spaceship was named as Sears TM-32. For now, Mark Shettleworth's spaceship named Sears TM-34. So that we can have a clear understanding that every space tourist have a unique number like this. After this, a new brand was launched, so that Sears TM was cancelled and Sears TMA was arrived. We'll be learning about Sears TMA in this session. Mark Shuttleworth, a person who paid $20 million to book a seat, as also Dennis Tito paid the same amount. He is nothing but who got inspired of Dennis Tito as Mark Shuttleworth and became as a second space tourist. And he mentioned in an article that he got eight months training in Star City. And his trip was also arranged by Space Adventures. And he published a book called Aria, where, as we saw in before, that Santos George Kulangara posted his videos and photos in YouTube. But this, this man is unique. He po published a book called Aria, where the book contains the pictures which has been taken in, in space and the image of spacecrafts. Next, we are going to see about Anska Ansari, the first female to go to space as space tourist. Now, women are in every field. This may be an example for that. On September 18, 2006, Anska Ansari was the first female who went to space as space tourist after launching on board a Sios VR mission TMA-9. As I mentioned above, there are new launches of Sios, and this is a new brand called Sios TMA-9. A person who spent 11 days in outer space, and she was also the second man who went in outer, she was also the first, second woman who went to space in out, from the continent of Africa in outer space. Her contribution to space adventures does not start with this trip. Prior to her spaceship, Anska Ansari was a major benefactor of Anzari X Prizes. The $10 million competition to build world's first flight that can launch us twice into space within two weeks. And this spaceship also gave name for space adventures because space adventures also involved in making her dream come successful. They also helped her to make a new spaceship. After this, many new clients joined, joined space adventures for their new spaceship, ma spaceship models. So that they thought that if we done this before itself, many people we can gain more attraction to our company. But that was not. Anska Ansari is a an co-operator and founder of Prodia Mission. She is a very successful businessman. She was the MA9. As we mentioned before, in Anska Ansari's in which Anska Ansari went was Sios TMA-9, which was, which was also named as Sios FG Launch Vehicle. It was a Huma Sios TMA-9, was a Sios mission to an international space station, ISS, launched by ANSP. Next, we are going to see about a person who went to space twice within two weeks. Charles Simonji was the fir first man to go to sp space twice within two weeks. According to the order, he was the fifth space tourist. On the year 2011, 11, September 18. For both the trips, which was arranged by Space Adventures, he paid $60 million reportedly. And he got 12, 12 months, which which nearly comes to one year in Unique Tourism Club. After this, many this Unique Tourism Club made, got many attraction towards it. After that only, many space tourism clients joined Unique Tourism Club 
for their own missions, which this Unique Tourism Club was started on March 29, 2010. And the spaceship which in, in which, which Sala Simonji went was CIOS TMA-34. Next, we're going to see about Gail Elibret. Gail Elibret is the second Indian who went to space, and also the first man to go to space from Canada. Let me describe a few words about Gail Elibret. Gail Elibret's spaceship name CIOS TMA-14 and landed on CIOS TMA-32. And his spaceship dedicated to raising awareness of water scarcity around the world. 180-minute program contributed for raising awareness of water scarcity around the world. And ISS has been also participated in this mission. So that, so that only gained more number of members in this. As after his mission, he was called in Canadian Federal Court for appeal. After that, the judgment was said that his job was only, wa wanted to be only considered as personal, not work-related, and to access 90% income tax of his, pay, of his spaceship in which he went. The esteemed cost of the spaceship in which he went was 56 crore, 26,000, and etc. And after this, he felt very, after this, he felt very difficult, and he was arranging for a second space trip. And still, he is designing a new spaceship. As we saw before, Charles Simonji, still he holds a record of 26, Point five days spending in space. Still, anyone cannot break this record. Next, we're going to see about the scientific space tourist Olsen. Once, Lenestito and Mark Shuttleworth showed a new form of tourism is possible. There was a three years gap in between. Every space tourism company are looking for the next passenger. And all around the world, every passengers are looking for the next man who will be the next space tourist. A man who got inspired of Nenis Tito and Mark Shuttleworth was a third person to visit space as space tourist named Olsen. Olsen is a scientific space tourist and also a scientific writer. Due to some orbital issues in space, his, his spacecraft was landed immediately on the Earth. After that, he was very worried, and he, was, he is designing a new spaceship which will take pass passengers, six passengers, and a chief commander of that mission. A person who went with Olsen was chief commander of Sios M34, and six members, including him, went in that mission. Next, we can see about birth of space tourism. However, we all celebrate birthdays. There is a particular day when they found, when they found space tourism. Let me explain to you in an unclear way. After Apollo Company's investigation opportunities to send civilians rather than government officials, those are NASA astronauts to space, and in 1970s, an international contractor for NASA space shuttle program has researched a passenger model in which four members, including chief commander of the mission, can go. After this successful mission, only Dennis Tito was the first man to visit space as space tourist. Still, he keeps on re researching of space and finding more things. And Dennis Tito and other space tourists also thanked him for thanked him for a new research named space tourism. Next, present space tourism. Why, as our topic is history and future of space tourism, you'll be having a doubt why I'm going to say about present space tourism. I say about present space tourism because you'll be having a clear understanding of future 
future of space tourism by knowing the present space tourism. When it comes to the present space tourism, for the past decades, private space tourism companies are developing a spacecraft that take passengers to suborbital flights and which gives them a thrilling adventure which takes them to edge of edge of the spacecraft and back down to earth where there are only two companies which got approval by FFA to take passengers to suborbital flight those two companies are blue origin and mirkrop FFA which means federal aviation administration is an government approval machine where these two are the only companies got chance to take passengers to suborbital flights you will be having a doubt whether there are not no other no other companies to take passengers up to suborbital flights there are companies which take passengers to suborbital flights but still they are an end research like the two companies which take another two companies which take passengers to suborbital flight are aircraft and then blue origin blue instant there are researching to take passengers to suborbital flights where in an higher altitude more than 15 50 meter as these two companies made an record next the prior of space tourism who first proposed the idea the idea of space tourism was first proposed by science fiction writers such as jules verne and author in the year 1960s to 1970s in the mid 1965 the all around the world space tourism gained knowledge after that most of the people start started researching what is space tourism and who was the man who went to space at first but since there was no space tourist to go after seeing this message only Dennis Tito was the first man to go to space a first man who first proposed the idea of space tourism in an serious manner was Gary Hudson he also founded an institution named SSI which means space study institution where a person also get trained for for mental and physical health of a person to go to space as space tourist and still that institution are there and most of the people are getting training there next future of space tourism when it comes to future of space tourism where all dreams come true in india there are there are two space tourism companies one in delhi there are they are making a new model of spaceship where the three passengers will be take, taken to space without any cost in india and government also approved their mission for this and successful mission while prices may not decrease immediately and space hotels may not emerge soon it is not in reason to lose hope in the long awaited dream of space tourism and as i said earlier anska anzaris the 10 million dollar world's first flight that can launch us twice into space has been won by an american with a steam conclusion as i come to an conclusion it is important to recap all those points which i had said it could be easy for you to understand so first we had son what is space tourism and first indian who went to space as space tourist and first man who went to space as space tourist first woman who went to space as space tourist and a man who went to space twice within two weeks the two main companies which take passengers to suborbital flights and etc would I, i want to thank the school management for providing me an wonderful opportunities and i also thank and i also thank my friends for helping me and teachers for supporting me through the through 3 to 4 months for my lecture thank you think something 
down on paper. A warm greetings to one and all present here. I am Hashini from grade 9B, standing before you to give a lecture on the topic, the history of Tamil cinema. We all used to watch many movies. While watching those movies, some may have questions like, what was the first film, who directed it, and when it was released. Now, let's get to know about it. Tamil cinema is also known as Kollywood. It is a part of Indian cinema. Tamil cinema is primarily engaged in the production of motion pictures in Tamil language. A motion picture is a series of still photographs project, pro, projected onto a screen using light in rapid succession. Tamil cinema have common roots with and borrows from other regional and national cinema traditions and thus shares some characteristics with those traditions. It also, however, draws from an aesthetic history specific to India and its southern regions. It has developed formal and narrative conventions of its own. The history of Tamil cinema can be divided into two eras. Tamil cinema from 1950 to 1970 and Tamil cinema from 1970 to the present day. With time, Tamil cinema have changed a lot and have become more varied. While there are commercial films to entertain the audiences, serious films are also screened to educate the masses while entertaining them. Tamil film industry keeps on releasing films that surprise the audience either with their theme or technology. Tamil film industry, which was established in Midras, became the secondary hub for Hindi cinema, other South Indian film industry, and as well as for Sri Lankan cinemas. A gifted group of music directors, choreograph choreographers, cinematographers, and others have made Tamil film industry to grow. The first Tamil talking feature film was Kali, uh, Kalidas. It was directed by H.M. Reddy and released on 31st October 1931. The first silent film was Kicha Kavadam, which was directed by R. Nataraja Mudalyar in 1918. A silent film is a film where sound will not be produced. The first Tamil talking feature film was uh, Kalidas. Kalava was the full and taki made entirely in Tamil. Sita Kalyanam was the first color film which was released in the year 1934. Before this all movies, many movies were released but they did not run successfully. During the British rule, a man named M. Edwards first screened a selection of silent films at the Victoria Public Hall. The selected films all featured non-fictional subject. They were mostly photographic records of day-to-day -day events. After a few years, there were regular ticketed shows, which was started by Mrs. Clark. But this lasted only for few months. Warwick Major was the first person who built the cinema theater named the Electric Theater, which still stands. This place was the favorite haunt of British community in Madras. But soon the theater was shut down after a few years. Now that building is a part of post office complex and Anna Sali, Mount Shru. Soon on Anna Sali, the Lyric Theatre was also built. This venue boosted up with varieties of events such as plays in English, dance, songs, etc. Silent films were also screened as an additional attraction. Swami Kanu Vincent was a railway draftsman from Tiruchirappalli. He became a travelling exhibitor in 1905. He showed short movies in a tent set up in Esplanade. He, got, he bought the film projector and the silent film from the Frenchman DuPont and set up a business as film exhibitor. Soon he tied up with well-known film producing company and 
imported projectors. This helped new cinema houses to sprout across the presidency. In later years, he produced talkies and also built a cinema theatre in Coimbatore. He is the man who introduced the concept of tent cinema, in which a tent was erected on a stretch of open land close to a town or village to screen the films. The first of its kind was established in Madras, called Edison's Grand Cinema Megaphone. Now, let me say about an Indian who built cinema theatre. Raghupati Venkai Naidu was a successful photographer. He took over the equipment after the exhibition and set up a tent cinema near the Madras High Court. But this equipment, he showed short movies like Raja's Cascade, P.L. Fish in the Victoria Public Hall. When this proved successfully, he showed short movies in a tent set up in Esplanade. When he gathered enough money, he put up a permanent cinema house in Madras called Gaiti in 1914. Gaiti was the first cinema theater to be built by an Indian. Soon, he added two more theaters, Crown Theater in Mint and Globe in Parasara Welcome. Globe was later known as Roxy. Now, let me share a few words about the American film director. Ellis Roderick Dungan was an American film director who is well known for working in Indian films, predominantly in Tamil cinema from 1936 to 1950. During his career in South India, he directed many debate films with many popular actors. Now, let me share about the arrival of entertainment industry. In the late 1800s, Salem saw the rise of entertainment industry as Vadivil became a popular form of entertainment. Salem had Below's amusement park, which was the perfect venue for showing Vadivil show. A Vadivil show is a funny play with music. Most of the films screened then were shorts made in United States and in Britain. In 1909, a man named T.H. Afton founded Peninsular Film Services and produced some short films for the local audiences. But soon, Harlong films, which narrated dramatic stories, later known as drama films, were imported. From 1912 onwards, feature films made in Bombay were also screened in Madras. The era of silent films had ended. The arrival of drama films firmly established the cinema as a popular entertainment form. Fascinated by this new entertainment form, an automobile dealer named R. Natraja Mudalyar, as we seen him earlier, decided to venture into film production concern. After a few days in his training with Smith in Pune, he started a film production concern in 1916. After starting this only, he directed the film named Kichakavadam, as we saw that earlier. By the end of 1930s, the legislature of state of Madras passed an act called Entertainment Tax Act of 1939, which was imposed on commercial entertainments like movie tickets, sport events, etc. The special rules for tax rates and tax exemption was determined by local authorities. The man who truly laid the foundation of South Indian cinema was N. R. Ainan. After a few years in his film distribution, he started a production company in Madras called General Pictures Corporation, which was popularly known as GPC. Beginning with the faithful wife Dharma Patini, GPC had made around 24 feature films. It functioned as film school. And, all, and also, this is the only production company which produced most of the silent films. It, in Tamil Nadu, GPC Studio is situated in Madras. Its branches are also in Colombo, Rangoon, Singapore, etc. The ways of Vishnu or Vishnu Leela 
which R. Prakasha made in 1932, was the last silent film produced in Madras. Unfortunately, the silent era of South Indian cinema has not been documented well. When the darkies appeared, silent films slowly disappeared. Many drama halls came up in Madras, in which short films were screened in the afternoon and plays were enacted in night. But they did not screen silent films. With the end of the era of silent films in the 1930s, many stage actors joined Tamil cinema and brought the ideologies of Gandhian philosophies with them. This scene changed in 1934 when the Madras got its first sound studio. By this time, all the cinema houses in Madras were wired for sound. Narayanin, who had been active during silent era, founded Srinivasa Sini Tone, in which his wife worked as sound recordist. Srinivasa Sini Tone was the first sound studio to come up in Madras. The second sound studio to come up in Madras was Vail Pictures, which was started by M.D. Rajan on L. Dams Road and Dunmore Bangla, which belonged to the Raja of Pithaburam. Before long, many sound stu studio came up in Madras. 36 Takis was produced in Madras in the year of 1935. Playback singer. Do you know who was the first playback singer? The first playback singer was Lalita Venkatram. A playback singer is a singer whose work is recorded in advance. The art of playback singing involves one or more singers performing a piece of work. There are Two main reasons why playback singing is done. The first reason is it is cheaper for the film producers. The second reason is sometimes the actor or actress may not be able to sing. On that time, playback singing is done. A.V. Mayyappan was the first person who introduced the concept of playback singing in his film named Nanda Kumar. A.V. Mayyappan established A.V. production in Badapalani, Chennai. The playback singer in the film Nandakumar was Lalita Venkatram. This film became the first film to feature a playback singer. I think most of the people have the questions like, whether early cinemas have music? Yes, music is an essential part of cinema. A movie must have music. Even in silent film, the music was often played along with the film. The reason is that if the movie is completely silent, the audience may get bored or they may dislike the movie if it is completely silent. Hence, even when audio recording machinery was not attuned to the game, live sounds like playing music, footstep sounds, clapping sounds was often played along with the film. In fact, silent film was not completely silent. The music was often played along with the film. Is TV serials a part of cinema? Cinema in common is known as the film or the movies that we used to watch. According to me, TV serials are not part of cinema. I have reasons for my opinion. The first reason is a movie may run about two to three hours, whereas TV serials do not have any time schedule. They may run for years. They may have many episodes. The second reason is movies will be screened on cinema theaters and as well as on television. But TV serials, in the name event, we can see that TV serials will only be screened in television and not in other, other languages. Thus, TV serials are not part of cinema. Tamil cinema have strict norms. The government of Tamil Nadu made provisions for entertainment tax exemption for Tamil films having only titles in Tamil language and not in other languages. This was passed by the government on 22nd July 2006. The first film to release after this order was Onakum Enakum. This was released on 28 July 2006. The original title of this film was Something Something Onakum Enakum. 
and half English and a half title Tamil film. Strict norms were passed and the title was changed as Onakkum Enakkum. If any director directed Tamil film with English title, they must pay tax for it. Do you know film studios in Chennai are bounded by legislation such as Cinematography Film Rules of 1948, Cinematograph Act of 1952 and the Corporate Act of 1957. In Tamil Nadu, cinema ticket prices are regulated by the government of Tamil Nadu. Single screen theatres may charge maximum of rupees 50, whereas a theatre with more than three screens may charge maximum of rupees 120 or 150 per ticket. Okay, now let me share about CBFC. Before starting a film, you may see a picture like this. Do you know what is this? This is known as Central Board of Film Certification, that is CBFC. Central Board of Film Certification is a film certification bo body in the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting of Government of India. It is tasked with regulating the public exhibition for the films shown under the Act of Cinematograph Act of 1952. The Cinematograph Act of 1952 outlines the strict certification process for the films shown in public venues. The movies that are screened on television and on cinema theatres may only be publicly exhibited after the certification by the board and edited. Currently, the board issues four certificates, U, U by A, A and S. Originally, there was only two certificates, U and A. U by A and S was added in the later months. Films with U certification are fit for unrestricted public exhibition and are for family friendly. These films contain universal themes like education, drama, family friendly and so on. Films with U by A certification can be watched by a child about 12 years under parental guidance. Films with A certification can be watched uh, by a person about 18 years, that is, adults. These films contain more violence and more abuse words. Films with A certification cannot be watched by public. These are the films that can be only watched by who are, uh, people who are doctors, engineers, scientists, and so on. Tamil Nadu State Film Awards. Tamil, Tamil cinema had won many awards. Tamil Nadu State Film Awards were given for excellence in Tamil cinema by the government of Tamil Nadu. It is given annually to honor the best talents and to provide encouragement and incentive among the South Indian film industry by the government of Tamil Nadu. The awards are decided by a committee headed by a judge. The awards was first given in the year 1967 and discontinued after 1970. The awards was again given in the year of 1977 and continued till 1982. The awards was not given in the year of 1971 to 1976. However, in the year of 1977, the best actor and actress were given for the years of 1971 to 1976 by the government of Tamil Nadu. The awards are split into four categories. They are Creative Awards, Technical Awards, Special Awards and Retired Awards. Creative Awards includes awards for Best Actor, Actress, Comedian, Villain and so on. The awards, uh, Technical Awards includes awards for Best Stunt Coordinator, uh, Playback Singer and so on. Awards, Special Awards includes awards such as Honorary Awards. Retired awards are the awards which was not given in the recent years. Uh, like uh, the awards like debate, male and female debate awards. Now, let me share a few words about Suyambaram. Suyambaram is a 1999 Tamil language comedy film which contains of 14 major directors, 19 cinematographers and over 30 plus leading actor. This film holds Guinness World Record for having more, uh, more directors, cinematographers, and, and even actors. The main reason uh, for holding Guinness World Record is this film complete di completed directing within 23 hours and 58 minutes. 
தமிழ்நாடு 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 ஃபிலிம்ஸ் ஹேவ் பீன் ஸ்பிரெட் ஆல் ஓவர் த வேர்ல்ட் மெனி தமிழ் ஃபிலிம்ஸ் ஹேவ் பீன் ரீமேடட் பை அதர் ஃபிலிம் இண்டஸ்ட்ரி இட் இஸ் எஸ்டிமேட்டட் இன் த மனோரமையா புக் தமிழ் சினிமா அக்கௌண்ட்ஸ் நியர்லி ஜீரோ பாயிண்ட் ஒன் பர்சன்ட் ஆஃப் டொமஸ்டிக் ப்ராடக்ட் பை த கவர்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் தமிழ்நாடு தஸ் ஐ வாண்ட் டு கன்க்ளூட் தட் சினிமா இஸ் அபவுட் த பீப்புள் அண்ட் வி ஆர் வெரி எமோஷனல் பீப்புள் தட்ஸ் வை வி சி தோஸ் அப்ஸ் அண்ட் தோஸ் டவுன்ஸ் அண்ட் தோஸ் கலர்ஸ் தட் இஸ் வாட் தமிழ் சினிமா இஸ் அபவுட் ஐ வாண்ட் டு ஐ ரியலி தேங்க் மை ஸ்கூல் மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் ஃபார் கிவிங் மீ திஸ் ஒண்டர்ஃபுல் ஆப்பர்ச்சுனிட்டி தேங்க் யூ Warm greetings to one and all present here. Myself Sarvatanya from grade 9. To start with, my topic is the power of your subconscious mind. Do you all know the answers? Or have you all ever wondered the questions? Why is one man sad and another happy? Why is one man joyous and prosperous and another poor and miserable? Why does one man have a beautiful luxurious home while another lives out a meager existence in a slum? Why is one man a genius in his word or profession, while the other toils and moils all his life without doing or accomplishing anything worthwhile? Why is one man getting positive thoughts and another getting negative thoughts? Why is one woman happily married and her sister very unhappy and frustrated? Why is one man healed of a so-called incurable disease and another isn't? Why are so many good, kind, religious people suffer the tortures of the damned in their mind and body why is it so many immoral irreligious people succeed and prosper and enjoy radiant health why is one yes another an abject failure why is one speaker outstanding and immensely popular and another mediocre and unpopular is there an answer to these questions in the workings of your conscious and subconscious mind there most certainly is Now let me tell you some interesting and useful facts about your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind is like a huge memory bank. It permanently stores everything that ever happens to you and its capacity is worth third. By the time you reach the age of 21, you have already permanently stored more than 100 times the contents of the entire world's encyclopedia. and a hypnosis that is a drowsy or a sleepy state people can often remember with perfect clarity past events that happened many years before but the doubt is why don't we actually recall everything that our subconscious minds hold while your unconscious memory is virtually perfect it is your conscious recall that is suspect the exciting news is that we can business to reprogram our subconscious harness the power of positive thinking to overcome negative thoughts and bad habits to achieve all of our life dreams let's me explain the circumstance with the help of a story how to harness the power of positive thinking a young boy living in the village was troubled by the habit of not being able to forget the old bad memories If someone said something wrong to him or if something went wrong with him he would just keep on thinking about that one incident the whole day the same thing gets swirling in his mind all the time because of his overthinking habit chins with people not any work well he was always in a state of tension or mental disturbance he was distracted to many other things he either cursed his or some bad incident that happened on that day or else he kept on making thoughts revenge on the person who did something wrong to him or said something wrong to him so his condition is very bad seeing his worst condition a friend of his advised him that to visit a zen master living nearby in the buddhist monastery as per his friend's instructions the boy visits the zen master and explains his problem about how he kept on thinking of the past incidents that happened in his life and was not able to forget the old bad memories after listening to the boy's problem 
circumstances, the Zen master went inside the Buddhist monastery. The boy felt a bit strange with getting any answers from the Zen master, but he still sits there. After a while, he sees that the Zen master is coming towards the boy with a clay glass filled with water. The Zen master stands in front of the boy, and the boy also stands in front of the Zen master. The Zen master asks the boy, tell, how much will this glass weigh? The boy replied, I don't know exactly, but the weight of this glass seems to be very little. The Zen master said, my question is, what will happen if I hold a glass like this for a while? The boy replied in calm words, nothing will happen. The Zen master asked again, what if I hold a glass like this for an hour? The boy replied, your hand may start to pain. Again, what if I keep on holding the glass like this for the whole day? The boy replied in serious words, your hand may go numb, your muscles may get tense, and your hand may even die. The Zen master asked again, did the weight of the glass increase in the meantime? Right? No, the weight of the glass did not increase in the meantime. The Zen master asked again, then why there was a pain in the hand and tension in the muscles? The boy replied, because of holding it on for a long time. The Zen master explained, exactly, and life's troubles are like this. If you keep them in your mind for a while, you will feel everything is fine. If you think about them for a long time, you will start to suffer. And if you you will not be able to do any work well, and you may get distracted to many things. Be the person you want to be for your past, and do things that you will repent for now and in the future. Here, in the situation of the story, the Zen master has positively trained his subconscious mind through his conscious efforts, and so he was able to give a solution for the mental problem of the boy. Also, he has changed the boy's subconscious thoughts through his words, which are conscious efforts. What is your conscious and subconscious mind? The conscious mind can be described as whatever you are currently aware of, what you are feeling, doing, seeing, touching, experiencing, and so on. Consciousness does not involve stored information. It is what is happening now. It does involve thinking and making decisions. It is easy to control your conscious mind because you are able to use it to make choices. In contrast, your subconscious mind is always working in the background, but you are not necessarily aware of it. Sometimes called unconscious mind, your subconscious mind contains all of the stored information of everything you have ever experienced. How your subconscious mind operates. Every moment that you are awake, your five senses are taking in a constant stream of information. These experiences are stored as source data. But we do not need to actively recall most of this information. In fact, we probably forget 95 to 99 percentage of our daily activities. However, we know that these thoughts and images still exist in your brain because hypnosis can bring deep memories. Because of this, it influences how you react to things, such as why you are shy, lazy, eat too much, or have an addiction like mobile phones. On the positive side, it also affects things like why you are motivated, confident, cheerful, hopeful, and so on. The key is using your conscious, your subconscious thoughts and harnessing the power of positive thinking. Your subconscious mind can be compared to flying a plane on autopilot. It is constantly running programs to control how you walk, talk, sit, breed, and so on. Consciousness does not involve stored information, as I already said before. Your subconscious mind has 
what is called a homeostatic impulse. It keeps your body temperature at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit just as it keeps you breathing regularly and keeps your heart beating at a certain rate. Through your autonomic nervous system, it maintains a complete balance among the chemicals in your billions of cells so that your entire physical machine functions in complete harmony most of the time. Your subconscious also practices homeostasis in your mental realm by keeping you thinking and acting in a manner consistent with what you have done or said in the past. You can feel your subconscious pulling you back towards your comfort zone each time you try to do something new or different or to change any of your established patterns of behavior. But it's been working to establish those behaviors long before you will ever notice such patterns. Even thinking about doing something different from what you have accustomed and uneasy. This is why forming new habits that will help you reach your goals, such as time management tips, may be tougher to implement at first. But once it becomes a habit or routine, it will stay in your comfort zone. In doing so, you have reprogrammed your subconscious to work in your favor. Changing habits. Using your conscious mind to properly program your subconscious mind. The thing is, you have to train your brain to produce more positive behaviors and positive habits that will help you reach your goals. Since your subconscious mind has such a great amount of control over your positive and negative behaviors, the key is to produce more positive behaviors. Habits cannot be changed, but developing more positive behaviors to overcome your negative behaviors is the key to train your brain positively and to achieve your goals. Ways of you speed. Number one, recognize the roadblock. First, you need to identify what is holding you back from achieving what you want to achieve. What are your limiting thoughts and fears? For example, if your desire is to write a book, you just can't seem to get started or to finish. What is keeping you from doing that? You are a writer, or you don't have enough time to write the book, or no one will read your book if you write it. Those thoughts are what you imagine to be true, but necessarily true. Roadblocks can also be physical barriers. Perhaps you want to lose weight, but you allow your habit of scrolling through the social media for 30 minutes per day in the time which could be spent exercising. Number two, let go of limiting thoughts. Once you know what your limiting thoughts or fears are, accept them, embrace them, and then let them go. But don't worry. Sometimes this requires you to bring pain into your face, into your conscious mind, so that you can face it and then release it. Number three, set up an intention with your conscious mind. The point is to eventually set up an intention with your conscious mind, like how the Zen master has did in the story. You will have to know what you will want to happen in the future and start working on happy ideas, thoughts, which are helping you from achieving your goals. You have to visualize your success. Avoid habits, ideas, thoughts, or barriers which are not letting you from achieving your goals. Number four, let your subconscious mind take over. Whenever you are in a bad circumstance or you have faced with any problem, say to yourself, even though I have done in the past, I no longer do it subconscious mind. In that time, your subconscious receives more positive messages and it starts to work. So this leads to success. These are the four steps which success. Positive tools to tap subconscious mind. 
positive vibrations may create positive habits. So let's look at some of the positive to the subconscious mind. Positive affirmations. Reading positive affirmations every day or chanting positive affirmations every day when you are doing meditation or even in your free time may help you train your brain positively and train your subconscious also positively. Inspirational quotes. Reading inspirational quotes or even creating your own inspirational quotes through your own experience will be very helpful for people committed to positive thinking. One positive message can reprogram how you walk, talk, sit, breathe, and so on. Pareto Principle. In life, 20% of the effort is the 80% of the outcome. So the main thing is the effort through your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. These are some positive tools tap into your subconscious. Also, here into educational podcasts, reading inspirational books will also help you reach your goals. Smart goals. Smart goals are very helpful for people who are thinking that smart work is better than hard work. Even working smart will help you achieve your goals. Smart goals are nothing but positive goals. You have to find positive goals which will help you overcome your negative goals and start working on it. Not only thinking about it, you have to start working on it. The power of positive thinking. Since your subconscious has such a great amount of control over your positive and negative behaviors, as I said before, the key behaviors. Positively training your subconscious mind will help you to achieve and success. Even when you are stressful or you don't have any solution for your problem, you can use the power of positive thinking. When you purposefully learn to instill such comfort zones, you can harness the power of positive thinking. Habits of highly successful people. I highly recommend the habits of highly successful people for people committed to positive thinking. You can follow the habits, ideas, or thoughts of the person whom you take as inspiration. For example, I take Dr. ABJ Abdul Kalam as an inspiration. He was born in a poor family and raised up in a poor family. He was selling newspapers and earning money. But by reading educational podcasts and using the positive tools, which I already mentioned before, he, this led him to success. He is now a former president and a great scientist of India. His mama is still are in India. So I started following the habits of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. And I never negatively think about anything. The subconscious mind. Here is an instance of how a famous chemist, Friedrich Van Radonis, have used his subconscious is as follows. Once, he was laboriously to rearrange the six carbon and hydrogen particles of the benzene formula. After trying for a long time, tired and confused and perplexed, he left over the problem to his subconscious mind, knowing that it will respond in a way very positively and this success. After a while, he was able to board a train in London. He was waiting for the train in the playground. In the playground, he saw an incident of a snake biting its own tail, rounding around itself like a pinwheel. His subconscious mind has memorized this incident. And after boarding the train, again, he started thinking about rearranging the six carbon and hydrogen particles of the benzene formula. Tired and confused and perplexed again, he left over the problem to his subconscious mind. His subconscious mind gave a sudden hit of flash he, about the incident that happened in the playground of a snake rounding around itself like a pinwheel. So, Friedrich thought of himself that, why can't I rearrange the six carbon and hydrogen particles like a pinwheel? 
he started ring and now it is popularly known as the benzene ring he became a famous chemist not only friedrich many scientists like marconi catering everyone have used their subconscious mind the subconscious mind provides scientists the know how power which is of exploring and i also want to convey a special message for every parents present here just allow your child from achieving what they want to achieve don't restrict them allow them to explore more and read more positive books how a famous chemist friedrich van stadonitz have become a chemist is this incident how a distinguished scientist nikola tesla brought forth invention is as follows he was also trying laboriously to construct a new model which will be very helpful for scientists which is the electrical model so he started working on it but he can't do anything already he has trained his subconscious by using positive tools which i mentioned before so he left over the problem to his subconscious mind after a few while he started thinking about us again from his subconscious mind and to his surprise it responded him in a perfect way and gave him out the perfect product of his mind his wife has stated this in the book written by nikola tesla i would like to conclude by saying that there is one mind common to all individual men this was said by sir emerson and i thank sir emerson for giving this positive message to me all you have to do is unite mentally and emotionally with the good you wish to embody and as i said start working on ideas thoughts habits which are helping you from achieving your avoid ideas thoughts habits or barriers which are not allowing you from letting achieving your goals what you think is what you do your thoughts are directly proportional to your actions keep on keeping on until the blossoms bloom into colorful flowers so plant the plants by using your positive thoughts thank you Shashnika, a pure seventh grade student from the dynamic Vietnam Indian International School. Today, I'm privileged to have the opportunity to share my thoughts on a captivating topic: speak to succeed. Now, let me paint a picture for you. Once upon a time, there was a girl named Lily who was very shy. She found it hard to talk about her feelings and make friends. In Lily's class, there was a new girl named Emma. Emma was friendly. I like to talk to everyone. She noticed that Lily seemed sad and wanted to help her. One day during lunch break, Emma went up to Lily and started a conversation. Lily felt nervous and didn't say much. She answered with short words and then looked at Emma. But Emma didn't give up. She kept talking to Lily and tried me. Emma shared stories and asked Lily about her favorite things. She listened carefully. what lily had to say one day while they were doing an art project lily accidentally spilled paint on her drawing she really felt upset and fought back tears he must saw that and knew what had happened she went up to lily and said it's okay we can fix it together let's talk to the teacher lily was scared but saw that emma was kind and caring she took a deep breath and gathered the courage to tell the teacher about her mistake To her surprise, the teacher understood and helped Lily fix her artwork. As Lily learned how to communicate better, she was no longer afraid to join the group activities, ideas, thoughts, and feelings. Through her friendship with Emma and her own experiences, Lily discovered that communication could change her life. She learned that by talking and listening, she could build connections and overcome challenges. Lily realized. that expressing herself and understanding about others is an important skill as a person what is communication communication is like a superpower it helps us connect with people and become more confident in ourselves 
The word communication finds its root from the Latin term communis, which means sharing. Beautifully encapsulates the sense of communication as the process of sharing information, ideas, and message to others. These inscriptions are drawn by ancient people to show their communication. Do you know, communication is more than just the words we use. In fact, research suggests only 7% of communication is conveyed to words alone. The majority of our communication lies on non-verbal cues and body language, accounting for 55%. This includes facial expression, posture, gesture, and other subtle signals that add depth to our interactions. The words they include tone, intonation, and pitch, accounting for 38% of the communication process. Communication is not only about speaking, it's about truly being cared and leaving a lasting impact on others who receive them. Today, we are about to embark on an intriguing exploration world of communication. Communication, the lifeblood of human Let's leave into the two primary classifications of communication, based on communication channel and based on style and purpose. When it comes to communication channels, we encounter two captivating ones, verbal and non-verbal. Verbal communication, the art of expressing ourselves and jabbers into two distinctive forms, oral and written. Oral communication has two mesmerizing ones, face-to-face -face encounters where magic of conversation unfolds and the realm of distance. Where our voice, to our space and time through mediums like phone calls and video conferences. Moving on to our second classification. We live in the style and purposes of communication. Here we encounter two captivating domains, formal and informal. Formal communication relies on established protocols, norms and specific content such as official meetings, presentation, or written reports. Informal communication, on the other hand, takes in casual settings, where spontaneity and personal connections take center stage. Non-verbal communication, this includes po body language, posture, gesture, facial expressions, as a rich layer to our interactions. Communication styles are categorized into Three distinct styles, passive, assertive, and aggressive. Let's leave into each style and discover their unique characteristics. First, the passive style of communication. Picture someone speaking softly, avoiding eye contact. In this style, individuals tend to prioritize their own needs on back burner. Next, the assertive style of communication. Here, communication. In this tale, individuals speak in conversational tone and confident. In this tale, individuals tend to prioritize their own needs and opinions as much as others. Lastly, tale of communication. Here, visualize someone speaking loudly, often glaring at others to assert dominance. In this tale, individuals tend to prioritize their needs as much as others. All about this. Active listening. Take center stage by actively listening to what others are saying. We demonstrate respect and understanding. It allows us to truly comprehend their thoughts and feelings, fostering a deeper connection. Next, we learn the importance of thinking before we speak, taking a moment to collect our thoughts enables us to articulate our ideas more clearly and effectively, avoiding miscommunication and unintended consequences. Speaking loudly and clearly, ensure our message are heard with confidence and precision, embracing courage and taking that leap to communicate without fear, helps captivate the attention of our audience, building confidence. It's essential in our communication by believing in ourselves and our abilities. Let's not forget the value of overcoming our fears and hesitation. Fear should never hold us back from expressing ourselves. 
embracing courage and taking that leap to communicate without fear opens door into new opportunities and connections furthermore developing our lsrw skills listening speaking reading and writing empowers us to communicate effectively this to enhance our communication for maximum effectiveness listening to feedback actively listening and valuing the feedback we receive helps captivate the attention of our audience and cultivate an open environment it shows respect for others opinions and allows for continuous improvement staying organized a clear organization of our thoughts and ideas helps our message clearly Structuring our communication ensures coherence and enables others to understand our points clearly. Utilizing visuals, visuals can enhance our communication. Incorporating visual aids such as graphs, charts, and images can help convey our and leave a lasting impact. Storytelling, weaving stories into our communication creates a greater. that captures attention and resonates with others stories have the power to evoke emotions inspire action and leave a lasting impression cultivating curiosity being curious and asking fosters engagement and deeper connection in communication explore the various forms of human communication interpersonal communication Here, communication take place within ourselves to introspection or self reflection. Here, we engage in a dialogue with our own thoughts and emotions. Interpersonal communication. Here, communication take place within two individuals or a small group. Interviewing. Here, information take place in question and answer format. Here, we can learn about others. small group communication small group communication in this form information take place within a small group of individuals typically ranging from 5 to 10 members small group communication involves discussions brainstorming sections and collaborative decision making mass communication here communication originates from a single source to a large audience often scattered across the world mass communication channels include radio television newspaper magazine and online platforms public speaking here a speaker addresses on an audience whether it is a speech presentation or lecture public speaking aims to inform inspire or persuade in this journey of effective communication it is important to be aware of and overcome potential barriers some common barriers include lack of clarity lack of motivation improper body language and low iq level lack of clarity messages that are vague ambiguous or poorly articulated can hinder understanding and lead to miscommunication lack of motivation when individuals lack interest or motivation in their communication process it can affect their activeness and engagement improper body language non verbal cues such as facial expression posture gesture play a significant role in iq level intellectual limitations including low iq level of cognitive ability or understanding can impede effective communication and comprehension now let's see the ways to overcome these barriers consider the following steps package constraint emotion simplify language using clear concise and straightforward language can help convey our information more effectively enhance understanding and prevents misunderstandings constraint emotion emotional control allows for rational and balanced communication managing emotion promotes a contributive and productive dialogue let's focus on the principles that contribute good communication a helpful mnemonic for this is solar c 
smile. A warm and friendly smile that creates a positive and welcoming atmosphere, fostering a deeper connection. Openness. Being open-minded to different perspectives allows for meaningful exchanges and encourages collaboration. Learn new things. Being open-minded and curious to learn new things enriches our communication, broadening our knowledge and understanding. Eye contact. Maintaining appropriate eye contact creates activeness, interest and respect. Relax. Being relaxed and composed it creates a comfortable environment. In conclusion, I would like to conclude my lecture by saying a story about me. In your earlier days, when I was young, whatever happens in my school, my thoughts, feelings, I will share only with my mother. My mother told several times to share with my friends and teachers. I tried to speak with my friends and teachers, but it didn't work properly. So now I'm here in front of you to speak. Now I'm feeling very happy. People like me also can be speak like this. I would conclude my lecture by saying, communication is a crucial skill can in a different aspects of life from academic perf and professional pursuits to personal connections. Moreover, speaking to succeed involves overcoming our fears and hesitation. It requires us to come outside our comfort zone and head down challenges. So let's recognize the value of overcoming our fears and hesitations. With the conversation we engage in, the fear we conquer, we move closer to our goals. This sounds easier than it is. Your mouth makes an incredible array of movements and various sounds of speech. The movements are even more complex in speaking words, word combinations, and forming sentences. Nowadays, the speakers who are speaking with confidence are conquer fear. No, they have big advantages in their life. Watching and learning can improve our communication. If we want to learn, we can search for great public speakers on YouTube. Good body language can improve our communication and help remember the audience whatever we speak. Avoid putting your hands in your pocket or crossing your arms. Instead, we have to use necessary hand gestures and put our hands we have to build confidence and overcome our fears and hesitations. The quality of our, of our lives, the quality of our lives determines the quality of our relationships. With a twinkle in my eye and a grin upon my lips, I say thank you. In our modern society, with the demands and pressure of everyday life seems to be our increasing, it has become crucial to prioritize our being mental and physical health or to interconnect aspects that profoundly influence the overall quality of life. We are stay for balance and harmony in these areas, seeking ways to reduce our stress, improve our mood, and nurture our bodies. Nature, with its awe, inspiring the beauty and tranquility offers us a sanctuary that can work wonders for our well-being and it has the ability to teach us so much. Nature is like a magnificent book waiting to be read every page of in new secrets and endless possibilities. I, I believe that opening ourselves up to the power of nature we experience incredible things and valuable lessons that will stay with us for a lifetime. I, good morning to everyone. I am Hashadan of Great Sun, studying Frontline New Jersey International School. Today I am here to talk to you about something truly remarkable, inspiring us to the power of nature. We experience incredible things and valuable lessons that will stay with us for a lifetime. Have you ever guessed the clean night sky? 
and wondered about the millions of twinkling stars i have thus if each star whispering its own story and unravel the mystery of the universe nature is like a magnificent book waiting to be read every page is a new secret and endless possibilities i believe that opening ourselves up to the power of nature we experience incredible things and valuable lessons that will stay with us for a lifetime lifetime nature humbles us teach us importance of humility and encourage to appreciate a beauty and diversity of a planet planet and but nature is not only found far away galaxy or grand land space it is right around us in the simplest of things have you ever gave, have you ever observed a tiny and carrying a crumb of food many times a boat says a marble at delicate petals of a flower nature exists in the tiniest things the remains of us to pay attention to the smallest things in our daily life what is nature nature of the physical world and life in general the phenomena of the physical world collective including plants animals and the landscape and other features blue and other features such as products of earth so as supposed to human a human creation human creation how this nature improves our mental well being help us to relax being in nature can provide a peaceful environment helping us helping us to be calm and relaxed improve focus and concentration nature allows us nature allows our minds from constant distraction helping us to helping us to regain focus and concentrate better reduce symptoms of stress and anxiety time and green space have a, have reduced our stress and making us feel less anxious and more at ease reduce depression nature has a positive impact on our mood helping us to helping us to alleviate the symptoms of depression and helping us to improve feelings of happiness increase immune response being in nature being in nature make can boost the immune system and making us more resilient to illness and improve overall health experiencing nature engaging with nature world is essential for our mental well-being spending time in nature such as park forest or gardens and allows us to immerse ourselves in nature's beauty and reap its benefits benefits time in green space time simply being in green space can have a calming and rejuvenating effects on our minds whether it's a leisurely walk and having a picnic or simply sitting on a bench and observing these experiences connect us with nature world and promote our mental well-being and taking a seeking break out these green spaces can provide a much needed from urban hustle and bustle finding nature finding nature in urban environments even urban environments full nature can be found appreciated urban parks rooftop gardens or community community gardens offers the opportunity to experience nature within cities taking a de- taking a break and seeking out these green spaces provide a much needed from much needed from spit uh, urban hustle and bustle interacting with wildlife observing and interacting with wildlife can be a source of joy watching birds squirrels or butterflies for example can evoke a sense of connection with nature world and remains 
and for example can evoke a sense of connection with nature world and remains a soft beauty and diversity of a planet and brings us closer to ecosystem we are at the part of gardening conservation and farming engaging in these activities gardening conservation efforts even in small scale farming incredibly fulfilling tending to plants growing on their own own foods or participating in environmental activities not only connect us with nature world but also provide a purpose of accomplishment bringing nature into our work and home incorporating elements of need incorporating elements of nature in our daily life enhance our mental and mental well-being and decorating our homes with plants and creating a sense of tranquility and or even using nature inspired artwork or photograph connect us with nature world and connect us with outdoors lack mindfulness mental fatigue nature offers less stimulation less stimulation and in our daily life can enhance our mental well-being and less stimulation we are compared to urban environments filled with technologies and noise offers the opportunity opportunity to simpler and less overwhelming settings absence of excessive stimulation curves and shapes nature is abundant in organic curves and shapes such as flowing lines of a river or gentle contours of a hill colors in nature are soothing and calming effects on our minds such as greens blues or earth tones having a calming and rejuvenating effects on our minds nature is often associated with relaxation relaxation calms our nervous system when we spend time in nature nature respond by releasing stress reduce hormones lowering our levels of stress and making making us making us reduce this and related chemicals change our perspective nature has a power to shift our perspective and offers a opportunity to broader view of life have a calming and digital have a calming and rejuvenating effects on our minds mindfulness using all of our senses nature offers a rich sensory and rich sensory seeing a vibrant colors or hearing a gentle sounds and smelling the sense of flowers touching the texture of leaf and tasting the freshness of air these multisens these multisensory deep must deep deep into the deep into the nature beauty breathing conscious breathing is a powerful tool to relaxing and mindfulness and when we inhale we imagine in a drawing and when we exhale we release any tensions or stress relaxing finding a comfortable spot in nature such as grassy grassy patch or learning against green trunk allows allows us to be calm and relaxed social connection social connection plays a vital role in our mental well-being and can engaging in these activities foster our social connection social connection and for this here are some examples that will promote us 
social connection. Picnics with picnics or barbecues with with the friends, families. Picnics gathering with loved ones for a picnic or barbecues in a park or outdoors offers the opportunity to share meals and conversation and laughter. Coffees in the garden, uh, coffees in the garden park or at a beach. Coffees when we inviting our friends to go coffee in the garden, we can taste the freshness of air, we can see the green grass trees, and we can hear the gentle sounds of shaking of leaf, and we can hear the bird sounds. When we coffee at the beach, we can see the scene, scenery pictures, scenery picture such as sunset, sunset mixed with orange and yellow that will refresh our minds. We can see the waves, we can see the water waves. Sports are group activities, team sports are group activities such as sea swimming offers the opportunity to watch a physical activity and engaging a social connection. Walks, cycle rides, or runs with other people. Exercise and company with other people. Other people have, have a enjoyment and have a, have a wonderful experience. And, and we can get support from during physical exercise. Learning. By observing the nature world, we can learn about names of birds, trees, mountains, flowers, or star constellations. By, ab by understanding the nature world, we can learn about whether strides, whether strides, wind patterns, or geography. Through the, na through the nature world, we can learn about ourselves, the meaning of life. Amcha and nature. When we opening the window or doors, we can we can feel the nature's beauty and we can feel the freshness of air. And when we feeding through the birds, we can see the variety of birds. We can see the wonderful um, colors and we can touch the feathers. And from the birds, we can hear the gentle sounds. House plants. House plants also called as indoor plants that are in a lower height. We can keep keep in our window sites such as sp snake plants, little spider, spider plants or lucky bamboo. Listening to sounds. When we listening to the nature sounds such as shaking of leaves, hear, hearing the animals or bird sounds, especially music. When we hearing to the soft music, lowers our blood pressure and, redu and reduces and making us feel less anxiety. I'm going to conclude my lecture telling the story. There is a big city, there is a big city and there is more companies, vehicles and most is. Most there is called Ronex. He is he is no, working in a company, and he ha, by day by day he have uh, many stress and 24 hours also he is sitting before the computers. The yes. one month went, and he, he affected from ment, ment, mental virus, and again one month came, just two months. Now. Now he become a patient, and his friend observed that he is oh, very stressed and he is talking very angry. And he go to he go to his home and he asked, "Why you are very stressed and your face was very dull?" And he also told, "I have very pressures, tensions. In the office I have more works, 
and I always am speaking for the computer. Computer. His friend told, "Come to my village. There is a forest." He also okay. I he put one week leave and he went to he went to his friend's village. First, he went to forest. He in the morning he see the sunset. It is very bright and he refresh. refresh his minds and hear the gentle sounds such as leaf shaking leaves and hearing the birds animal sounds and whenever he see he can see the he can see the squirrels but butterflies and he can see the colorful flowers and green, greenish gra- grass and leaf and he can smell the fresh air and he go to the village and he play cricket kabaddi this and he has a many well immune system and one one month is bent and he he, he one more and one more week also he would leave and he enjoyed enjoyed and he see the sunset With, mixed with oro, orange and yellow that refresh his mind and he, and he came to city and he missed the door scenery pictures village for forest and one thing i request to you week monthly once or twice you can go to a uh, forest with your families friends and don't play games video games such and you can play cricket kabaddi uh, cricket kabaddi and someone will most of them uh, near your homes no one uh, no one is there i can't play you will tell with your family friends you can go go to a beach and you can play in the water and you can you can enjoy thank you A warm greetings to one and all present here. I am Danya SG from Grade 9C. I'm here to give a lecture on the topic the impacts of deforestation on animals. I'd like to start my lecture with a great saying of Sir Herman Hesse, trees or sanctuaries. Whoever knows how to speak to them and whoever knows how to listen to them can learn the truth. Before going into the topic, let me first explain what is deforestation. how it altered the landscape all around the world and what are the causes of deforestation first deforestation deforestation means the purposeful clearing of forested land throughout history and into modern times we people used to raise the forest to make more space for agriculture timber plantation oil palm rubber plantation animal grazing cattle ranching manufacturing construction to obtain wood as fuel to make furniture and stationery using wood deforestation has greatly altered the landscape all around the world about 2000 years 80% of western europe were been forested and 20% were been used for construction purpose and agriculture but today the figure is just 34% like more of us to 60 to 70% is being used for the livelihood purpose so this is a great expanse for those countries next is north in america in the early 18th centuries to the 16th centuries there occurred a great expanses there like more over 80% of forest expanses were been deforested so there is a big crisis in north in america in the eastern part of its continent half trees were been cut down for timber plantation and agriculture purpose next one is china Over the past 4000 years China has lost great expanses over the deforestation and only 20% is being remaining in today like 80% is being used for construction and agriculture purpose next the tropical rainforest tropical rainforests are cleared to make way for the, these activities like manufacturing and construction a big contributor is slash and burn agricultural activity It is an act- activity where farmer burns a plot of land, mix the ash with the soil to make it more fertile. So when he cultivate the crop, he would get a good yield. So once the soil loses its fertility, the farmer keep on repeating this process to get a good yield when he cultivate the crop. 
So when he keep on repeating this process, a large swath of land is being deforestated. So next, the tropical rainforests are also cleared to make way for building or upgrading the roads in the inaccessible areas. Building or upgrading the roads in the inaccessible area make the people more accessible for exploitation. They are also cleared to make way for logging, cattle ranching, animal grazing, manufacturing, construction, oil, palm, rubber and timber plantations. So now let us see how the deforestation causes are being there. So first one is agriculture, firewood, fuel wood, timber plantation and cattle ranching. Basically, agriculture is divided into two types, subsistence farming and commercial farming. Subsistence farming is done in a small scale and in a small quantity to satisfy the farmers and his family needs. So the labor involved in that activity will be he, his family and his relatives. So in that profit will be shared by his family members. The technology and the labor used in these farming will be very less. And when it's come to commercial farming, it is done in a large scale and in a large quantity where the farmer includes the outsiders and his relatives to work on it. So they sell in the market and get money. So he would give a payment to the outsiders who work for his cultivation. So there, the labor and technology used is more. Next is the cattle ranching. Basically, the cattle ranching is done like the animals like the sheep, goat, cow and cattle. So they, they need to eat food. So they eat the small plants. So this is called the cattle ranching. Next one is the fuel wood and firewood. Fuel wood is used in some villages to burn while cooking. So they use for the cooking from early 18th centuries. But even today in some villages they used to do it. Next to keep us warm in the winter season. So we burn the firewood to keep us warm in the winter season. Next is the timber plantation. Timber plantation is done in the only focus of selling and getting money. Next is the fires. When there is an intensity and severity of temperature, there occurs the forest fires. Doesn't mean it naturally occurs to fires. The ecosystem have a particular temperature in its nature. But when it's increased, it leads to forest fires. For an example, 2021 British Columbia there occurred a forest fire where it lost a great expanses of forest and lost many animals and humans' lives. Next one is bushfires. Bushfire is nothing but here the grass, small plants and bushes are being burnt. But in the forest fire, the large trees are being burnt. So bushfire is also the same. When there is an intensity and severity of temperature, it occurs to bushfire. So for an example, 2020 Australia, there occurred a bushfire where 3 million and plus animals were being killed and 2 million and plus humans' lives were being spoiled. Next one is the mining and roads. We couldn't imagine the hectares of land is used for the extraction and mining activities. It's like million and plus hectares used for those activities. We need some materials which we use in our day-to-day -day life, like copper, iron, steel, metal. These all are, are extracted under the ground by digging up the land. So also the ornaments which we wear, like gold, diamond, silver, and platinum, it's also occurred in the extraction activity. Then mining roads. When we build a road for a particular street, there might be 15 to 25 trees being deforestated. And when we calculate for a particular state or a particular district, there might be lakhs and thousands of trees being deforestated. So we build roads to keep us more accessible, travel easier from one place to another. So this is a contributor for deforestation. So next one is population growth and urbanization. So population growth occurs when there is an in increase in birth rate, decrease in death rate. When the count of people is being increased, our needs is also increasing. We need food to eat to stay energetic. So we do agriculture, we need a swath of land. Next, we do construct buildings for our shelter. So we deforestate and build the homes which we live and the factories and companies to keep us occupied by working. So this all leads to population growth. So next, how are the animals are being affected due to deforestation? First, they lost their home and come out of their natural range. Because their homes or the trees, when we deforestate, they come out of their natural range. Second, their existing habitat is being changed. 
And the third, there is a removal of such sources like water, shelter, and food. So they are lacking to find those sources. Then the soil erosion. Soil erosion changes the particular landscape of the forest, so the animals feel harder to find the direction where they get food, water, and shelter. So this leads to deforestation. Next one, it increases the risk of the natural disaster. So for example, flood. So deforestation is a big cause for flood. So the large quantity of animal is being disturbed due to the natural disaster. Next one, the predators feel very easy to, do, to kill them and have them, have them as their flushes. Because when they do not have home or the particular trees, they couldn't hide them from the predators. So they feel easy to trap and shoot and they have them as their food. So the final cause is, however maybe, the final result is increase in extinction and decrease in the population. So next is how we human beings get affected due to deforestation. The first one, there will be the increase the risk of pandemics. So we are staying in the place of animals. By deforestating the tree, we are uh, constructing our homes and we are staying in our homes, sophisticated. So when the animals come in search of their home, they come in are closer and closer to us. The more of contact, we get some diseases like COVID-19 and Ebola. So this increases the risk of pandemics. Second cause is it creates a threat in a creation of medicines. So we need medicines to cure our diseases. When we deforestate number of 50 trees, there might be 20 trees containing medicinal lessons. So this leads to, nowadays, two by fourth of the tablets is being made up of drugs and only two by fourth of it's made up of medicinal lessons. So this leads to a danger for our life. The third cause is affects our next generation. We are using the product, forest products, as an unlimited resource. So we use in a more quantity and waste also. So this leads to a crisis in our future. Then also the oxygen, which we breathe. In the COVID-19 period, the persons who have been affected with the virus have been breathing with the oxygen cylinder, insufficient of oxygen. But after the most scientists say that, after some days, that may be a regular situation in our next generation, carrying the oxygen cylinder wherever we go. The next, how the birds are being affected due to deforestation. First, there will be a decline of their population because they couldn't continue up their next generation. Since they do not have the place, their home to breed, so they couldn't continue up their next generation. This leads to population decline. The second, their existing habitats is being changed. Then there is a decline of their population and crisis in species count. Migratory birds, they move from one place to another in search of some resources. So then when they move in the north side in the summer season and come back to south in the winter season, they do not find their home. So this is a crisis for migratory birds. Next, the tropical birds. A large species of tropical birds is being killed and are being extinct also. So this is a cause of killing the birds. The next one is how the insects are being affected due to deforestation. So the same which is being applicable in the birds. So there is a decline of their population. They couldn't build up their next generation because they do not have place to breed. Their next dwellings are being cut down. So they, they lost their home and come out of their natural range. Their existing habitats and are being changing. There is a decline of their resources. Now let us see about the IUCN or WCU. IUCN is the International Union Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. So now they are known as World Conservation Union, WCU. They take a comprehensive red list known as IUCN red list for the threatened species. They take on the count of endemic, endangered and extinct species where the government feel easier to save and preserve the animals which are going to be extinct and bring back the animals which are being extinct. So they play an important role in taking on the count of the animals. Next is extinct species. So now let us see what is extinction first. When all members of a particular species is being dead, even animals, birds, plants and insects, it is called as extinction. For a great modern example, extinction is the passenger pigeons. Billion of passenger pigeons darkened the sky of United States. 
in early 18th centuries. And within a short span of time, they became very easy to trap and shoot. They became a popular and cheap food sold in the United States. And the last passenger pigeon was named as Martha, and it was died in 1914 in Cincinnati Zoological Park and was donated to Smithsonian University. So the hunters started to hunt them in a vast quantity. So this is a big cause and also the deforestation. Next are the cheetahs. Cheetahs were reintroduced to our South Asian country after 70 to 80 years of extinction. So on a fine morning, the eight big cats from Namibia were brought in the chartered cargo flight to the South Asian city, Gwalia, in a motto to reintroduce the cheetahs in South Asian country. And the, most of the scientists believe that the land's fastest animal will roam again in the sprawling zoological park. So they shifted the cheetahs there. And on a fine Saturday morning, our Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji released the egg bit cats to their explosion. First, they started st surrounding and scanning them. And within a few period of time, they started to adopt. Only the 9% of them is being being difficult to adopt to the climatic conditions. But 77,000 and plus cheetahs are being reintroducing. The Africans believe that bringing the cheetahs from African countries to the South Asian country is a good preservative and conservative method to bring back the extinct species. So now, now the cheetahs are being the first predator to be extinct after India's independence, 1947. Next is conservation of forests and wildlife. The first conservative method is afforestation. We need to plant more trees so it will be a good conservative method and stop deforestating. The second one is prevent forest fires. We, need, we can prevent the forest fires and we can check them using advanced technique, like spraying the wishing extinct solution from the air traps, changing the direction of the wind using wind strong blowers. Next, the third pre preservative method is prevent overgrazing. The animals will go and eat the small plants and injure their roots. The small and lower branches which they, in, which they eat, it will injure, in, injure the roots of the plants. So it leads to death of the particular plant. So this is a good cause of deforestation. And next one is a migration. Migration is a seasonal movement of birds and animals from one place to another in search of some resources like water, shelter and food. So when they come back, come back when the natural conditions are adopted to them. So this leads to deforestation. So when we prevent this, it will be a good conservative method. The next is preventive measures which can be made by us. So first, we should use less paper. This means, we should, this means not to stop using the papers. We should use in a usable count and not use it as unwanted resource. Second, we should use, we should recycle the papers and cardboards. The third one is we should use the recycled products. The fourth is we should stop using the palm oil consisting products. Next, we should stop consuming the meat and we should not burn the firewood excessively. Punishment. Now let us see the punishment which is being given under the Act, the Indian Forest Act 1927, when there is a illegal hunting or poaching or cutting down the trees and selling the wood illegally. So there might be the fine of 10,000 rupees and three months of imprisonment when these occurs. So under and various acts and acts, it may lead to one year and what is the mistake they done? It leads to more years. Indian Forest Act. The, basically the forest is kind of divided into three types like protected forest, reserved forest and village forest. So they have a particular administration and take on the pre preventive measures. So these, to, this act is to stop the poaching activities, illegal hunting, and selling the wood illegally. Next conclusion. So in this, we can understood that we should save trees. So for saving trees, we need to do more preventive measures. Even the water cycle is being affected due to deforestation. Water cycle is also known as hydrological cycle. There occurs some process when the forest the water is being converted into water vapor under the evaporation process. The second process is condensation, where the water vapor converts to clouds. And the third is precipitation, 
where we get in the form of rain or snow, the, the water come back to the ground. Next is the transportation. So when the plants are there, they absorb the water from their root and they release the water in their leaves. So this is also a water cycle process. When, for a great example, it is Amazon forest. So when they have a good moisture condition in their soil level. When, this, when we cut down more trees, this leads to less moisture containing in the soil, which occurs, there will be no rain. So only 97% of, of water is being unusable water. Only the 3% of water is being usable water. When we get rain, only the 97% of water is also converting into the usable water. Next is the carbon dioxide being released in the atmosphere due to deforestation. We all know the process called photosynthesis, where the plants make their own food with the help of some raw materials and a pigment, a green pigment called chlorophyll. The raw materials are carbon dioxide, water and sunlight. When the plants take in the carbon dioxide for this process, the carbon particle is chemically locked in the air. And without completing the process, when we cut down or burn the trees, it turns into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, not as the carbon particle. So this leads to greenhouse gas emissions. We all know the plants take in the, ox uh, take in the carbon dioxide and exhale the oxygen. When this process do not complete pro properly, we get the carbon dioxide back, which leads to some respiratory problems when we inhale the carbon dioxide. Next, our biodiversity and ecosystem is being greatly affected due to deforestation. And most of the scientists say that we are in the midst part of mass extinction program. And within a few years, there will be a lack of species in our world. So we, I request you all to save trees so we can save the animals, animals, the water, and all the species, and even our next generation, all the living organisms. So I thank my school management for giving me a wonderful opportunity, and my ex I extend my thanks to my mentors, supporting teachers, and my parents. Thank you. One should never be silent on one's crime. Speak up and stand up to ensure justice. When we look at social justice, it is all about equality. Unfortunately, around the world, Social injustice can happen at small scales and global scales. It is usually a great barrier to the people. A warm greetings to each and everyone present here. This is Salam Dikshita standing before you to give a lecture on the topic Behind the Siege of Justice Dinner. I would like to start my lecture with a great saying of Mr. William E. Gladstone, Justice Delayed is Justice Denied. Through my lecture, you would understand what is justice, reasons for injustice happening in the courts, about the caste system, justice at the place of rich and poor, is justice related to law, places where justice is required, positive impact of justice delayed on individuals and the society, and the conclusion. At the first, what is justice? Justice is a moral, theoretical idea which people are to be treated impartially, fairly, properly, and reasonably under the law and the judges of the law. The laws are to ensure that no harm occurs to another and that where a harm is suspected, a remedial action is taken. Both the accuser and the accused person receive a right morally consequence of justice according to their actions that they have done. Justice refers to a system or framework of laws and regulations that determine how to fairly distribute rewards and punishments to the individuals who are subject to them. It is also a way to ensure that everyone are treated equitably and fairly under the law and that those who violate the law are held accountable for their actions. Justice can involve in a range of legal and social institutions such as courts, police station, correctional facilities, and more. All working together to uphold the principles of impartiality and injustice in the administration of the law. Justice is a legal structure or system that is designed to a judge in a general sense who should be accorded a benefit or a burden when the law is applied to a person certainly. Justice refers to a situation where an individual 
a group of individuals are denied their legal or moral entitlements resulting in unfair or unjust outcome this can happen in variety of reasons such as social political economical factor or due to the flaws a legal system itself example for justice Justice denied includes a person being wrongfully sentenced in a crime due to an influenced or insufficient legal process. The person being denied access to the basic rights, needs, services such as health care or education. Due to discrimination, the group of people being denied the opportunity to participate in political process due to lack of representation and access to the resources. In many cases, the effects of justice denied can be far-reaching, affecting not only the individuals or group of individuals, it affects the families, communities, broader society. This can lead to senseless, powerless, frustration and even anger of people that people are not getting their rights in the courts properly. Next, reasons for injustice happening in the courts. The first reason why injustice happens in the courts is because of the justice being delayed. Let me give you an example under this topic. The Mumbai blast. There was a blast at Mumbai at 1993. 257 had been killed. Nearly 1,400 members were been wounded. But after 20 to 25 years, they have given justice to this case. Mumbai. The financial capital of India has caused a widespread destruction and loss of life. This bomb blast was one of the deadliest terrorist attacks which took a role in India's history and that they have profound the impact on country's security and counter-terrorism policies. Mumbai, the financial capital of India. This bomb blast occurred on March 12, 1993 which were coordinated by the D company led by Dawood Ibrahim. The attacks targeted various locations such as the Mumbai Good Stock Exchange places, the Air India building, the Hotel Sea Rock and many such crowded places. This bomb blast was, these bombs were made up of RDX, a powerful explosive material which caused a massive destruction and loss of life. The investigation into this bomb blast was investigation CBI, which identified over hundreds aspects and arrested several people who are involved in this bombings. The trail of accused began in 1994, not in 1993, 1994, which lasted over a decade with arresting over 130 people and that they have convicted for their involvement in the bombings. Next, the next reason why injustice happens in the courts is because of the silly cases. Let's give you an example under this topic also. In 2017, there was an NGO who filed 64 cases in the High Court. But at least in single case, he did not win because all the cases that he filed in the High Court are just silly cases. A family, went to hotel. a family went to a hotel for their lunch. There, in the bill, they got 15 rupees extra. So that, he filed, in the, filed a case in a high court. Filing a case or giving a case in high court is not a problem. But the cases that we file in the high court must be valuable. Because there are many people who are leading their life for their justice in the courts. The next reason why injustice happens in the courts is because of the adjournment, that is Vaida. The number of adjournments is limited to three, exception being circumstances beyond the control of the party. That there is a rule in district court there should not be more than three adjournments given to a particular case. But many people are unaware of this rule, right? So the judges are giving more than 10 to 24 adjournments for a single case per year. And also, here comes the few reasons. If the judge is absent in the court, here comes an adjournment. If the lawyers are absent in the court, this becomes an adjournment. If the opposition party, party 
are absent, this becomes an adjournment. And also, the person who type speaking in the code is absent, this becomes an adjournment. So, when the more adjournments are given to the people, this, uh, the, um, if the more adjournments are not given to the people, we can prevent the justice injustice in the courts. Next, the main reason that we all know why injustice happens in the court is because of the word corruption. Misuse of power happens when the corrupt officials abuse their authority to affect the legal process, like judges, like appointing judges who are biases or pursuing witness or victims to change the history or story of a case. This can cause much delays and unfair outcome to the people. To the people. Bribery. Bribery happens when officials Bribery happens when someone involved in a legal process, like judges, lawyers, police officers, ask for money or other favor in order to exchange for a case to go faster. This can also cause much delays and unfair outcome to the people. Red tape. Red tape happens when officials demand unnecessary paperwork or impose unnecessary delays to extract bribes on their favor. This can also cause much delays and unfair outcome to the people. Lack of transparency. Lack of transparency happens when the legal system is not efficient, clear, and sufficient for the people. This is like the conversation between the legal system members and the, peop and the public. When the legal system members are not telling what is happening in the court, what is going to happen, what we have to do, the people will not be able to know about it. So, when the, peop when the public ask questions against the, the legal system members, the legal system members will not be able to answer that time properly. So, this can cause much confusion and injustice in the courts. Next, the caste system. We all, uh, uh, justice is prevailing all over the country, but justice differs at the place of rich and poor, low caste, high caste. Okay. But the justice system was there like before 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. Let's see about it. The caste system. No, there was no word like caste before 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. But before those days, there were divisions between people, like their land, money, their dressing sins, their lifestyle, and more. The word caste was derived from the Spanish and Portuguese language, casta. casta. According to John Mercier's Spanish Dictionary, 1569, the, uh, when the Spanish colonized the New World, the word caste was derived. And caste means race, tribe, or variety. Next, justice at the place of rich and poor. Justice is supposed to be fair and equal for everyone in regardless of their characteristics. But uh, in reality, justice often differs in the place of rich and poor, right? Let's see is an, at it as an example. A wealthy people and a poor people caught stealing from a store. This becomes a case. In the court, the wealthy people will be able to hire a high-powered lawyer. He can negotiate pay deals, find loopholes in the law. He can easily escape from the court without getting any harsher punishments. But at the same time, the poor person will, will not be able to hire a lawyer in the court. So with these things, we can understand that how justice differs in the place of rich and poor. And also, when, when, the, lawyers are not, uh, when the people are not getting lawyers in the court, usually they will get uh, very harsher punishments like more uh, longer prison or a uh, longer fine. Next. Is justice related to law? Justice is related to law. In fact, law is a tool that is used by the society to administer justice. Justice can be defined as the fair and equitable treatment for all individuals, as I said before. Uh, laws are intended to promote justice to ensure that all individuals have equal rights and that their rights are protected and also they are they are held up, uh, they are upheld for their actions. Next.
places where justice is required. Justice is required in all places where the fairness, equality, and the rule of law is essential for all well-beings. First, justice is required in the legal uh, justice is required in the legal system to ensure that the, uh, uh, the legal system. Mem uh, next, workplace. Justice is required in the workplace to ensure that the uh, workers' employees are treated with equality and fairness, and that their rights are upheld. And this includes areas such as equal pay for equal, protection from harassment, discrimination, and fair hiring. Educational institutions. Justice is required in the educational institutions to ensure that all people, all students who are in the educational institutions have equal access and rights to access the justice. Next, society. Justice is required in the society to ensure that the individual and the public have equal rights and access to uh, access to the legal system international community justice is required in the international community to ensure that the higher level laws are upheld and that the high level uh, members rights and equality are protected next positive impact of justice delay on individuals and individuals and society. Raising awareness. Justice is, uh, when the justice is being delayed, people can get more awareness of that, uh, that, uh, that, um, that thing. For example, if there is a more complicated case, and uh, if there is more complicated case, when the people knows about that case, they can Talk, they, they'll talk to each other. So that time, people can also find a solution for making the justice system more better. Trust in the legal system. When uh, the trust is in the uh, when the trust is uh, trust in the, trust in the legal system. When the, the, the justice is being delayed, people get more uh, more trust on the legal system because. Uh, people can ensure that uh, the, the judges are not giving the justice before they get uh, bef uh, uh, thank you so much. the nation that leads in renewable energy will be the nation that leads the world 10 to 20 years from now a warm welcome to one doll present here i'm hemita of grade 9 I'm here to take a lecture on the topic, the science of energy storage. Through my lecture, you would understand the advantages and disadvantages of energy sources, how are they stored, how do they affect the environment, their positives and negative sides. First, what is energy? Energy is the ability to do work. Energy source is a source from which useful energy can be extracted or recovered by means of transformation or conversion. Energy sources based on their sustainability are classified into renewable energy and non-renewable energy. First, renewable energy. Renewable energy is derived from natural sources that are replenished at a higher rate than they are consumed. Sunlight and wind, for example, are resources that are constantly being replenished. It is also known as green energy or clean energy. As the name suggests, renewable energy can easily be regenerated. It does not produce any harmful gases and this considered safe for the environment. A notable number of countries have pledged to go renewable in the next 10 to 20 years. On the other hand, countries notorious about their carbon emission, such as China, have also pledged to drastically cut down their greenhouse emission rate. This had an accelerated focus on renewable energy plants. Advantages of renewable energy. Usage of renewable energy has several benefits. These include, renewable energy has no carbon emission. Even if we take into account the manufacturing and recycling of technologies involved, the impact on environment is much lesser than fossil fuels. Renewable energy promotes self-sufficiency 
and reduces a country's dependence on foreign fuels. According to a study, 1% increase in the use of renewable energy increases economic growth by 0.21%. This gives socio-economic stability. Due to lack of fossil fuels and sudden depletion of natural resources, prices of non-renewable energy keeps increasing. But renewable energy is limitless and can be produced locally. Renewable energy has no air pollutants. This influences the health and quality of life. Renewable energy allows decentralization of industrial communities to get their independent energy sources, which are more flexible in terms of distribution. Renewable energy promotes equality. It has the potential to make energy sources more affordable to low-income countries. Disadvantages of renewable energy. No technology is perfect. Renewable energy has certain drawbacks too. These include the production of renewable energy depends upon climate. For example, wind farms are more effective in certain locations where climate support it. The initial cost of renewable energy technology is expensive. The manufacturing and recycling of these energy sources needs significant investment. This makes them unaffordable to certain businesses and unavailable for widespread common use. Renewable energy technology takes up a lot of space. This may affect the life of communities where these energy farms are situated. This may even disturb the wildlife. While the potential of renewable energy is tremendous, but the technology is still in its developing phase. Therefore, it is impossible to change into renewable energy all over once. There is a need of a lot of time and research to transfer into renewable energy. Renewable energy is not entirely polluting free. They are less polluting than fossil fuels. A best example for this is the lifespan of wind turbines are just 20 years. This means that after every 20 years, an another wind turbine should be constructed, which creates pollution types of renewable energy. There are five main types of renewable energy. Solar energy, wind energy, biomass energy, geothermal energy, and hydropower energy. First, solar energy. Sun is a tremendous source of renewable energy. Nevertheless, the adverse effects of solar power are associated with land use, water use, habitat loss, and harmful materials used in the manufacturing of solar panels. But to build a utility-scaled solar power panels, a large amount of land is required. This can interfere in the existing land use. Use of many areas can result in clearing and grading of land, which can cause soil compaction, erosion, and alternation of drainage channels. Second, wind energy. Wind is also used to produce energy. Windmills run using turbines and generators to produce wind energy. Wind also has a substantial share in the global renewable energy market and an appreciable number of wind farms are to be constructed in the next following years. But wind power sector has fallen down in the past few years due to its impact on birds and other species. Third, biomass energy. Waste of plants and animals are used to produce energy, which is termed as biomass energy. Biomass is an eco-friendly way of producing energy, but it is not only green. Some of the biomass resources are crops, agriculture waste, animal waste, etc. But the bioenergy feedstock and the way it is harvested can cause harmful effects on land use along with global warming emission. But using tree or tree products, comes with its own sets of problems, collecting enough lumper, clearing forest lands, which again causes tropical changes and destroys animal habitat. Fourth, geothermal energy. Geothermal energy is produced from the heat below the Earth's surface. Geothermal energy is also used to produce electricity, heat buildings, etc. Geothermal sites contain poisonous gases 
that escape when holes are drilled in the earth's surface. Geothermal power stations under extreme conditions can cause earthquakes. Fifth, hydropower energy. The force of water is used to produce energy, which is termed as hydropower energy. Hydropower dominates the global renewable energy market. Hydropower does not directly affect the air quality, but the hydropower reservoir and the way it is harvested can cause harmful effects on environment. The dams that are constructed for harnessing hydropower tend the river flow, which can cause negative impacts on wildlife as well as for people. The main negative impact of huge among the renewable energy is flooding of an area. When water stored in dams or all released at once, it causes river downstream and suddenly into flood. This may affect agriculture lands, forest lands, wildlife, people, etc. Renewable energy storage. After the discovery of electricity, we have sought effective methods to store the energy for use on demand. Over the past century, energy storage industries continue to evolve, adopt, and innovate in response to the changing energy requirements and advances in technology. Energy storage technologies provide a wide range of technological approaches to manage a power supply in order to create a strong energy infrastructure and bring cost savings to the consumers. But it is much harder to store renewable energy than fossil fuels because fossil fuels just need some space to be stored. But renewable energy should be stored in electric capacitors, magnetic storages, and batteries that have lower efficiency. Battery storage technology are essential to speed up the replacement of fossil fuels by renewable energy. Battery storage or battery energy storage system are devices that help us to store renewable energies like solar and wind. A best example for battery storage is lead battery storage system. Renewable energies like solar and wind are stored in lead batteries. They use the energy stored in lead batteries to reduce power fluctuations and increase permeability to serve on its demand power. Lead battery storage system bank excess energy when demand is low and releases them when demand is high to ensure a steady supply of energy to millions of homes and businesses. This is the main reason why renewable energy must be stored. Not only renewable energies like solar and wind can be stored. Other energies like biomass, geothermal and hydropower can also be stored. Biomass energy is stored within the organisms. Pumped storage hydropower, PSH, is a type of hydroelectric energy storage. It is a configuration of two water reservoirs at different elevations that can produce energy as water moves down from one to the other through a turbine. Bioma geothermal energy is stored in hot rocks, often called as granite rocks, or wrapped in liquids such as water and brain. Through storing renewable energy, we can reduce our greenhouse gas emission, decrease our dependence on dirty fossil fuel plants that are contributing to pollution and negative health outcomes in communities and mainly get a sustainable future. Latest updates about renewable energy. A total of 3,16,754.86 MU of electricity has been generated from renewable energy sources during the current year up to January. India's power generation capacity, according to Minister, was at 412.21 gigawatt as of on Feb 28, 2023. To bring in green revolution in the country, the government has set up an ambitious target of having 500 gigawatt of installed renewable energy, which includes installation of 280 gigawatt of solar power and 140 gigawatt of wind power. Government invested 20,700 crore, including central support of 8,300 crore for interstate transition system, 
by backup and grid integration of 14 gigawatt renewable energy from Ladakh. The announcement made in Union Budget List 2023-24, to the Ministry of Power has formulated a scheme on viability gap funding for the development of battery energy storage system with capacity of 40,000 megawatt hour. Next, moving on to non-renewable energy. Non-renewable energy is derived from a source that cannot be replaced or is replaced slowly and gradually only through natural process. The resources that are referred to as non-renewable are fossil fuels like coal, oil, gas, etc. They are consumed faster than they are replaced. Advantages of non-renewable energy. Usage of non-renewable energy has several benefits. These include non-renewable resources are high in energy. Resources like coal and oil tend to provide more energy in comparison to renewable energies like solar and wind. Huge profits can be generated in the mining of coal, selling of oil and construction of natural gas natural gas. One of the major non-renewable energy are easy to use, whether in home or anywhere else. Non-renewable resources are easily found anywhere and everywhere. This implies that they can be conventionally moved all across the world. People living in areas that are not more approachable can make use of non-renewable energy as well. Most importantly, non-renewable energy are job creating. Extracting, transporting and refining are parts of non-renewable energy that provides employment. And most of the non-renewable energy are easy to store. Disadvantages of non-renewable energy. Though they have a number of advantages, non-renewable energy has several disadvantages as well. This include one of the major disadvantages of non-renewable energy is that it's time consuming. Mining of coal, selling of oil, searching for oil drills, inserting oil drinks, inserting pipelines to extract and transport natural gas are time consuming process. It takes up a lot of effort. Since non energy takes billions of years to be formed, they are slowly but gradually vanishing from the earth. Using non renewable energy, indiscriminately without thinking about our future generation could be selfish. Non-renewable energy can be dangerous and causes respiratory problems in humans because sources like fossil fuel emit gases like carbon monoxide. Sources like coal, oil and natural gas releases a large amount of carbon dioxide when burnt. As a result, there are a large number of diseases, injuries, and even death. Workers working in coal mine or oil drill are more prone to a large number of health risks. Sources like coal, oil, and natural gas releases a large amount of carbon dioxide when burnt. As a result of these chemicals, they are rapidly destroying the ozone layer. Oxides like sulfur oxide and other released while burning fossil fuel turn rain into acid rain, which may be dangerous for wildlife as well as for people. Most of the non-renewable resources release a smoke which envelops the buildings. Mostly in modern cities, people complain about the same. Over time, black smoke can make your buildings or property appear dark and dirty. Sometimes it may be risky to transport non-renewable resources as huge cargo ships and oil tankers crush and spill the content in the sea. It may be deadly for the sea animals who come in contact with it. To keep the power stations working, every time we need to keep a huge amount of oil in reserve. This can be expensive and occupies a lot of space. Types of non-renewable energy. There are four main types of non-renewable energy natural gas, coal, oil, and nuclear energy. First, natural gas. Natural gas, also called as methane gas or natural methane gas, is a colorless 
highly flammable hydrocarbon consisting primarily of methane or ethane. It is a type of petroleum that commonly occurs in association with crude oil. A fossil fuel, natural gas, is important as a chemical feedstock in the manufacturing of plastics. Second, coal. Coal is a black or brownish black sedimentary rock that, that can be burned for fuel and used to produce electricity. It, is, it primarily consists of carbons and hydrocarbons that contain energy that can be released through carbonization. Third, oil. Oil, also known as petroleum, is a fu fossil fuel formed from the tiny sea plants and animals that have died hundreds of millions of years ago. Once refined, oil can be used to make products such as gas oil, jet fuel, etc. Fourth, nuclear energy. The fuel in the nuclear reactor to generate electricity is called as nuclear fuel. Uranium is one of the fuels in a nuclear reactor. It produces about 6% of the world's total energy and 13 to 14% of the world's electricity. It is the most reliable energy source in USA. Notably, not renewable energy not only consists these resources alone, but also refers to other minerals and metals present in earth, such as gold, silver, iron, etc. Non-renewable energy storage. Now most energy is stored in underground pockets called reservoirs. They can be shipped, piped or stored anywhere all across the world. To be in particular, natural gas is stored underground primarily in three reservoir types. Depleted oil and natural gas fields, depleted aquifer and soil formations. They can, there are approximately 400 active underground reservoirs in 30, 30 states. Above ground tanks are used, to, are used to store crude, finished oil and refined oil products. At retail locations like gas stations, tanks are stored underground for safety purposes. A coal bin, coal store or a coal bunker is a storage container for coal. Nuclear energy is initially stored in steel lined steel concrete pools surrounded by water. It's later removed from the pools and placed in dry casks that are made up of steel and concrete or other materials for safety purposes. Latest updates about non-renewable energy. 40% of the world's energy comes from non-renewable resources. USA uses 24% of the world's oil every year, while they just compress 4.5% of the world's population. More, worldwide, 85% of the energy comes from non-renewable resources, especially 80% of India's power generation is from non-renewable resources. After 1950, with the concept of oil peaks, began a new drive towards renewable. Today, intolerable pollution level, mm -hmm. climate change, global warming, energy security are related factors that are pushing us towards a cleaner and sustainable source of energy. Unstable situations in the oil-rich nations of East, tensions between Russia and West have increased the prices of non-renewable resources. Our society is mostly dependent on non-renewable resources that have expiration dates. For this reason, it's important to promote alternative energies, including renewable energies like solar and wind. Reducing our dependence on fossil fuels and expanding our renewable energy usage is one of the key features for a sustainable future. Renewable energy unlocks the potential for humanity to have a cleaner energy that is available in abundance. It leads us to independence, economic growth and stability. With green energy, we can reduce the impact of human activity on environment and stop climate change before it's too late. Transition to renewable energy might be challenging and expensive. 
But most experts believe that the advantages of renewable energy would outweigh any drawbacks. Besides, since technology is continuously evolving, we will be able to overcome most limitations in no time. It, let's be recall. I think you all, through my lecture, you all understood about the types of energy sources, which are renewable energy and non-renewable energy, their types, advantages, disadvantages, storage, and their latest updates. Therefore, I like to end my quote, end my lecture by a famous quote said by Tulsi Tanti. Replacing all traditional sources of energy with renewable energy is going to be a challenging task. However, adding renewable energy to the grid and gradually increasing its contribution, we, will we can realistically expect the future powered with green energy. I thank the school management for providing golden opportunity to showcase my talent. I also expand, extend my thanks to all the teachers, students, and the audience for their fullest cooperation. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is Mike M from Grade 9C, who's going to lecture on the topic, the origin and history of Halloween. And at first, what is a Halloween? As we know, it is a celebration observed in many countries. And on that day, the souls of the dead return to their homes. So, the people dressed up in costumes and lit bonfires to ward up the spirits. But will it be formed as simple like this? Obviously, no. It also has many histories and backstories behind it. So, let us know all those stuffs now. The origin of Halloween can be traced back to the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. And Samhain means the end of November, the start of, uh, the, start, the end, start of November, the end of October, the start of winter season, or the start of summer season, and even the uh, end of harvest season. And, the, uh, and this was first observed in the United States in the 1840s. I mean, it was not the first, but it was officially celebrated over here. And this was first celebrated in the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. The Celts, who lived 2,000 years ago, now currently in the parts of Northern Ireland, France, and United Kingdom, has celebrated this festival for the first time. And during this period, the Druids built huge sacred bonfires to commemorate this event. The Druids built huge sacred bonfires where the people gathered to burn their crops and animals as sacrifices to the Celtic deities. And hundreds of years ago, people dressed up as saints and went door to door asking for candy, money, etc., which, uh, which was the origin of trick or treating or Halloween. And uh, the cells were called typically consisting of animal heads and skins and attempted to tell each other's fortunes. Once the celebration is over, the cells relit their hearth fires from the sacred bonfire which they had extinguished earlier that evening to keep them occupied and protected during the coming winter. The Halloween in the West dates back to a pagan festival called Samhain. And Samhain also means the Celtic New Year's festival. The people in the West were believing that on this Halloween day, the people who were dead before one or more years, for one or more reasons, would return back to their homes and they would even walk to the places where they had dead earlier in their earlier life and would even talk to their loved ones. And uh, very little known is the history and backstory of Halloween because the Christians Christianized that period with as many as pagan festivals they could. So we couldn't get much information about this pagan festival called Samhain. And uh, uh, let me tell you something about the Halloween for the first time in America. As we know, the, uh, the Halloween in the colonial New England was extremely limited due to the rigid Protestant belief systems over there. But Halloween was much more common in the Maryland and in the southern colonies. 
The colonial Halloween festivities also included of telling of ghost stories and mischief making of all kinds. By the, 1900, by the 19th century, America was flooded with new immigrants who helped it to popularize this event nationally. Like the people from several different countries like Russia, Canada, China, etc. those days. And when they were staying in America, they started to love the idea of Halloween. And when they returned back to their own country, they started to celebrate Halloween there too. And the people who were there in their country started to love the idea of Halloween and they started to celebrate this one too. And this is how the celebration of Halloween is totally popular now. And let me show you the history of trick or treating. Moving on to the next topic, trick or treating. And borrowing from the European traditions, Americans also began to dress up in costumes and lit bonfires and would take some thing and would go door to door and they would exhibit their talents like singing, dancing or poems or any other performances in the exchange of their songs, dances, in the exchange of their, uh, of their neighbors, food, money and chocolates, etc. And, uh, the, uh, and the, the trick or treating was found to emphasize the confidence of the children. Like the children should be more confident and they should, not, uh, and they should be more friendly and approachable to their neighbors. And, uh, the, uh, and it also helped their neighbors to be more friendly and easily approachable with their, uh, with their, uh, with their children. And by this time, uh, by, but nowadays, Halloween is just like you can take a jack-o'-lantern with you. And a jack-o'-lantern is nothing but a pumpkin which is carved like in the shape of a ghost or uh, like in the shape of a monster or anything. And you would have some lights or fire or uh, sharp and thin props inside that. And you would just carry your jack-o'-lantern with you and have some candies with you and you would say a thank you to your neighbor and just get the candies and whatever freebies you need. And I think that the Halloween, uh, the main aim of this trick or treating is totally vanished due to this one. And uh, let me say, uh, by the middle of the 1800s, there was a move in America to mold Halloween as an international holiday more about neighborly get-togethers than about witchcraft, sorceries, and black magic, etc. And uh, uh, let me explain it with a timeline so you understand it better. Halloween histories throughout the Middle Ages. In Europe, the All Hallows' Eve is celebrated on October 31st. All Hallows' Day is celebrated on Octo November 1st. And the All Souls Day is celebrated on November 2nd. The All Hallows Eve celebration came to America on pilgrim ships. And the Salem witch trials sparked the fear of lanterns and witchcrafts. The jack-o'-lanterns and the ghosts covered in the white bedsheets were later invented by the, uh, inspired by the Irish folk tales in the 1800s. And by the time, the Romans brought their own fall festivals. And by the time the Romans conquered the most Celtic territory by the 4380 and brought their own fall festivals with them at that time. According to the history, their October celebration was also known as Halloween. And, uh, um, by, and by that time even, in the, 18, uh, in the 1800s and up to the, from the 1800s, Haunted houses, like artificial haunted houses, became a thing in the U.S. And starting from the 1800s, Mary Tussauds was a museum in London which featured a chamber of horrors with decapitated French revolutionary figures. And uh, the house and the first haunted house was uh, was uh, created by an American ride manufacturer who created an early haunted house with complete shaking floors, demonic screams, and dim lights. And as already said, uh, in Europe, there were some spooky and public attractions in Europe. So it was easy for the people to get attracted to these kind of things. And by this time, there was a trend that was kick-started by these artificial haunted houses. 
which was the parents were concerned about their children running on the streets on the All Hallows Eve day. Like as I said before, this day is like somewhat connected with the ghosts and uh, ghosts, sorceries, witchcrafts and everything. And uh, the were concerned about their children running on the streets. So they took them to these kind of haunted houses to keep them more safe and occupied. And the next one is by the 1950s, there was the Halloween costumes went mainstream. Uh, there are two important things for Halloween, which are costumes and candies. And one of those is costumes. By the time, the costumes were more important for Halloween. And uh, in those times, there was a trend like the mass-produced box costumes were so popular and famous because they were uh, so good looking and amazing too. So, many kids began to buy them and dress up themselves as mummies, princesses, or even more specific characters like Batman and Frankenstein's monster. And, this, and uh, by the time, the neighborhoods also gave some free costumes like the mass-produced box costumes and began organizing some activities like the haunted houses, like the artificial haunted houses, and etc. to keep the kids more safe and occupied. And the next one is in the 1980s, the fears about poison candies reached new heights. That's when a Texas named Ronaldo Brian gave some five cyan laced pixie sticks to five children, including his son. And this paranoia of the channel poisoning candies were bought by many children and were eaten by them, which was completely sold when it was kept in the store shelves. And parents, as said already, the two important things for Halloween are the costumes and candies. There are already some cases with the costumes and now some problems with the candies too. The parents were so concerned about their children eating these type of uh, poison candies. So many parents stopped their children from uh, celebrating Halloween just because of this one reason. And as like this, has a lot of disadvantages and risks. Starting with the first one, the unsafe costumes. Often, the risk starts with the unsafe costumes. They, they may look amazing. The masks may look amazing, but they may block the field of vision of the child. And the child may be wearing a mask and may be crossing a street. And he may not see a car coming, and whatever you expect may definitely happen. And the next one, the long costumes possesses tripping hazard both for the wearer and for others. And the dark costumes are less visible too. And the next one is fire injuries, where the children carry their jack-o'-lanterns with them when they are going on a trick or treat. And the, and, uh, the jack-o'-lantern may be containing the fire and sharp props and things sticks inside it. When they are carrying it, unknowingly, it may affect their eye and can even cause eye injuries. And the next one is children are even more happier on Halloween because they get to eat a lot of candies, gummies, caramels, chocolates, lollipops, and etc., which contains a lot of sugary junk. With the people and children get to eat a lot of sugary junk. And it causes an excellent time for the dentists and a poor time for our teeth. And the next one is it's the Halloween candy pricey, which actually means buying all the right decor for your house, buying candies, buying costumes, like it becomes way more pricey. And the next one is it is spooky. The people who aren't interested in these kind of themes, this day is not for them. This may even cause some mental issues and may even affect their mental health. But besides this, the people love Halloween. And let me say you some reasons why. When it has several advantages, even though it has some disadvantages. During the trick or treat, the children have to develop some strategies to get some candies, monies, or any, money or anything from their neighbors. 
and to do that they have to think more, think uh, even more brilliant and it makes the child to think even more smarter where it helps uh, where it helps the child and the celebration of how memorable and precious moments in the hearts of the child and the parents and it is an excellent opportunity for the parents to know about the emotional capabilities of their children and i uh, as said earlier the halloween was celebrated on october 31st but do you know why let me say you why and the samhain an ancient gaelic festival influenced secular halloween traditions by observing the changing seasons and allowing the communications with spirits that's nothing but like the halloween is a communication uh, with the spirits it was believed like that and as i said before the druids would uh, harvest their crops uh, they would harvest their crops and would give them and would sacrifice themselves as uh, and would uh, give them as sacrifices to the celtic deities and by this time uh, as this is the as halloween was known as the end of the harvest season october 31st was known as the end of the harvest season so it was easy for the people to collect their uh, to harvest their crops directly and burn them as sacrifices to the celtic deities this is the reason why halloween is celebrated on october 31st and this day was announced by the pope gregory 3 and was also uh, and was also announced by pope boniface 4 and uh, but uh, still many christians were disagreeing to this one because the christians festival which is christmas obviously is celebrated in this in the month of december but uh, they they had their like halloween is more over like a christian festival and this halloween is celebrated in october so they thought that they they needed this festival halloween to be also in the month of december but many did not still agree to it so the date is not yet changed but maybe in the future and let me say you some facts which uh, which affected the celebration of halloween from the history the ha- the holiday dates back the ha- the halloween holiday dates back more than 2000 years as i said before nation we know now are aren't taken from any any recorded histories it was taken by the pre recorded histories recorded by the irish monks who recorded the history of their people the celts and the christians as well and as the irish monks recorded those which automatically means that uh, they were uh, not, uh, the christianity was not existing at those time at all and the next one is tricot has existed since the medieval times like the tricoting in the olden days was known as guising getting uh, but now it is uh, known as trick or treating getting candies or money or anything from the neighbors or strangers from on one night isn't that bad it also has many advantages like building a communication or even a bond with the neighbors and making the neighbors more easily approachable it is useful for everybody and but uh, now i think that the idea of trick or treating is totally vanished like the people aren't trick or treating like they did before they are just going on a trick or treat like uh, taking their candies and jack o lanterns with them and saying a thank you and getting all their th- all the freebies from their neighbors but the trick or treating the olden days was even helping uh, the children to exhibit their talents to their neighbors but now it is uh, not useful at all and the third one is some halloween rituals used to involve finding a husband like the single woman used this day to find their future partner where there there were two uh, two ways and traditions where the people and the single woman used to find their husband like they would throw some apple peels on their floor and uh, it may be scattered right so whatever initial is formed by that initial would be the initial of their husband and this was just a belief by the uh, people who were celebrating and following this tradition and there was also another tradition which was uh, which was going in front of a mirror on the halloween night when there's a full moon 
and saying all the expectations and wishes and prayers on your future partner. And they believe that the face of their future partner appeared on that uh, mirror. But many believed, but many didn't believe these as it was like kind of dumb. But still, many believed the, these as they thought that it was real. And the next one is the immigrants helped to popularize the holiday in U.S. And as I said, the people from several different countries came to America and when they were staying here, they started to celebrate Halloween here. And they, when they returned back to their own country, they started to celebrate Halloween there too. So people, uh, among the, uh, people around the world got to know about this Halloween idea and started to celebrate them. And the next one is sugar rationing during the World War II halted trick or treating. There was a sugar rationing which was occurring in the World War II. And by that time, many did not buy candies. As, sugar is con uh, con as candies are containing sugar, as there was a sugar rationing during that, many did not buy candies and many did not even celebrate Halloween. As said earlier, there are two important things for Halloween, which are candies, uh, which, is ca which are candies and costumes. And when, costu when candies are gone, who would just celebrate Halloween? So many stopped it from celebrating Halloween, and this sugar rationing was affecting, and, uh, and this was one consequence which the people were facing during the celebration of Halloween. And once the sugar rationing during the World War II was over, many candy companies began, uh, began advertising their candy. And uh, uh, due to that, many people came to know about many new candy companies. And whatever like candy companies which are famous now may be also a part of it. And the next one is the night before the Halloween is called Mischief Night or Goosey Night. While it is just now called like a, a Halloween Eve, it was known as Goosey Night in the earlier days. And do you know how do we celebrate Halloween nowadays? Yeah, Halloween obviously reminds a popular holiday in U.S. and all around the world. But it didn't, it didn't just quite make it its way through Atlantic. And the Puritans did not at all celebrate Halloween in the history. Maybe they're doing now, but not at all in the history. They did not celebrate it. And by that time, the people were like, the Puritans were against the Halloween, as they thought that they were afraid of this festival. So they got, they, they were thinking about their children. And they uh, protested against this festival called Halloween, that it should not be celebrated. But still, as it had many, uh, uh, many ad advantages like this, it was, it was celebrated, but the Puritans did not make it. And it was not until the second half of the 19th century as the Irish and Scottish immigrants, which means the Irish and Scottish people have celebrated the Halloween just from the second half of the 19th century. And the difference between, the, uh, moving on to the next topic, the difference between present-day Halloween and ancient Samhain. Like in the ancient Samhain, we had a lot of, ta we had a lot of uh, traditions and beliefs and everything. But now we just, uh, but now we don't uh, follow anything. Let me say you in detail. In the olden days, the cells would commemorate and sacrifice uh, their uh, animals or, or crops as sacrifices to the Celtic deities. But nowadays, that tradition isn't followed at all. And the next one is the cells would, uh, the cells were, uh, were wearing the costumes which were made from real nails and skins from, uh, of the animals. But now, these aren't followed also. And the next one is uh, there was a tradition ca uh, called finding a husband, and that is not followed now too. But by that time, there was several many traditions, but these are the traditions which were followed mainly by the people and the, and the cells uh, while they were celebrating Halloween for the first time. And now, Halloween just means you know, uh, wearing your costumes and going on a trick or treat. And uh, you would take your jack-o'-lantern with them, containing some candies, and uh, containing some candies, and you would go to your neighbor and say thank you and get some candies and uh, money from them. 
and just like that you would end your day celebrating it with your uh, family and friends in your home eating some dinner and everything but uh, i don't think it's the true idea of halloween halloween was uh, found to commemorate the gods of evil and the people and uh, the people when they celebrated halloween they thought the dead evil and the uh, and the uh, people who were living in the world were connected much more on these days so they brought a new idea called halloween week where we celebrate halloween with uh, different uh, different types of traditions for seven days of the week and uh, like as said before as he said uh, the idea of trick or treating is vanished many traditions are not even followed nowadays and many more are now vanished so i would like to uh, i would like to conclude my lecture but before that let me recap you uh, let me recap you my lecture in short we've seen how the halloween was originated and how it was uh, and how it was uh, originated from the ancient celtic festival of samhain and we have also seen how the people celebrated the halloween in the olden days and why they have celebrated this festival and we also saw that the druids uh, done some sacrifices to the celtic deities and they even believed that the people who were dead before one or more years would return back to their home and talk to them and when there's a full moon even more much and ha much happier they even uh, believe uh, those when uh, the ha like the when there's a full moon if they celebrate the halloween it was like much uh, happier for them and this was just a belief followed by them and uh, we have also seen about the facts which affected the celebration of halloween in the olden days and we have also seen the disadvantages and advantages of halloween so i would like to end up my lecture saying a quote that the more we have come to know about the past and mystery of the past the more we have come to need halloween i kindly i would like to thank my school management for giving me this wonderful opportunity and the cooperation of my parents my supporting teachers and audience for uh, for my lecture thank you a warm greetings to anandal present here i am shrimati now i am going to give a lecture on the topic ayurveda the ancient indian science of healing ayurveda gives the meaning of study of life it is derived from sanskrit word ayur means life and veda means knowledge it is the traditional healing system that arised in india about 3000 years ago it is being practiced before the birth of buddha that is about 557 bc the main aim of ayurveda is to maintain the balance between mind body and spirit to prevent the illness and extend the life by promoting the health ayurveda focuses on healthy living more than treatment of diseases its medicine works root causes of the disease and tries to understand why an individual has lost his or her physical emotional mental health and gives a permanent cure ayurvedic treatment begins with an internal purification process followed by food diet herbal remedies massage therapies yoga and meditation to cleanse the body and regain the balance ayurveda is not based on assumption but on scientific facts it developed was associated to the natural environment by using the products available in nature as remedies the remedies helped to cure the disease but like the human body over years developed as the popular science of life it is believed to be the oldest and still practiced healing system in the world it is seen as the mother or the source of all medicines the development of ayurveda during vedic periods interesting brahma the creator of universe developed the science of ayurveda through meditation and passed the knowledge to his son prasapadaksha prasapadaksha conveyed the three types to ashwins the divine horse masters and were the children of sun sun god they passed on the hymns of ayurveda to indra he is known as the chief of gods and the king of heaven he taught about ayurveda to a group of saints one of the sages was bharadvaja Bharadvaja passed his knowledge about Ayurveda to Diyodhas Dhanvantari and Punarvasu Atraya. 
Diyodas Dhanvantri is known as the Hindu god of Ayurveda and he is believed to be the incarnation of Lord Sri Mahavishnu. He is an important learner of the subject through whom Ayurveda got into the ordinary people. He went into the city of Varnasi and taught about Ayurveda to his followers. One of the followers was Sushrata. Sushrata is known as the father of surgery. He is responsible for the advancement of medicine in the ancient India. He wrote the knowledge got from Dhanvantri in text called Sushrata Samhita. It includes unique chapters of surgical treating, training, procedures and instruments which is still in the use of modern science of medicine. Punarvasu Atraya, later formed the Atraya school of physicians. He is a renowned physician and philosopher, he lived around 500 BCE. He taught, he believed to have preached Ayurveda to his student Agnivesha, also known as Charaka. Charaka is known as the father of Ayurveda. He wrote the text called Charaka Samhita. It, the edition of Charaka Samhita with survey into the modern era is based on the information wrote by Diridabala. The ancient Ayurvedic text describes eight well-developed clinical branches of Ayurveda. The first one, Kaya Chikitsa. Kaya means body and Chikitsa means treatment. It also refers to Agni. Correction of Agni is the basic line of treatment for most of the disease. Kaya Chikitsa deals with general and seasonal ailments in adults. The role of mind and causing and curing the disease is well recognized in Kaya Chikitsa. The second one, Shalakya Chikitsa. It deals with the treatment for disease occurring with ears, eyes, nose, throat, neck, and head. Shalya Chikitsa. It, Shalya means, Shalya means foreign objects and other materials that enters the body and cause harm. Chikitsa means treatment. It deals with various diseases that require surgical management. Shashrata, the father of surgery, has well explained scientifically classified many of the disease that require surgical management. Agadatandra, it involves identification, prevention, and treatment for various visha conditions, both internal and external. Graha Chikitsa, it especially involves psychosomatic disorders and the disease caused through unknown reason. Psychosomatic disorders are one do not have visible symptoms, but are rooted to the factors related to mental health. Asaina Chikitsa, the word Rasaina gives the meaning of attaining excellent dhatus. It is a therapeutic procedure where foods, herbs are used to bestow the youthfulness and cure the disease. Medicinal plants are described as Rasayanas in Ayurveda. Ashwagandha and Kuduchi are best among the Rasayanas described by Charaka. Vajikarna Chikitsa. It, this subject is concerned with fertility and improving the health of pregnancy. Vala Chikitsa. It is about periodic care and about the spe specific disease that affect the children. The principle of natural cure is found on the theory of Panchamahabhutas that the human body is made up of great five elements fire, water, earth, yadar, and air. Yadar gives the meaning of space. These five elements are interconnected with each other and have yadar as their base. When the potential in the empty space gets activated, it results in air. The air provides fuel for fire to burn, and the other provides capacity for fire to burn. Fire is developed from these two elements, air and other. Fire acts as a generator of energy in our body. When the fire makes the air denser, it produces water. This process continues until water uses the earth. Earth contains the essence of those four elements. Yadar provides space for earth to exist, and the air provides the earth with subtle movements. Water, it is permanent within the earth. It acts as a bridge between solid and gaseous matter. Fire, it is developed within the earth bound with the help of chemical bond. The ratios of these elements present in the human body differs. 
as there is 75 percentage of water, 6 percentage of air, 12 percentage of earth, 4 percentage of fire, and remaining are filled with other. The percentage of first four elements are same all the time. But the percentage of other can be improved or decreased according to each person. Earth. It forms solid structures such as nail, teeth, bone, muscle, joints in our body. Earth element and the capacity of smell have a special relationship. It enables our body to experience smell. Nose is the organ through which we can smell. So it is considered as the sense organ of earth. Fire, it is the earliest form of perception, light and vision. It provides light for perception. Eyes is the organ through which light is received and perception takes place. So eyes is considered as the sense organ of fire. Fire forms thirst, hunger, color of our eyes, vision, vision of our eyes, color of our skin in our body. Water, it is the only element we can taste. Tongue is the vehicle through which we can taste. So tongue is considered as the same organ of water. The taste buds, present the tongue works when only there is the presence of water. When there is no water in our body, the disorders of tasting abilities can affect us. Air present in the body in the form of motion. Its forces allow our blood to circulate, breathe to move, nerves impulses to travel, thoughts to flow. It is the potential of touching experience through which the skin is so skin is considered as the sense organ of air. Other, it is the space where vibration develops before it takes the form of sound in the ear. Ear, it is considered as the sense organ of ear. Sense organ of ear. It the other present in the body in the empty space between the cells and tissues. Other. The hollowness in the empty lungs, blood vessels, and intestine bladder are filled with yadar. According to Ayurveda, human body is made up of three fundamental categories. They are doshas, datus, and malas. The, the combination of great five elements forms three types of doshas, vata dosha, pitta dosha, and kapha dosha. These are the energies present in our body and controls our psychological functioning of body and mind. Vata dosha ensures the smooth functioning of heart, respiration, contraction of muscle, circulation of, breath, breath, circulation of blood, communication of brain through the nerves to the entire body. Pitta dosha. It is located in the navel's upper abdominal region. It is the heat energy present in our body that is invisible. It manifests itself in your metabolism and, and involved in breakdown of food in stomach, intestine formation of enzymes, releasing of hormones from endocrine gland to bloodstream. The water element also has a small contribution in it. This also means that pitta bio energy is present in all human body, which is primarily made up of heat. Kapha dosha, hence the water element in it, it nourishes the body tissues and maintains our skin with moisture content. It controls the strength and stability of the body structure. The second factor, dhatus, the three doshas controls the tissues of the body. So the doshas works on the tissues, makes the human body. The tissues are also called as dhatus. In common terms, the seven types of dhatus are plasma, blood, muscle, fat, bone, bone marrow, and reproductive fluid. In Ayurveda, it is called as sapta dhatus. Rasa, rakta, mamsa, maja, medha, asti, and shukra, the essence part of the food circulates all over the body and nourishes the body tissues. The word dhatu is derived from dhru, the root word of Sanskrit, which used meaning of holding together. Like the tissues, make the body and hold the body together. The third factor is malas. The three important malas are purusha, mutra, and sveda. These are generated from food. The other malas are cellular waste, the excretion from eyes, 
ears and nose. Hair is also a mala, while the body expels the waste in the form of hair. Malas want to be discarded from the body regularly to function it properly. Hence, it can transform and affect dhatus, which will in turn impact the balance of doshas. The, so, waste formed after energy burning process in the body want to be expelled. Mala related problems are body odor, fungal infection, hair loss, dehydration, and many other. Imbalance of dry doshas. The diet that contain too much dry and raw foods, over consumption of cold food items, too much travel, stress and frustration cause the imbalance of vata dosha. When the vata dosha stays imbalanced for a long time, pitta dosha and kapha dosha gets imbalanced as well. When the doshas are weighted beyond the level, it gives rise to various toxins which have tendency to cause disease in the body. These are weighted beyond the level of pacification, hence need to be expelled from the body. The reason for an individual's imbalance may differ, hence it's very important to provide correct treatment for each disease. Before starting the treatment, the disease won't be well analyzed by the healer. Healer creates a customized treatment for each person according to the Nadi Pariksha, dominant dosha, and overall constitution. There are five diagnostic methods in Ayurveda. They are Purva Rupa, Rupa, Ups, Samprapti, Upsaya, and Ashtavida Pariksha. Purva Rupa is a reference to the early signs of the disease, which eventually led up to the full-fledged symptoms of illness in the patient. Rupa is a set of problems the, the patient brings to the notice of the healer who make touches and persuasion to adjust the state of the individual's health. Samprapti, it traces the one set of problems in the patient in all the way from Nidana stage. Here, the status of metabolism, age, overall physical and mental condition plays a crucial role. Upsaya, it is a therapeutic test when Herbs and some lifestyle tips are adjusted by healer to the patient that works against the disease. Ashtavida Pariksha. It is a special stage where a thorough examination takes place. Here, the healer inspects the nadi, sabda, sparsa, jiva, drik, mala, and mutra of the patient. Ayurveda is extensively well defined, divided into three main aspects Shodhana, Shamana, and Nidana Parivarjana. Shodhana is a purification therapy which involves expulsion of where the vital dosha such as Vata, Pitta, Kapha are forcefully expelled from the body. And it involves the conversion of poisonous drug into when beneficial one. It consists of three main stages. Purva karma, preparatory purification prior for the main purification therapy. Pradhana karma, it is the main purification therapy known as pancha karma. They are vamana, vireshana, basti, nasya, and rakta mokshana. The post uh, karma, the post purification therapy. Panja karma comes to the Shodhana Chikitsa, which plays a vital role in Ayurvedic system of medicine. Panja karma is a treatment program for body, mind, and consciousness that rejuvenates and cleanses. It is based on five basic principles. Each human is a unique phenomenon made through five basic elements: fire, water, earth yadar and air. The combination of these elements forms three doshas, vata, pitta, and kapha dosha. Their balance is unique to each individual. When their balance is disturbed, it causes disorders resulting, resulting in disease. Panja karma is provided individually for each person according to their dominant dosha, overall constitution, specific disorder, so it requires close observation and supervision. Panjakarma involves the procedure of cleansing the body by removing all accumulated toxins from lungs, blood vessels, nervous system, and digestive system. It leaves you in a state of peacefulness. It's considered both as preventive and healing mechanism. 
before starting the treatment, the body want to be prepared in the consulted method. The two methods are Snehna and Svedna. Snehna or Oleation therapy it is an important therapy it, which uh, prepares your body to sp receive specialized Panchakarma treatment. In it, it involves application of medicated oil, herbs, and ghee in the body, both external and externally and internally, for three to seven days. It loosens the toxins and body doshas for its facilitating during Panchakarma treatment. Svedana is a therapy where stream bath is taken. Five types of karma. Vamana, it involves induced vomiting to eliminate excess mucus and toxins in the body. It is used to help treat digestive disorders and respiratory disorders. Basti, it involves use of enema to remove the toxins from colon. It is used to treat digestive disorders, constipation, and hemorrhoids. Nausea. This holistic approach for treatment involves the use of nasal drops and spray. This is designed to treat the allergies and headaches and other sinus issues. Rectamoxina. It involves bloodletting, usually in the form of leeches, both inside and outside the, bo on, the on the body. When you provide this treatment, it helps to treat skin and blood disorders. Shamana Chikitsa. It re-energizes the body by removing the toxins that remain after Shodhana Chikitsa, rather than ousting them. It focuses on harmonizing the constitution, strengthening the immunity, and uh, strengthening the physical and mental condition of the body. It is based on four main, four basic principles for, of the healthy functioning of the body. They are restoring the balance of three biological energies and diminishing the symptoms and eliminating the causes of the disease in their initial stage. Restoring the harmonic metabolism and supports supporting the healthy functioning of seven bodily tissues, ensuring the excretion of, uh, regular excretion of toxic substance from the body. Nidana Parivarjana. Nidana means cause and Parivarjana means removal or eradication. Any treatment is not successful without the eradication of cause. It is an important principle of management. This is specifically indicated for management of the disease caused due to microorganisms. The, the Shamana Shikitsa is a popular option when the strength strong and exhaustive treatment Panjakarma cannot be used because of the because the patient does not have mental and physical condition to bear the insisting of panjakarma treatment. The food, the food diet. In Ayurveda, the diet has therapies play as great importance because it considers human body as the product of food. The food in the body transforms first into rasa, and the successive process involves its conversion of blood, muscle, bone, bone marrow, fat, and reproductive elements. Food is basic for all metabolic transformation and other lifestyle act life activities. Lack of food leads to improper transformation of food leads to a variety of disease. Uh, according to Ayurveda, there are, there are seven essential factors that is needed for all balanced diet. They are carbohydrates, protein, vitamins, minerals, water, f fat, and, and uh, fat. The, uh, in Ayurveda, the medicinal drugs are derived from vegetable sources from various parts of the plant, like stem, leaf, roots and fruit extract or has the whole plant. Current, situa current, situ current situation of Ayurveda. In, uh, nowadays, after using various treatment styles, the world is turning to the Asian system of medicine. More than 30 countries have accepted Ayurveda as their, 
as they uh, as they are a traditional medicine system here people are realizing the benefits of ayurveda and its role in uh, and and its role in and its role in boosting the immunity current situation plays the right time for ayurveda to become even more popular world health organization estimates that 4 billion people that is 80 percentage of the world population uses herbal medicine for some aspects of primary health care Nepal is the first country to execute national policy on Ayurveda. Full-fledged Ayurveda degree course of five and a half years was conducted by Tripudan University, Kathmandu. Mr. Pushpakamal Prachanda, the Prime Minister of Nepal, has sought India's help in researching on Ayurveda in Hima Himalayan nation. He, he has said that the, his Nepal government will promote the health tourism by popularizing Ayurveda and will take decisions to symptomatize the exports and imports of, imports of uh, essential Ayurvedic herbs. The Ayurveda is uh, growing as industry, rapidly growing as an industry both outside and inside India. The Indian Ayurvedic market size have reached INR 626 billion in 2022 and looking forward to reach 1,824 billion in 2028. World Ayurveda Congress 2023 was held in Nepal in a five-star hotel, shortly Kathmandu. World Ayurveda Congress is a platform established by World Ayurveda Foundation to propagate Ayurveda globally in its true sense. It is the largest gathering of its kind for exploring new frontiers in the field of medicine. It started, started in 2022 at Kochi, Kerala. Kerala is known all over the world for its Ayurvedic treatment and massages rather than its placid backwaters. However, a huge competition is given by various spas and resorts located in Uttargand and Goa to promote and uh, protect ayurveda for the next generation the government has formed a ministry called ayush ayush are short for ayurveda yoga unani siddha and homeopathy sri sarbananda sonawal is the present ayush minister of india ayush ministry is responsible for development of education propagation and researches of traditional medicine system in india it is uh, the uh, in 2021 that three Ayurveda private unlisted company has received license for Ayu 64, the COVID preventive tablet. It is the first uh, Ayurvedic medicine manufacturer to receive license for Ayu 64 in Kerala. Ayu 64 is a polyherbal formulation that work effectively works uh, that effectively used to do treat symptomatic and uh, moderate and mild COVID-19. In 1980, it was introduced to treat malaria. Now it is repurposed to treat COVID-19. The Union Ministry of Ayush has said that the all hospitals run by central government, including allopathy, allopathy, the patient will be getting the option of homeopathy and the Ayurveda. Still, Ayush Minister, government, and Indian Prime Minister are doing many things to promote and uh, protect Ayurveda for the next generation. According to industry experts, 74 percentage of Indians are stressed out and 86 percentage experience anxiety in their daily lives. It can cause significant impact on the emotions and the entire conduct. It might decrease the response of immune system and which uh, it's uh, by releasing hormones in as a part of, as a part of the body's stress response uh, the basic idea of ayurveda is that to sustain healthy life for, uh, for health health uh, sustain our health for all lifetime we must control our emotions 
maintain a balanced diet, yoga and meditation for personal well-being. The practicing of Ayurveda not only cures the disease, it uh, changes our lifestyle into a healthy one. I thank for the school management for giving a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Thank you. A warm greetings to everyone present here. I am Vishnuvardhini KR of Grade 9. Today, I am here to share about the art and science of meditation. The English word meditation has been derived from two Latin words. Meditare, which means to think, focus attention, and mediri, which means to heal. Meditation is called dhyana in Sanskrit, which comes from the root word dhyati, meaning to contemplate or meditate. That's why the word meditation has been confused with contemplation, concentration, mind control, etc. One definition, which finds a universal and widespread acceptance, is that meditation simply means a no-thought state. Maharishi Patanjali called this state as Chitta Vritti Niradak. New Age Meditations the New Age meditations are influenced by Hinduism, Buddhism, and Yoga. The New Age meditations aim at blanking out the minds and being released from conscious thoughts. Repeated chanting of mantras, focusing on a particular object, are New Age meditative practices. A common thing about meditation. All meditation practices in common. They all focus upon quieting the busy mind. In each practice, the mind is filled with peace and calm. While the methods of meditation may be different, the end goal remains the same. One needs to understand that meditation is not about techniques. It is just a way of being, seeing, knowing, and loving. Meditation is a no-mind state. It's just a happening emptying the mind of all thoughts, letting go, detachment, non-doing, silencing the inner talk, makes contact with our inner essence. What meditation is not? Meditation is not an intellectual process. It's not a mental exertion, contemplation, concentration, prayer, worship, chanting of mantras, mind control, a state of mind. Various types of meditation. Meditation possesses a wide variety of practices. Some most well-known of them are Vipassana, Transcendental Meditations, Zen Meditations, Guided and Mantra Meditations. Meditation can be classified broadly into concentration practices and mindfulness practices. In concentration practices, the practitioner intensively concentrates on a particular object of attention and consistently brings the mind back to the chosen object. In mindfulness practices, the practitioner freely shifts from one perception to the next, being mindful to all sensations, images, thoughts, memories, sounds and smells without being involved in any one of them. How to meditate? The best posture for meditation is Sukhasan, which means a comfortable posture. Most practitioners prefer to sit cross-legged on the floor with the feet tucked underneath their body and their back held upright. It is advisable to sit comfortably. The hands must be placed gently on the lap and the fingers of the two hands must be interlocked. Spectacles should be removed and eyes should be allowed to close gently. Breathe only through your nose and keep your mouth closed. Focusing the mind on the continuous rhythm of in-breath and out-breath provides the natural object for meditation. Don't fight with your thoughts. When a thought comes, observe it, acknowledge it, but don't get attached to it. When to meditate? Meditation is best done in darkness. It can be done in the morning after a good sleep. Meditation during works helps to reduce tensions and bring focus back to our job. While pulled together in a group meditation, each one of us radiates a lot of energy. Meditation before going to bed 
helps the mind to settle down and sleep well. Where to meditate? Choosing a place to meditate is a matter of personal preference. Most meditators like to set aside particular places for regular meditations. A small room, a corner of your bedroom is enough for our practice. You may choose to meditate outside in the open as long as you don't sit near a busy road or any other noisy places. When you're well established in your practice, you will be able to meditate in just about any place, however noisy. How long to meditate? How long should one meditate is a question asked by most beginners. It has been observed that a five years old child must meditate for five minutes. A 25 years old youth must meditate for 25 minutes. And a 50 years old person must meditate for 50 minutes. In other words, you must meditate for one minute for every year of your current age. However, for a beginner about 20 years of age, it is good to start with a 20 minute meditation, diligently increasing this time by one minute every day, because one's ability to meditate increases with practice. To end the meditation, do not open your eyes before the appointed time. Let the mind obey you. The primary stages of meditation. In the first stage, the meditator becomes conscious of the body and the mind. In the second stage, the meditator begins to explore and develop an awareness of inner self. In the third stage, thoughts stop and the breath is not felt at all. Of meditation. Physical benefits. Improves brain concentration, physical relaxation, breathing efficiency, attention, and lowers blood pressure. Psychological benefits. Relaxation understanding root cause of problems, feeling more energetic, reduction of emotional distress, decreased tendency of worry, a stable and balanced personality, peace of mind. Mental benefits. Switching off the noise of the mind improves mental concentration, mental processing skills, creativity. Relationship benefits. Improves confidence, increases perceptual ability, reduces judgment and resistance. Spiritual benefits. Improves present moment awareness, feeling inner peace and joy, growth of wisdom, removing the fake masks we wear to the society. Social benefits. Reduction in crime, violence, conflict, and increases positivity. Distracting experiences during meditation. External distractions. External distractions may come from sounds inside the meditating room, such as someone clearing the throat, coughing or snoring. Sometimes sounds may also emanate from outside the room. Internal distractions. Internal distractions may be physical, emotional or mental. At times, they can be pretty painful. Meditation and emotions. Meditation makes us look at our emotions more clearly and teaches us how to explore each aspect of our emotions and do not run away from them. Meditation and workplace. When we carry our meditation into our workplace, any situation can be used as a meditative practice. For example, if there is a tension between the workers and the management, you can use that opportunity to meditate upon that tension. Meditation in illness. We must remember that more severe the illness, more the requirement of meditation. We can cure most of our health problems by meditation without taking any medicines. Can meditation improve mental health? Mental illness has historically been one of the most difficult categories of sickness. For medicine to suffer, where mindfulness meditation seems to be the greatest promise. The most definitive clinical benefit researchers have thus far been able to think that mindfulness meditation intervention is a significant reduction in depression reliefs. A Buddha nature. Buddha also ate when he was hungry, rested when he was tired. He also caught certain sickness depending on the physical conditions and environmental hygiene. 
But there was one part of the Buddha that was never sick, hungry, or tired. That's the real self. Each one of us possesses the real self. The art of meditation. The art of meditation requires you to slow down, be present, and resist judging the thoughts that enter your brain. The art of meditation requires sitting or lying down with your eyes closed. The science of meditation. One most observation is that the scientists have made is the irrefutable change in brain waves during meditation. Beta brain waves have the frequency of 13 to 38 cycles per second. Alpha brain waves hover between 7 and 13 cycles per second. Theta brain waves stay within the range of 4 to 7 cycles per second. Delta brain waves have the lowest frequency, which is about 1.5 to 4 cycles per second, but they have the largest amplitude. Gamma brain waves are recorded during trauma or accidents. In meditation, the beta brain wave naturally slows down into an alpha wave state and eventually keeps fluctuating between the theta and alpha wave state. Meditation controls our blood chemistry by either increasing or decreasing production of some hormones. Meditation done in darkness increases the flow of melatonin, which is linked with the regulation of sleep. Meditation increases the activity of natural killer cells, which kills cancer cells and bacteria. Science have recorded that during meditation, the heart rate slows down by several beats per minute, and the respiration slows down by at least two breaths per minute. The science in our world has not yet completely developed to the level that it can completely understand the way how meditation actually works. Even though no scientific study until now has even come close to explaining how meditation actually works and there hasn't been any widespread collaboration between neuroscientists and experts in meditation. Science and meditation today. There's a plenty of scientific benefits of meditation backed by plenty of studies and research. Although it is true that in the history of meditation, various religions have practiced it over years. Today, it is considered around the world to grow spirituality and personality. The Vedantic philosophy. In Vedantic philosophy, a human being consists of five sheds or layers, known as the pancha koshas. First layer, annamaya kosh, or the physical shed. Second layer, pranamaya kosh, or the vital energy shed. Third layer, manamaya kosh, or the mental shed. Fourth layer, vishnanmaya kosh, or the intellect shed. Fifth layer, Anand Maya Kosh or the Bliss Shed. These sheds or layers are contained one inside the other, like the segments of a collapsible telescope. The seven chakras. First chakra or Muladhara chakra. The Muladhara chakra is located between the anus and the genitals and is connected to the base of the spine, also known as the coccyx. Second chakra or Swadhisthana chakra. The Swadhisthana chakra is located below the navel in the lower abdomen and is rooted in emotions and focused on desire. Third chakra or Manipura chakra. The Manipura chakra is located about two finger breadths above the navel and is associated with the element of fire. It's rooted in ego. Its main quality is peace. Physically, the third chakra governs digestion. Fourth chakra or Anahata chakra. The Anahata chakra is located at the center of the chest at the level and vicinity of heart cavity. The fourth chakra is also called green or cardiac center and holds our emotional energy. The fourth chakra is rooted in social identity and focused on acceptance. Fifth chakra or Vishuddhi chakra. The Vishuddhi chakra is located between the neck and the larynx, beginning at the cervical vertebra behind the Adam's apple. It is associated with the element of ether and is related to creativity and expression. Sixth chakra or Ajna chakra. The Ajna chakra 
is located at the center of the forehead, about one finger breadth above the bridge of the nose, between the two eyebrows. It is also called Go or Third Eye Chakra and holds our intuitive energy. Indigo children are born with fully activated Third Eye Chakra. Seventh Chakra or the Crown Chakra. The seventh chakra is not really a chakra, but is connected to our higher selves and divine. Our thoughts affect our chakras, because every thought, whether emotional or mental, is connected to a chakra. Regular meditations keep our chakras healthy and active. Our zero point. Our real self has no boundaries, has no fears, follows no rules, personal agendas, agreements and disagreements with anyone. It appreciates everything and everyone exactly as it is. It lives in an unconditional space of unconditional love. It loves being in the state of total appreciation. Our real self is generous. It effortlessly gives of itself and feels a natural positivity in life. Different strokes for different folks. The best part of this inner journey is that even though we all have the same consciousness inside us, our experience of it always differs. That's why it is called self-discovery. If someone tells us the entire story of the movie, we don't enjoy watching it as much. That's why the inner story has been created with infinite storylines, even though the end of each story remains the same told story. Mind games. Some of our friends and family members are oriented to the outer world. They cling to the peripheral plane and feel convinced that they cannot meditate. They feel that they are too worldly, extroverted, and materialistic to indulge in meditation. Such people remain unhappy and tired with their efforts to fly. If we have such people in our experience, we have to tell them about meditation, but not force them into it. We must always remember that each person follows their own truth, and we have no right to interfere in his or her chosen path. It's not our duty to bring them into our path. It's our duty to respect their path as the right path for them. Meditator's Dilemma Most meditators become so addicted to the meditational bliss that they wish to escape the world. They join monasteries, become monks, go to the Himalayas and choose sannyas. They prefer to live alone and become introverts. They not only close their eyes in meditation, but also close the window to the outer world. We must remember not to fall in this spiritual trap. Such people remain unhappy, frustrated and tired because they try to fly with just one wing. As long as we choose either one, our life will remain lopsided. We need to integrate both aspects of our life. What are the restrictions to meditation? Meditation has no restrictions because there are no side effects of meditation. People who have mental disorders are advised to go slow with their meditation because meditation can enhance the agitation of their sick mind. If we meditate after understanding the basics of meditation, we won't falter in any way. Your own inner guidance is your real teacher. A balanced life. A balanced life includes both the sansar and the sannyas. It is about being both, the extrovert and the introvert. That's why meditators are known to be in the world, but not of it. A balanced life embraces both the material and the spiritual. It gives equal importance to the monastery and the household. There is no dichotomy in a balanced life. A meditator understands the apparent paradox of duality. History of meditation. Various historical data suggest that meditation was practiced by mankind ever since prehistoric times. Repetitive, Rhythmic chants, prayers, or holy words were used to produce meditative states. However, in the olden days, the practice of meditation was a well-guarded secret, and only a few chosen ones were allowed to know the secret. 
But time has come for this practice to reach the masses. A deep spiritual hunger across the world has also revived people's interest in meditation. Myths and misconceptions about meditation. Even though most religions have meditative practices as a part of their rituals, meditation does not belong to any specific religion. It is true that all yogis meditate, but meditation is not only for them. The practice of meditation helps everyone face life with positivity. It is more, meditation is not at all a serious thing. Once you understand it, it is pure fun to meditate. Technology can create a favorable environment for meditation, but it can't ensure meditation. Meditation is not about covering up your troubles. It is about noticing them and accepting them fully. When you give time to yourself in meditation, it seems like a selfish act. But the benefits of meditation does not only help you, but also helps your environment. Meditation is the simplest practice because it involves non-doing. It is not at all difficult to meditate. Even though meditation does help in solving our problems through cultivating a calm and clear mind, meditation by itself is not a quick cure for all ills. There are many time wasters, namely channel flipping, internet surfing, chatting, and so on. Meditation is a very productive practice. Most meditators live wonderful, happy lives, and many get involved in social work, shouldering to social responsibilities in addition to their personal responsibilities. Meditation is a way of being. When it is embraced from an earlier age, it enables us to live wonderful, happy, and peaceful lives. It is therefore essential for anyone above five years of age to meditate. Being present in every moment. Meditation is about being present in every moment, observing, acknowledging. It is about living each moment completely. Just this small understanding carries immense powers to change the quality of our lives. Success of meditation is not proved by the exotic experiences we have when we sit in silence. It is proved by the moment-to-moment -moment awareness of every small nuance of life, by making a certain what is right for us and what is not right for us. In meditation, we don't try to get someplace else. We allow ourselves to be exactly where we are and as we are. At last, I conclude my lecture that regular meditations helps us to connect with our root system, our foundation, by making us dive deep within. Do not expect anything from your life and your meditation. Be like a child. Play with meditation, play with life. Your job is to persevere and do your practice. Remain open to anything that might happen in meditation and in life. Do not compare your experiences with those of others in meditation and in life. Let go of your preconceived ideas about meditation and about life. Meditate seriously, but don't become serious. Remember that enlightenment happens only in a playful moment. Thank you for my school management to creating me this wonderful platform to convey my thoughts. And I extend my thanks to all the teachers, my parents and my grandparents, and my friends. Thank you. Warm greetings to one and all present here. I'm Akshat of grade 9B, and I'm here to give a lecture on the topic, the psychology of decision making. The psychology means the study of the human brain. So psychology of decision making means the study of the human brain in which decision making is involved. First, let me tell you the process of decision making. The first process is to gather the information. Without gathering the right information, you can never make the proper decision. When you are gathering information, you have, to aware, you have to be aware of the biases and heuristics that you may face while gathering information. You have to be sure that you are gathering information from a trustworthy source. Next, the second step is to analyze it. You have to clearly analyze the information and make the right decision. After clearly analyzing the information, you consider the pros and cons of each and every option that you have. If you have 100 options, you have to consider each and every option. 
because if you don't you may make better you may make uh, lot not very good decisions or may stutter in between and try to think of a new solution then you have to understand the possible consequences if you understand the possible consequences then you can of course make your right decisions when you make your right decisions your life will be easier and better then you pick the most appealing option and evaluate it trying to go out with it if it's not very good you have to change your decision if you not if you cannot change it you might think what you can do and act accordingly next let us see some theories of decision making there are many theories which in which of them i will be explaining three so the first thing is the rational decision making model the rational decision making model is not to be sure was invented by whom the rational decision making model however involves that it states that we know everything but in reality we don't really know everything according to the rational decision making model the first step is to clearly define the problem supposing that we know every information it states that we have to identify the criteria of the problem but we don't really know every criteria of that problem and we often stutter to use this method the next step is to generate alternatives we generate many alternatives that we can go out with if the decision that we choose is not really good then we evaluate the alternatives and then choose the best alternative after choosing the best alternative we are implementing the decision when we implement the decision we have to monitor it and evaluate it and change it if necessary the next thing is the prospect theory the prospect theory was invented by amos twersky and daniel kahneman two psychologists who worked so hard to bring up this they say that prospect theory is regarding the risks and losses and profits and opportunities of options people tend to take less risks when they are seeking for profits but they would give their life to avoid losses for example let's say you go out to buy a car there is a 50% of getting a car for 10000 rupees you will be not so interested because there's only a 50% chance you might lose 10000 dollars but there is a 50% chance of losing your current car if you pay 10000 rupees and there is a 50% chance of not losing it then you are going to do it because it provides you with your car that you already have so the next theory is the bounded rationality theory the bounded rationality theory is a criticism theory invented by herbert simon herbert simon states that the rational decision making model is not really a good model because it supposes that we know all relevant information in the world but sometimes we don't really know all information and have to make decisions based on what we know and what we have available in our mind so the bounded rationality theory suggests that we choose whatever we think the best option is rather than considering every option and choosing the best one from each and every option so the next thing we are going to see about our biases and heuristics so biases and heuristics are when you you are focused on par, on a particular thing and ignore the other so the first thing is confirmation bias you can see here as we have the evidence that we ignore and the evidence that supports our beliefs but we often only take the evidence that supports our beliefs and ignore other evidence con contradicting it this can often lead to confirmation bias confirmation bias was invented by peter jason and jerome bruno two hard working psychologists also lecturers the confirmation bias can lead to many bad decisions bad decisions are very bad for your life so to over overcome confirmation bias you have to consider a lot of different sources if you only consider a single ghost single uh, source you are said to be experiencing confirmation bias so the next thing is availability heuristic the availability heuristic was invented by the same psychologist amos tversky and daniel kahneman the availability heuristic suggests that we make decisions based upon the information that is most relevant and available to us rather than considering every information so let's say for example take corona virus so if the corona virus is said to be uh, viral and will infect a lot of people but if you have it you are going to give the impression that your friends and your family are going to have it but if they are not going to have it they are not going to have it since you have it they might think they will get it too this is the availability heuristic next let us see about anchoring bias anchoring bias again was invented by amos tversky and daniel kahneman 
Anchoring bias states that we anchor to the first piece of information rather than considering every other information. The first piece of information acts here as the anchor. For example, let's say you go buy a car, 10,000 rupees. If, if the salesperson is giving you the car for 10,000 rupees, you're buying it for 10,000 rupees. But when you negotiate it, you might go to as little as 9,000. When you do that, you are, the salesperson is experiencing a loss of 1,000 rupees. So if you're buying a car that the salesperson says is 9,000 rupees, you will negotiate it rather than highballing it. That is the anchoring bias. You stick to the first piece of information rather than considering other things. So next, let's see about emotions in decision making. Emotions are really a great major tool that affects your decisions, but when you channel them properly, you can use them to your great success. Emotions can be greatly experienced by these emotions. When you are, fear, when you are fearful, you may be less willing to take risks. You won't really take risks when you are fearful, or you may take more risks when you are fearful. This is known as the fight or flight response of our body. When you, are featuring, you are, when you are featuring a problem, you might fight the problem or flee from it, activating the flight response of your body. When you are angry, you might activate the prime response of your body. The prime response means that you are going to be more willing to make decisions. When you are more willing to make decisions, you are going to make either bad decisions or good ones which are really good for you. You may be overconfident, which may lead to making bad decisions. When you are happy, you may make good decisions, but, but the overconfidence may lead to bad decisions. Next, let us see some strategic steps to make better decisions. So the first step is to define the problem, as we see in earlier. Next, you gather information. Gathering information is not really an easy task, but you have to do it anyways if you're going to make better decisions. Then you consider alternatives, then you evaluate the pros and cons of every alternatives. The pros and cons mean nothing but the positives and negatives of each and every option. If you don't think that this step is necessary, it's really bad for you because the pros and cons need to be considered to make good decisions. Then you have to prioritize your values. Don't think that just because someone said that it's the right decision, it's the right decision. It is never the right decision because someone said so. You have to consider it for yourself and view it from your viewpoint first. Then you consider the potential consequences of each and every option. After considering them, you take your time. Don't make hasty decisions. When you make hasty decisions, they are really bad for you because you don't have enough time to gather all the information that you gathered up all night to make a better decision. Then you seek feedbacks and send feedbacks. Seek feedbacks from elders, experts, and other people who you know are going to make the decision better than you. Then you reflect on your past decisions. Experience can really be a great thing to use in your decision-making times. Experience can provide you with a lot of memorable memories which you're going to use to make your better decisions. Use decision-making frameworks. Decision-making frame frameworks are nothing but tools or simple uh, heuristics that you can use to make better decisions. So let, now let us see more deeper about the decision-making frameworks. So the first thing is cost-benefit analysis. You're going to write down the costs and benefits of each and every option. If the cost is higher than the benefit, you're not going to make the decision. But if the cost is lesser than the benefits, you have to make the decision, of course, because that is going to be a really good decision. Then we have decision trees. As you can see, the decision trees are subdivisions of decisions. When you have many decisions, Following the first decision that you make, you can always use these decision-making trees. So the next thing is the pros and cons analysis, as we've seen before. You write down the pros, you write down the cons. Cancel each them out. What's remaining? The pros or the cons? Whatever is remaining is going to be bad or either good. If pros are remaining, you make the decision. If there are negatives remaining, don't make the decision. Then we have SWOT analysis. The SWOT analysis is the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So you cancel out the strengths for the weaknesses and opportunities for the threats. When there are more opportunities but less weaknesses, you make the decision. When there are more threats and less strength, don't make the decision. Next, let us see about the Pareto analysis. Let's say, for example, your car has break, broken down. There is an engine problem, a mirror problem, and then a seat puncture. What would you repair first? 
you have to of course repair the engine problem because that is the most suitable thing that has caused your car to break down. But instead, if you think that other things are going to affect the breakdown of the car, then it's of course foolish. First, you have to consider the main thing, which is greater. If you don't consider that and repair other things, it's going to cause a lot of headache. Then we have decision matrix. We have to write down each and every solution of the problem that we are facing. When we write down the solutions, then we have the criterion of the problem. If the criterion, let's say for example, you're buying a car, and then the car has good mileage, and then has more petrol capacity. If the petrol capacity is higher, and mileage is higher, you write it down. How the mileage is going to affect your experience as a car driver, and you write down how your experience will be affected by the petrol tank size. You write it down and calculate it. If, they, if let's say you're buying another car, which is, has less fuel capacity, but high mileage, you add the, add the sums and get with the answer. If your answer is positive, you make the decision. But if your answer is lesser than the previous answer, you don't make the decision. Next, let's see about game theory. This is really an interesting theory. This is for group decision making. You're in a group, but you don't know what decision the other person is going to make. For example, let's say you're doing a crime and got arrested. What would you do? If you lie and your friend tells the truth, you might get five years of imprisonment and your friend two years. When both say the truth, you get two years, the friend gets two years. But if your friend lies and you say the truth, you'll get two years and your friend get fi getting five years. But when you say the truth and he's saying the truth, both get two years. See here. So you can see the second option is of course the better option because there is only a hundred percent chance of getting only two years. But when you're making the first decision, either you, can, you are getting five years of imprisonment or you're going free. That is a very bad decision to make, as you are getting a 50% chance of going to jail for five years and another 50% for no, uh, for no uh, imprisonment at all. You have to, of course, say the truth. You can only get two years of imprisonment. So next, you have to seek different perspectives to make better decisions. You have to seek out diverse viewpoints. When seeking out diverse viewpoints, consider that their sources are trustworthy and true. You have to be make them trustworthy and true sources and consider their options, va options valuably. Then listen actively. When someone is telling you some advice, listen actively. Never regard them. When you regard them, you might end up making bad decisions because the advice may be very relatable to your decision that you are going to make. Then empathize. If someone else is, would make the decision, you have to put yourselves in their shoes and empathize what is their decision and what will they do if this is their situation. But if you want to stand out and do something better, you can do it. Just make sure that you follow all of these steps that we've discussed before. Then you have to challenge the assumptions. You can never assume that something is right just because everyone else is doing it. You have to challenge those assumptions to make better decisions. Then you have to consider the source, of course, because if your source is really a bad source or just a lie, you're not going to make it. Then ask yourself some questions. Just don't forcefully make your decision. You have to ask questions and change your attitude towards asking questions. Then encourage an open dialogue. Talk with people. Talk with more people. Talk with even more people because you cannot just make your decision all on your own. Then let's see about the differences between group and individual decision making. The first thing is the number of decision makers. When you are single, you are going to make the decision solely upon you. When you are making a decision in a group, each group member has to be considered and the decision is going to be a group decision rather than an individual one. Next, we have the diversity of perspectives. When you are singly, solely making decisions, your group you don't have a group and make decisions based on only your perspectives. But if you make decisions in a group, all perspectives are considered and the decision may be better. But instead, if the group is biased, the decision may not be better after all because each group member is going to have a single diverse opinion. Time and resources. When you're making a decision individually, the time and resource required is really less. You can just sit in your home, make the decision, and go to your workplace to implement it. But when you're making a group decision, you, ha you, have, you need to have a lot of time and resources. 
because you might need to provide the snacks for the group members while they are making the decision. And the time needed to invite each, every, each and every one of them to make that decision is going to cost a lot. The influence of social dynamics, which we will see in a bit, is also very responsible for the differences between group and individual decision making. Then comes the responsibility. In individual decision making, the responsibility falls solely on you. No one else is responsible for your decision, and you have to be accountable for the decision you make, either bad or good. Then, but if you do group decision making, each and every one of the members of the group is responsible for the decision, even if the decision was made by a single person. Then we have the quality of decision. The quality of decision in individual and group decision making can vary greatly. In group decision making, the quality is going to be better, but if the group is biased, it's not going to be. In individual decision making, decisions can be better if you follow these steps correctly, but if you don't or disregard them, then the decision is not going to be good. Then the effects of group dynamics on group decision making. The first thing is groupthink. You might think that all have agreed to this. Why should I stick out? I want, to make the I want to make this decision instead of sticking out uniquely. When you do this, you are you're either doing a very bad decision or doing a very good decision. Instead of that, you can just speak out and do whatever you think. Second thing is social pressure. People might force you into making a decision, but never do that if you are the one making the decision actually. So the next thing is confirmation bias. As we've seen earlier, there are beliefs that support our there are evidence that support our beliefs, and there are our beliefs which are false. We have to choose the evidence that support our beliefs and also consider the evidence that contradicts them. If the whole group is under this confirmation bias, this is not going to be a better decision. The next thing is group polarization. Group polarization means that if your decision is a bad decision, the next time all the, of the group members are going to hinder your decision-making progress. If they say that, the last time you made a bad decision, so why should we allow you to make a good decision this time? Don't agree with them. Don't agree with them, because that might, they might be wrong. You might, be making, you might be making a best decision of your life. Next, we have power dynamics. If there is a group and there is a leader, if the leader says something, the group members have to consider it properly rather than just agreeing to whatever the leader says. If there is no leader, it is very best then. You can just stick out with their own opinions and own opinions and choices. Next, we have group composition. If the group composes of a lot of people, it's going to be diverse and very nice. But if it composes of only three or four people, which is indulged in the, uh, in the group uh, biases and heuristics, we are not going to get better decisions because the decisions are, of course, going to be bad since they are biased against one particular thing. Next, let us see about decision-making in uncertainty. When you are uncertain about what decisions to make, never be afraid or fearful. You, go, you are going to make the best decisions because you are going to follow these things. Gather the information and analyze it. After analyzing it, choose the alternatives as said before. But instead of considering the potential consequences or the pros and cons of each option, you have to assess the risk of each and every option when you are making a decision under uncertainty. Assess the risk of each and every option. If a single option is making a better decision and another option is giving you a false or a riskier option, you are not going to make the decision. Then we have decision-making tools that we have discussed before, like the decision-making frameworks. Use them to make better decisions when you are uncertain about what decision to make. Then seek feedback, as he said before, to gain better understanding of the situation you are in and what you are going to do. Then trust your in instincts. Don't really trust what other people say because they might be lying or be biased. Then there is the expected utility. Expected utility is a formula used to make decisions under uncertainty. Expected utility is the probability of the first outcome into the utility of the first outcome, and so on. So if you're going to buy a car, and the car is good, and the engine is bad, so the good car is the probability is 100%. 100% of 1 is 1. So 1 plus the car is not good. That is, it's bad. The utility of 100% into minus 1. So 1 minus 1, we add it, we get 0. This means that buying each car is a good option. 
but if you get a positive answer, you're going to buy the positive answered car. And if you get a negative answer, you're going to get the negative answered. You're not going to get the negative answered car because it's a loss and you should not make that decision. Next, we have the ethical dilemmas in decision making groups. First is the conflicts of interest. When people have diverse interests, you should not make that you should not be afraid to share your opinion because interests are what make group decision making better. So the next thing is privacy and confidentiality. If you're making a decision but are on the level in which you cannot know certain information, you might tend to make bad decisions. If you are in that situation, just make sure that you're not making the decision or are getting to know the information properly and then you're making the decision because Gathering information is the first part of decision making and you should always know better information than to just assume everything. The third thing is fairness and equity. I said before that leaders are going to give an answer and the group members should oppose it. But in reality, that is never going to happen. If a leader says something, the group members are going to follow it, whatever happens. So the next thing is sustainability and environmental impact. When people are making decisions individually, they don't care about their environment and everything. But in the group decision making, if people are like that, it is going to cause 10 times more harm to the environment than individual group decision making because a lot of people are involved in it. Group decision makers should contain, can understand the sustainability and environmental impacts of their decisions and make proper decisions rather than just dictating something that everyone follows. The fifth thing is the human rights and responsibility. Humans should be responsible for their actions. If people just blame others or for polarize someone, that is not going to be a good decision. They have to consider each and every option and make good decisions, considering the human rights and social responsibility that each and every one citizen of the world has. So the next thing is the cultural differences in decision making. So the first thing is values and norms. Individualism versus collectivism. In the countries like USA, individualism is valued more. That is, a single person makes their own decision. But in countries like China, collectivism is Japan. Countries like Japan, collectivism is more valued. People are going to be gathered in groups to make better decisions rather than an individual person making a decision. So, the second thing is communication styles. In countries like Germany, communication is direct and explicit. Open dialogue is very valued in countries and are followed. If a person has a major issue, he is going to come out with it and say it immediately. But countries like China, open communication is not really valued. Communications are indirect and non-explicit. That is, people are going to indirectly communicate their problems and issues, and that has to be understood by the people who are hearing them. So the next thing is perception of risk. In countries like the USA, Risk taking is associated with getting more profits. But in countries like China, risk taking is associated with getting losses. But we have to consider that our options are what really matters and we should not let groupthink or social pressure affect us. So the next thing is time orientation. In countries like the United States of America, decisions are made based upon the immediate problem that we have on how to solve them. But countries like India, problems are the causes of later decisions. We make decisions to overcome the problems that we might face in the other upcoming futures. Then attitudes towards authority. In China, attitude towards authority is really good because whatever the leader says, the people follow. In countries like Sweden, the collectivism and group, group uh, decision making is followed. Next, let us see about neuroscience and decision making. Neuroscience has really impacted this, is going to impact decision making with Elon Musk and Neuralink. But however, there are other emerging companies which we don't know about. We are going to make better decisions using these, but we have to consider that those decisions will not necessarily be better if we use it for the bad. First thing is neural processes. Our neural processes are really complex. With Neuralink and other technologies breaching the neuroscience, we are going to make better decisions using their neural processes rather than our own. So the second thing is emotions and decision making. We have seen emotions in decision making and they are really affecting our decision making progress. 
But when we are using the neuroscience to make decisions, it is not going to be affected by emotions or biases or heuristics or anything really. They are just going to make objective decisions straight on. So the third thing is neural plasticity. We can customize however we want the type of decision we need to make. It can be in any given situation, but our human brains, we cannot think what decision to make very deep. So the fourth thing is individual differences. Each people might make different decisions, but with neuroscience, everyone might just make the same decision because neuroscience is just a computer. Neuro is just a computer. So a computer makes the same decision in everything. So the fifth thing is clinical applications. Clinical applications are like a doctor performing surgery on his relative. When a doctor is performing a surgery on his relative, he may not be able to perform his best, but with neuroscience and decision making, he can do his best overcoming the relativeness of his friend or family. Next, let us see about decision making and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is really a great thing to use, but with decision making, it has some benefits, but it also has a lot of drawbacks. The first thing is predictive analysis. Artificial intelligence can predict what will happen in the future. Like if you're investing in a stock market, you can ask AI on what will happen when, but it's not very reliable and makes it hard for the users to invest in stock markets. Most users believe, that they believe the AI and invest in stock markets, which might turn out to be a very bad decision. The second thing is customer service. AI can make great customer service because it's not going to be relied on the last call to give to the pre, uh, now call. So for example, let's say there's a customer service huh, who, is, who is receiving a call by you. You're calling him and he's very angry because the previous person he spoke, spoke to was a bad person. But with AI, that's not really going to happen. The emotions will be nothing to AI. Third thing is healthcare. Healthcare is really a great field to explore with AI. When doc doctors suggest medicines that they are familiar with, but if there is a medicine that can cure you instantly, doctors do, if, don't, if doctors don't know about it, they are not going to prescribe it. But with AI, that can greatly change. Fourth is autonomous vehicles. If a person is wantedly performing an accident, that can be affected by uh, autonomous vehicles. So the fifth thing is risk management. As he said before, some people might take risks as losses and some take risks as profits. But with AI, it can actually predict whether if that particular risk is going to be a profit or a loss. So the next thing that we are going to be seeing is the potential impacts of AI in decision making. AI can impact decision making on a whole another level. That is the increased speed and efficiency and the improved accuracy and precision. We are making decisions, but that's taking too long. We end up making hasty decisions, which are very bad for us. But AI can process the information we have to make good decisions. Come on. So the next thing is enhanced objectivity. While we make decisions, we are, going to be object we are not going to be objective to make good decisions. When something comes up while we are making decisions, we are going to divert towards that and complete the decision first, because that's going to be a shorter decision. But with AI, it can complete the first decision, then do the second, and then do the third, if there is one. Then there's greater automation, as we discussed before. The fifth thing is personalization. We can personalize our decisions with AI. We don't just have to challenge the assumptions and do all those hard things. We can we can personalize our things and make better decisions. I conclude by saying that decision making is really a widely known topic. It is used for making a lot of decisions from your home and what the food, what food you eat and to the business deals that are include crores and crores of rupees. As Robert Kiyosaki said, the key to making good decisions is to separate facts from opinions. Thank you. Good evening to everyone present here. I'm Alden of Grade 9B, standing in front of you to give a lecture on the fascinating topic, biology of aging and longevity. So I'm very sure that everyone listening to my lecture today will have a common goal of living longer and also staying younger as we grow old. So in this lecture, I'll be speaking about some biological factors that actually affect aging and also share some tips and techniques for you to implement in your life that can help you to promote healthy and uh, healthy uh, aging. So let's get started. So what is biological aging? 
So biological aging is a growth of cells, tissues, and organs over a period of time. This process can manifest in a variety of ways, such as decline in mental and physical health. So during this process, humans also tend to lose their uh, ability to fight with this disease, which will uh, decrease the Im power of the immune, immune system. Next is, what causes aging? There are two major factors that actually causes aging. They are intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So as the term suggests, intrinsic means uh, the factors that affect us from inside our body. Those are uh, genetics and cellular changes. And extrinsic, as the term says, extrinsic means the factors that actually affect us from outside our body. Those are environmental factors and lifestyle choices, such as poor nutrition, intake of excessive alcohol and tobacco, and not um, taking balanced diet, and having high stress levels. Next is the biological reason for healthy aging, maintenance, maintenance of telomeres. So before knowing how to maintain telomeres, you have to know what is exactly teloma. So teloma is the protective gap in the ends of the chromosomes. As shown in this image, the, at the ends of the chromosomes, there are protective caps. So the work of this teloma is just to protect the DNA strands inside the cr uh, chromosomes from sticking to other teloma or from any cellular damage. So you might wonder, how maintaining the size of this teloma would uh, prevent aging. So this teloma, length of teloma and aging is so uh, connected. It is because um, the size of the teloma actually uh, decides our longevity. So um, the, during every cell division, a small part of this teloma gets uh, divided. So if there is no more teloma to be be divided, the, it will cause cell, eventually cell death. So maintaining this is very important. So the size of this uh, teloma is mostly affected by genetics, and there's uh, another factor that can also contribute to this uh, teloma shortening process. Next is maintenance of mitochondrial function. So mitochondria is organelles within the cells that provides energy to our cells. So this is also called as power house of cells. So as we age, what happens is our cells become lazy and making us also lazy. And the work did by our um, cells decreases and it would cause cellular aging. Next is maintenance of immune system. So as we age, we lose, our immune system lose the ability to fight against the diseases, viruses, and uh, infections. So we can only maintain the immune system by by uh, taking a balanced diet, maintaining good cardiovascular health, doing regular exercise, and also stop intake of excessive alcohol, tobacco, or stop smoking. Next is maintenance of brain health. So you might have noticed that your grandparents would not be able to recollect or remember or learn new things very quickly. So this is the normal stage of our aging. So what happens in this uh, process is our brain cannot memorize, lose the ability to memorize or uh, recap the things that we already did. So maintain, only way of maintaining this um, brain health is by uh, reading books, solving um, puzzles, and doing, is increasing our social connections. Next is oxidative stress. So what is oxidative stress? So oxidative stress is caused by reactive oxygen species, which, which is called as ROS level in our body. So ROS, that is reactive oxygen species, is, uh, is uh, increased by the natural by-process of our cellular changes. So if there the oxidative level stress increases, it, and the ROS level increases, it would cause cellular damage and would also damage the tissues and organs in our body. Next is inflammation. So what is inflammation? So inflammation is the ability of our immune system to 
um, respond to any infections, bacteria, or viruses. So as we age, our immune system loses the ability to react to these such uh, bacteria infections and uh, infections. So this process is called inflammaging. When the immune system loses ability to do its fun function, its work, we call, we term this as inflammaging. So this process is a common part in our, as our aging process and maintaining a good balanced diet and being physically active can help you to maintain the inflammation level. Next is cellular aging. So cellular aging is caused by the accumulation of damaged cells to our tissues organs over a period of time. Next is DNA damage. DNA damage occurs when the size of the teloma is decreased as a natural byproduct of a life. Next is hormonal changes. So hormonal changes is a natural thing that occurs in every living being on this earth. So during this process, um, women undergo menopause and uh, boys, uh, in boys, the level of testosterone segregated in them decreases. Next is age-related diseases. So as I said before, during the aging process, our uh, immune system gets very weak and starts to function inappropriately. So this can cause to the development of age-related diseases. Next is eff effects of aging. Skin changes. You might have noticed that uh, your grandparents would have a skin like it's very dry and will be shrinkled, and also the elasticity of their skin will be reduced. This occurs because our, um, as we age, our skin loses it, its elasticity and also decrease the level of elastin in our skins. Next is muscle loss and weakness. So muscle loss and weakness is a natural byproduct of a bold aging process and maintaining our physical health and uh, doing reg exercise regularly can help you to maintain this. So as we age, our muscle mass get decreased and making us very weaker. Next is bone density reduction. So bone density reduction occurs as we age because the minerals and vitamins that are actually present in our bones decreases. For example, calcium. So as we age, we can, we'll be easy susceptible to easy fracture or any bone related diseases. Next is decline in vision and hearing. So decline in vision and hearing, it is a common thing in our aging process. So you might have seen grandparents wearing the machines in their ears or wearing specs. This is because as they uh, get older, they lose their ability to hear things or see things. Next is cognitive decline. As I said before, cognitive decline can be maintained by um, reading books, solving puzzles, and increasing your social connections. Weakened immune system. As I said before, as we age, our body undergoes several changes, and it could also cause weakened immune system and changes in hormonal levels. Slowed metabolism. So metabolism is the ability to burn calories. So if, the, uh, if a men have higher metabolism, it would cause, uh, if e even, if even they eat like um, 200 calories per day, the, it will be burned in like without doing, doing anything. But if the men has lower metabolism, even if they eat like 50 calories per day, they will not be able to burn them even after like heavy workouts. So as we age, our body undergoes slower metabolism and it would cause increase gaining in weight and decrease our mobility and balance and also reduce our muscle mass. And this can contribute to um, weakness and muscle loss, slower wound healing. So as I said before, immune system cannot work as efficiently as we age. So this can lead to slower he wound healing. What is stress? And so stress is actually good to our health. So you might be like wondering, how can stress be uh, like healthy to our life? 
I'll say that. So stress is a natural response from our body that that uh, promotes or that is in which our hormones levels increases, making us to fight or flee from the situation. So this mechanism is also called flight or flee mechanism. So for you to understand this concept better, I'll say a story. Now we are uh, take taken your motorcycle to the grocery and you have bought the groceries and you are returning to your home. That time you find a strange car just following you. At this point of time, uh, you have to check whether they are actually following you. you then to check them, you have like um, circling the same spots that you have did already. Then after confirming that they are actually following you, you would just rather stop your motorbike and fight against them or else drive your, uh, drive your motorcycle quickly to the police station. So this is what we call flight or flee mechanism. So as I said, uh, stress is good, but anything more than the uh, limit is very bad for health. So having a lot of stresses in ourselves would cause mental and physical issues. So a lot of stress can also lead to depression. There are three types of stress. They are acute stress, episodic acute stress, and chronic stress. So acute stress is a stress that we normally face in our works. So episodic acute stress is a, a stress that we feel, a face every day for like a month or a week. Next is chronic stress. So chronic stress is very deadly and would cause lead to uh, in the growth of age-related diseases. So what is chronic stress? Chronic stress is caused when we face a stress for more than a year or um, six months. So this chronic stress is mostly caused by the death of someone who you actually love or any other personal issues. Next is cellular and molecular mechanism that drive aging. So as I said before, Teloma are the protective caps at the end of the chromosomes that protect the DNA material inside. So external factors can also contribute to, to the um, re size reduction process of teloma. So external factors would include poor nutrition, intake of excessive alcohol, poor, poor, poor new diet, and lack of exercises, and chronic stress. So lifestyle choices, however, can actually help you to slow down the uh, size decreasing process. So theories about biological and healthy aging. So programmed aging theory. So this theory suggests that aging is only caused and is by genetically programmed. And there's nothing to uh, with uh, other factors, external factors, to con which contribute to the aging process. Next is free radical theory. So this theory suggests that damage, damage is caused due to the cells and tissues. Immunological theory says that uh, aging is only caused due to decline in immune power as we age. Next is hormonal theory. So this theory says that aging is only caused by changes in hormonal levels as we age. Next is VA and the theory. So this theory says that aging is only caused due to the accumulation of cells, tissues, and organs over a period of time. Next is indicators of healthy aging, physical health. So physical health is very important indicator of healthy aging, and the indicators of healthy aging include maintaining healthy weight, being physically active, maintaining a good cardiovascular health, cognitive health. So cognitive health is the ability to remember things, learn new things, and uh, also share the things that we uh, think in our mind. So as we age, the ability to, to do these things actually decreases. So you can maintain this by reading books regularly and also solving some puzzles and learning new things every day. Next is social health. So social health is the ability to socialize with our surroundings and uh, maintaining strong social connections. Next is emotional health. So emotional health is the ability to cope with stress and depression and overcome the hard circumstances that we face in our life. 
Next is nutrition health. Nutrition health is the ability of uh, the intake of healthy, balanced diet. Best practices for healthy aging. So exercise regularly. So nowadays, even children have their own personal mobile phone and they are not uh, motivated to go and play out. Instead, they just play online games in their phones. So you can just um, uh, play outdoor games to just exercise regularly. Playing outdoor games can also be an uh, exercise to the kids. Eat a balanced diet. So eating a balanced diet is very important to uh, help promote healthy aging and also promote longevity. Stay socially connected. So sharing the things that we uh, think as we age is very important. So if you are like uh, going through a hard circumstances, we can share a ex experience with the elder people and get advices from them. So if you don't do that, you will not be able to get the uh, advice from the elder people and will not be able to overcome the hard circumstances very quickly. Next is get enough sleep. Getting enough sleep is very, very important. And when we sleep, our muscle mass and our muscle restores, which is if they are very damaged, the cells, the immune system just uh, restores the, their muscles. So, and also sleeping for more than nine hours will keep our skin fresh and also uh, reduce our uh, aging. Next is manage stress. So managing stress is very, very important as we old, get old. As I said before, if you have a lot of stresses around us, it would cause mental and uh, physical health, uh, physical issues. Manage stress. So we can manage stress by doing the things that we actually love. So for example, you can like go for a walk when you're stressed, or you can read the books, or just take a nap. So doing the things may, and managing stress is, will promote longevity and also um, keep you healthy. Stay mentally active. So most grandparents, and as we age, we become very lazy and our brain cognitive function declines. So may, staying mentally active is very, very important to promote healthy aging and longevity. Avoid smoking and excessive alcohol consumption. So excessive alcohol consumption and smoking would cause cellular damage and also uh, will, will help to the age development of age-related disease. So you have to try to decrease the consumption of excessive alcohol or, uh, or uh, smoking. Next is stay mentally active and also avoid smoking, excess alcohol and consumption. So, what is longevity then? So longevity is a total lifespan of a species in this earth. So the longevity can be affected by two major factors. They are uh, external and lifestyle choices, such as exposure to radiation, UV radiation, and a poor nutrition and intake of excessive alcohol. Tips for longevity. Exercise regularly. So, tip, uh, Longevity and aging is so closely connected, and if you follow the tips that I've said in the aging, it would be easily, it will also promote the longevity. So exercise regularly, eat a balanced diet, get enough sleep, manage stress, maintain strong social connections, avoid smoking and excessive alcohol consumption, and also stay up to date on health screen, screening checkups. So this is because so if you find a disease in the early stage, you would, would easily figure the, th the problem in your body and also your doctors will be able to be easily able to cure the disease. On the other hand, if you just don't do the uh, regular health screening and checkups, the, if you have a disease, it would just cause, um, it will decrease the chance of you being recured. Drink plenty of water. So drinking plenty of water is very important and it would co not drinking enough water would keep you lazy and cause dehydration and would co cause some physical issues. Keep a positive outlook. 
so lot of people and the uh, the higher position pe people in the positions have all, the motive of always seeing a circum hard circumstances in a positive look so seeing a thing with a positive look would help you to be motivated and also resolve and overcome the circumstance next is ikigai so ikigai is a japanese term of that uh, translates to a reason for being so ikigai is found when you find your passion mission vocation and profession and what you love what the world needs what you're good at and what you can be actually paid for which is your job so finding these all these things that that can help you to find ikigai will actually keep you rich and happy for your whole life span so so ikigai is actually more concentrated in ja japan so because ja find the japanese people think that finding their ikigai is a religious part of their life so the japanese people actually have a, a long, uh, the higher life expectancy in the entire world that is 83.7 years per, pe uh, per men so this is because finding the ikigai will keep them happy and the being happy would reduce the stress and the red stre uh, reduced in stress levels will increase and promote uh, longevity so so i would like to conclude that there are a lot of theory that actually attempt to uh, explain this uh, complex process but there is no theory that actually uh, explains this process, complex process easily thank you Hello ladies and gentlemen boys and girls I am Balamurgan of grade 9b and I am here to give a lecture about the topic the role of women in Indian history Let us begin our session with a great quote said by Dr Terai Trent The silencing of one woman is the silencing of all women the awakening of one woman is the awakening of the whole world This was a great quote said by Dr Terai Trent and must be followed by each and every citizen of our country for not only the development of our country and also for the society and the community now let us delve into our session women a five letter word is not only just meant for the fulfillment of all the domestic activities present in our home such as cooking dishes washing clothes washing utensils and other household activities including purchasing grocery items gardening and many more they are also meant to stand independently and work for our country's economical development The statement states that they are not only meant for the fulfillment of all the domestic and household activities present in our home. They also have a capability of going out, earning money, standing independently on their own leg and contributing a larger part of contribution to our country's economical development. Now I'm going to share you one of the speciality of women. The one speciality of women is that they can all do a special task. That is nothing but multitasking. multitasking means performing various tasks at the same time the great and the best example is your mom in your home she will be the first person to wake up and her work starts there from preparing coffee breakfast lunch dinner and so on her work is unstoppable and cannot be stopped if it can be stopped it will affect our day to day activities many experiments have been done on multitasking finally the resu results of the experiments tells us that Multitasking to con its reaction time and task accuracy in both men and women equally. There is no any difference between men and women in the reaction time and the task accuracy on multitasking. Now I'm going to share you a real life experience. I had heard a lot of motivational speeches given by most of the individuals. They all will be telling that we are giving freedom to women in our home. First, we all have to understand one thing. We all have to understand the difference between dignity and freedom. dignity means self respect whereas freedom is not a feeling that can be given from one person to another freedom is our birth right if we are not found with freedom or if someone is hesitating to provide us freedom we all must come forward speak up and also regain our fundamental and birth right that is right to freedom it is a solemn duty as a citizen of our country to do this next women are a gift to society during the ancient period women played a significant role The Rigvedic women enjoyed a high status in the society. Their condition was very good. There was no sati system or early marriage. 
but there was one condition where the upper caste ladies have to accept the evil called parda. I'll be explaining you the meaning of parda in the upcoming words. During that period, men were polygamous and widow burning was an accepted norm. Artha Shastra imposed more stigmas on women, while Kautilya dynasty dismissed women's liberation, that is, women's freedom. They were not even free to go elsewhere without their husband's permission. The condition became worse off during the Gupta period. The Smriti Shastras abused them. Manu dictated a woman would be dependent on her father during childhood, on her husband after marriage, and on her son when she becomes old. This was a lifetime schedule which was given to women present in the ancient society. Moving on to the growth of women's rights. Women's rights are multicultural and diasporic. The struggles of women from different geographies are dissimilar and are conditioned by several factors such as familial, social, racial, marital, economical, religious and individual consciousness. Indian women negotiate survival through an oppressive societal structures. Patriarchy and misogyny, that is power and discrimination, are deeply rooted in the ancient Egyptian minds. Examples of power attributes, that is patri patriarchal attributes, are age, ordinal status, relationship to men through the family of origin, marriage and procreation, and the patriarchal attributes. Some of the examples of patriarchal attributes also include the dowry, siring sense, caste, color, kinship, creed, community, the state and the gender. Despite the challenges, India has a long tradition of women who rebelled against this conformism and are severe societal pressures. The history of women can be divided into three phases. The first phase, second phase and the third phase. The first phase was initiated when reformists came forward and started to speak in favor of women by making reforms in education and in other places where women were involved. The second phase which was initiated when Mahatma Gandhi incorporated women's movements into Quit India movement and many women organizations came forward and started to speak in favor of women. The third phase which was only focused on fair treatment of women at home after marriage that is in, in their in-laws house and also in the workplaces and the right to political party. This included the legal and political rights like the right to vote, the right to participate in Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha elections. Despite the barriers, many barriers still inhibit women from fully taking advantage of their rights and opportunities in India. Religious laws and expectations, personal laws enumerated by each and every religion, often conflict with the Indian constitution, eliminating rights and powers that women should legally have. Even though there is a lot of work to be done, the movement to secure women's rights has come a long way. Now, I'm going to share you the important acts and the important leaders present in each of the phases very deeply. Let us start with the first phase, which was initiated from the years 1825 to 1915. The first phase was initiated by men to uproot the social evils such as sati, jwar, no education for women, no access to widow remarriage and child marriage. But in addition to this, upper caste Hindu women rejected the constraints and the restrictions that they faced under the Brahmanical traditions. Apart from this, we also have several Indian states which was ruled by many extraordinarily brave women, such as, for example, we can take Jansi, which was ruled by Rani Lakshmi Bai, Kittur ruled by Kittur Chennamma, and Punjab by Jindkar, and Bhopal by Kudisa Begum. This phase also includes many women and men reformers too. Examples of men social reformers are Raja Ram Mohan Jai, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, Jyoti Ra Fule, and many more men who fought for the betterment of women. Raja Ram Mohan Jai's efforts led to the abolition of Sati under William, uh, Governor General William Cavendish Bentick in 1829. Pyari Charan Sarkar, a former student of Hindu college and a young member of Young Bengal, set up the first free school for girls and in 1847 in Barasit in Kolkata, and later the school was renamed as Kalikrishna Girls High School. In 1848, Savitri Bai Fule, along with her husband Jyotira Fule, set up the school for girls, and Savitri Bai Fule became the first women teacher in India. Missionaries' wives, such as Martha Mount Nemi and his daughter, Eliza Caldwell Nemol, are being remembered for pioneering the education and training of girls in southern India. The Female Infanticide Prevention Act of 1876, also known as the Act 8 of 1870, 
was a legislative act passed by the British government to prevent the murder of female infants. Ishwara Chandra Vidyasagar's crusade led to the betterment of the lives of women, particularly the widows' lives, and which led to the Widow Remarriage Act of 1856, and many women reformers such as Pandita Ramabai also participated and helped the cause of women. In 1879, John Eliot Drinkwater Bethune established the first school for girls in 1849 and which was later developed into women's college in 1879. Thus, it became the first women's college in India. In 1883, Chandra Basu and Kadamini Ganguly were the first female graduates of British Empire. We have Chandra Mughi Ganguly and we also have Anandi Gopal Joshi, who were the first women to be trained in the Western medicine in 1886. Now, let us see the famous leaders and acts of the second phase. That is from 1915 till India's 1947 independence. The first women's university, that is SNDT Women's University, was founded on June 2, 1916, by a social reformer, Dando Keshav Karve, with just five students. In 1917, the first women's delegation met the Secretary of the State, demanding women's legal and political rights with the support of INC, that is Indian National Congress. Annie Besant became the first president of the Indian National Congress. She became the first female president of the Indian National Congress. And in 1925, Sarojini Naidu became the first Indian-born female president of the Indian National Congress. The in All India Women's Conference was founded in 1927, and child marriage was outlawed in 1929, and the legal age to marry for girls was set at 14 years. In 1944, Asima Chatterjee became the first woman to be conferred the Doctorate of Science by an Indian university. On August 15, 1947, following India's 1947 independence, Sarojini Naidu became the first governor of United Provinces, nowadays known as Uttar Pradesh, and she became the first women governor of India. Feminist agendas and movements became less active right after 1947 independence of our nation. As nationalist agendas and movements uh, led to the presence over many feminist issues. These movements also resisted many colonial interventions where there was a national form of resistance to any colonial efforts made to modernize the Hindu family. This also included the age of consent controversy that erupted after the British tried to raise the legal age of marriage for girls to prevent minors from forced marriages and sexual acts. The third phase, that is post-1947. The Immoral Traffic Prevention Act of 1856 was a legislative act passed by the Indian government to prevent the trafficking of young girls and women. India passed the Dowry Prohibition Act, which prohibits dowry demands in marriage arrangements illegal. In 1961, Indira Gandhi became the first Women Prime Minister of India, and she served as Women Prime Minister of India for three consecutive terms, that is from 1966 to 1977, and from 1980, until she was assassinated in the year 1984. And we have the Indian Armed Forces began recruiting women for non-medical positions in 1992. Also, the legal age of marriage for girls was raised from 14 years to 18 years by amending the Sharda Act of 1929. The Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act 2005 was brought into force by our Indian government on October 26, 2006. The act for the first time classifies the definition of domestic violence being broadly that this not only includes the type of violence as physical, also includes other forms of violence such as sexual, economical, and social relationships too. And next, we also have the Criminal Amendment Act 19, uh, 2013, also known as the Act of 2013, which was brought into force during the year, uh, month of December 2013 and which introduced new sections to the society also, which also making an sexual harassment and expressed offense under section 354A, which is punishable by up to three years of imprisonment or rupees one lakh fine. As I have told, this act also has also brought new sections to the society, such as disrobing a woman without consent and stalking and harassing any woman in any other forms illegal. And also, we have the Sexual Harassment at Workplace, Prohibition Prevention and Redressal Act, which was brought into the month December and the year 2013, which prohibits sexual harassment at workplaces illegal. 
and in 2015, Indian government has announced that women could serve as fighter pilots in IAF, the Indian Air Force Academy. And also, we have in uh, 2020, the Supreme Court has passed the act that women could also get the positions of commanding officers with power at male officers. Now, let us delve into the next topic. What is women's empowerment? Women's empowerment means they have to know their legal and political rights like the right to vote, freedom of movement, property rights, and many more rights. Empowering women is making them realize their self-worth, determine their abilities to determine their own choice, and shape the society according to themselves, where they can enjoy just, uh, rights and opportunities just like other humans used to. During the ancient period, women will not have share in their own parents' properties. At that time, parents felt ashamed of giving birth to young girl child too. Nowadays, women's empowerment means exercising their powers and actions, means con having control over their material assets, intellectual resources, and other ideologies. In ancient Indian culture, women has got to live an equal life just like men used to. They did not being discriminated uh, based on gender, and even instead they have honored by the society. Women in the Indian history has gone through two things, that is subjection and deliverance. And also, there came a time when all the women had to adopt a parda call, uh, evil called parda. As I told you, I will be explaining the meaning of parda. Now it's the time for that. Parda is an evil that covered the body of women in which affected their freedom. This also gave birth to many other social evils such as sati, jor, no education for women, child marriage, and no access to widow remarriage, and many more. These many uh, harassment cases made women's lives more difficult. Now, let us see each of the restrictions deeply. The first, sati. The concept of sati is very simple, but very rude. When a woman's husband dies, the woman has to sit on the burning fire and burn herself to death. It was a solemn duty as a wife to her husband, and in Hindu old manuscripts, it was mentioned that when a woman dies as sati, the doors of heaven open up for her. What is jor? In today's world, if we try to understand what is jor is, it's nothing but a mass suicide. But during the ancient period, it was a Rajput custom, where the Rajput women has to sacrifice their lives for their husbands who were about to lose the battle. Now, let us discuss about the child marriage. Medieval period was famous for many other factors, but the one of them and the one of the famous one was child marriage. Treating women as a marriage material was common during the medieval period. At that time, parents felt ashamed of giving birth to a young girl child. So, parents thought to marry them as soon as possible. And, uh, and another reason for child marriage is that grown-up girls are more likely to commit scandals so that the, par the parents tie the knot at a very tender age, and the girls will be staying in their parents' home, and they'll be moving out when they hit puberty. During the ancient period, women were taught nothing more than a marriage material. And this was also a, led to the increase in high mortality rates in both women's and babies too, and women suffered from very poor health care. Next, let us talk about no access to widow remarriage. As I have told, treating women as a marriage material and a common material was very common during that period. Widows are a person who lost their husbands. They are the women. Treating widows as a person who are not in this society is, not, is very bad. So during the ancient period and the medieval period, women, uh, widows were considered cursed. And she, they inflicts depredation and brings ill luck. So that widows were not allowed in any holy, sacred, or rituals or places. They were not allowed to remarry, or they will have no peaceful life because the decision-making decision process will not be given to them. Their relatives and their friends will be making decision and the result will be provided to them. And the widows have to wear the faded white cloths and must eat the food which every widow will be having when they become widows. Next, let us talk about no education for women. There is evidence available that in the past, women had education and access to education. But the situation changed later after the Vedic period because the dimension of the education changed. In the Muslim religion, the classes were given in fine art. And also, yet, the suffering of women never gets easier during this period. Talking about the fight for women's empowerment in modern period, during the ancient period, women 
cannot come out and they could not speak forward if any issue arises without fear. But nowadays, since the society has evolved and the world has evolved, now women can fight for their rights. But there are still a particular group of women who cannot speak and they are still being treated as slaves. Several names come, came up during the colonial period during the fight for modern empowerment, modern women's empowerment. We have such, the famous women such as Azizun Bayal, Uda Devi, Rani Lakshmi Bai of Jhansi, and the most famous one is Begum Hazrat Mahal. And general, generally, the fight for women's empowerment grew stronger. Many men reformers such as Raja Ram Mohan Rai, Ishwara Chandra Vidya Sagar, Swami Vegananda, Swami Dayananda Saraswati fought for the betterment and the development of women's lives, which also they helped regain their lost and previous status in the society. Next, talking about the emancipation, the demand. The demand for women's empowerment makes it clear that every human being must be treated in a way where their dignity and rights are not being violated. For a long millennium, women suffered from this harassment, like the dowry-related harassments too. During that period, young girls are not neglected and are not encouraged for their personal growth too. And we all must realize and we all must support girl education and women education so that they can carry on the legacy to the upcoming generations, which uh, helps in building a good nation. And since women suffered from many harassments, our work and to live in a civilized world, we all have to take them out of any dogmatic state of mentality and which prohibits nation from building. Since women may suffered from many harassments, they are still being continued, but the movement to secure them has come a long way. Next, talking about the general position of in ancient India was unique. They were an unlearned and ought to be learned daughter ought to be married to a learned bridegroom. So early marriage was not in walk those days. Those days, women were allowed to choose their husband's lifestyle and job and so on. But the dimension changed later during the Vedic period. From that, women did not get any rights to even choose their husband's lifestyle and job, and so on. Next, we also have many uh, so, uh, great women, uh, men reformers too, such as he's Raja Ram Mohan Rai and he, she, Iswara Chandra Vidya Sagar, Swami Vivekananda and Swami Dayananda Saraswati, who fought for the betterment and the development of women in our society. Now, let us talk about the two important movements which helped women regain their lost status in society. The first movement, feminist movement. Feminist movement was only focused on regaining the lost rights and of the women in the present in the society. The most common factors of these movements are gender equality and challenging patriarchy, that is challenging powers and social transformation of women from ancient period, medieval period and the modern period. The person or the people or the social reformers who participated in this are called as feminists. Talking about the suffrage movement, suffrage movement was also a movement which focused on regaining the legal and political rights of women in India. The person, social reformers and people who participated in this type of movement are known as suffragists. And in these movements, we have the important factors such as they have ignored the demands and limited progresses. And here, the Government of India Act 1909 is majorly highlighted due to some things present in that movement. Provincial Council's authority in voting rights was a major factor which was played by many of the social reformers present in these movements. Next, I have included this slide for telling you that women's rights are human rights. Every human being must be treated in a way where their dignity and rights are not being violated. So we all must consider women's rights as our rights and we all must protest for it if you are not found with it. Now let us see some of the challenges faced by women. In a country with the largest democracy, where goddesses are hailed and worshipped, one might think that women too were treated in the same way with respect. But the reality is far from that. Women are suffering from many harassments, such as the dowry-related harassments and marriage arrangements and many more. But during this period, men must realize that patriarchy and ego that does not go good for women and is not helping them either. Women face problems without complaining. So there should be somewhat a collective effort done by everyone to support them and enlighten their lives and come out of any dogmatic state of mentality. 
During that period, women are being starred for even their choice of clothes, behavior, and so on. And the women were expected to be caretakers, good wives, moms, daughter-in-laws, and daughters in the homes. It is so sad to see that inhuman and machine-level expertise is expected from each and every woman, but they are not happy with that. They are being ill-treated on roads, on public transports, even with their personal relationships at home. Since uh, the harassments also include many other forms of harassments too. Since the young girls uh, are neglected and are not encouraged for their self-growth and even for their personal growth too. So when girls from such toxic environments grow up, they tolerate domestic violence and marital rape, which, in, which is, becomes involved in domestic life. And also, as to live in a civilized world, it is a solemn duty as human beings to bring them out of any dogmatic state and to get rid of it. Next, talking about uh, the issues and problems faced by them, women face issues and problems in every sphere of life for them. It cannot be stopped, and it could not be stopped. If it can be stopped, we all must join together and work for it. Everything can be done together, but to do it, we all must step together. We all must see women in powerful positions, such as in government offices and also in the corporate world. And next, here we have an important question. Is suicide a correct decision? I'm asking this question to you. Is suicide a correct decision? Suicide is not a correct decision. Throwing out every problem on others' head and going on to the way of death is a sign of cowardice. We all must not do this. We all must come forward and speak for any issues without fear. Our words may change the whole situation that we are facing. So, from this second, we all must come forward and speak if any issue arises without fear. Now, let us see some of the laws governing women's rights. We have the Hindu Widow Remarriage Act of 1856, the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929, and the Hindu Women's Rights to Property Act of 1937, and the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955. Nowadays, there are also many acts which are governing women's rights. We have the Hindu Succession Amendment Act, which considers women as co partners and the Immoral Traffic Prevention Act. And if any person traffic young girls and women, they will be arrested and they will be put in the prison for up to three years or rupees, with rupees one lakh fine. We also have the Dowry Prohibition Act and many more famous and legal acts too. Now, let us see some of uh, the recap for the women's condition in the ancient period. They were second-class citizens, they were judged by their appearance and not by their talent, and the marginalization of women. Marginalization is a process of concerning a group of people and not allowing them to have their own identity. We all must change our minds. We all must teach our young generations that sports are not only for men and dance is not only for women. Everything is for everyone. Nothing should be separated from anyone. We all must give them a proper place to showcase their talents. So we will get, we will get a good result by doing this. Now, we have in, arrived to an interesting part of our session. We all know that men are physically, socially, economically very strong than women. But this statement proves that they are not like that. A normal human can bear the pain of 45 del unit. But when a woman, she's suffering from the labor pain and she's on the way to give birth to a young child, she's suffering from the pain of 57 del unit, which is a pain that occurs when 20 bones start to get fractured simultaneously. So this statement proves that women are physically, socially, economically very strong. Now let us see some of the women's achievements in Indian history. Women's achievements in Indian history has, they have left an indelible contributions to our Indian history and are, they are still being continued to inspire the young generations by their courage, intelligence, perseverance, reverence, ambition and love. The purpose of celebrating Women's Day is not superficial. It is a day to celebrate the women present in our lives and to respect their sacrifices, determination, perseverance, reverence, ambition and love. So, let us celebrate this day every day by respecting women. Now, let us see some of the important women in our uh, Indian history. We have Sarojini Naidu, a social activist, poet, and also a supporter of Indian independence. She was denoted by the name, the Nightingale of India. We have Mother Teresa. She was 
born in Mac uh, Scotch, Macedonia, and she became a nun at the age of 18. Next, we have Veera Mangai Velunachiyar. She was one of the queens of the 18th century, and she fought for our Indians' independence, and she could not win the battle of independence with the British. Next, we have Bachendri Pal, a great mountainer who reached the summit of Mount Everest. And she was born on May 24, 1954 in Nakuri in India. Pal was one of the seven children of a rural working class family which was located in Uttarakhand. Indra Gandhi, her father name is Jawaharlal Nehru and she carried on, on her legacy of her father to her generation and she became the first women prime minister of India. And the history and achievements of women does not end here. There are many women who achieved a lot of things in their lives. Now, let us see some of the factors of freedom. Trailblazing icons. Here, trailblazing denotes that if, let us take an example, if a competition is being conducted in your school, and the mentality and the eagerness to go and give your name first is main, meant by the trailblazing icons. And courage in action. Courage means braveness. So women are very strong in brave and strong and brave too in their actions too. Inspiring leadership. The leadership quality is presented in higher amount in women. Empowering generations. They are still being inspiring many more generations and they will be continued to be inspiring them. Advocating for justice. Justice delayed is justice denied is a proverb. So women are being uh, protesting for their justice if something is not provided for them. Inspiration for today. Nowadays, the great inspiration for us and even for me is the women present in my lives. And the strong women and the brave women does not end till here. The real heroines of your lives are none other than your mom, good wives, daughters, and daughter-in-laws and sisters. They are the real pillars of your life. Without them, we cannot do anything. Since we have reached the conclusion of our session, let us conclude our session with a great proverb. An idea built the wall of separation between the sexes. An idea will crumble into dust. This was a great proverb said by Sarak More Grimke. And I hope you all will respect women and support them in any kind of situation too. I hope you all will do this and let us dive into the session of Oath of Thanks. I thank my school management for providing this wonderful opportunity to showcase my talents before you. I thank my teachers and parents for supporting me throughout my lecture journey and I thank my friends for helping me in the school works and I thank all of my audience who supported me and who gave your patience to me. Thank you and all present here. Have a great day. Hello ladies and gentlemen. I am Divesh of Grade 9B. Today, I will be giving Thank the you. lecture on the topic Space Race, Past, Present and Future. After the devastating World War II drew to close at the mid-20th century, a new conflict began to arise within the superpowers, which is known as the Cold War. This war pitted the world to greater powers, the democratic capitalists, United States of America and North America, and the Communist Soviet Union, at present Russia against each other. At the beginning of the late 1950s, space became another dramatic arena for its competition as each side sought to prove its superiority of its technology. Space Race was a series of competition and technological demonstration between the United States of America and the Soviet Union in the past. At present, many countries like India, China, France, Italy, Germany, UK are participating in it. And also, private companies like SpaceX, Blue Origin are also in it. Next, NASA is created. On 1958, United States of America launches a satellite, Explorer 1 to space, which was designed by the, designed by the US Army under the direction of a rocket scientist named Winner Van Brown. At the same year, President Dwight D. Schoenhofer the then President of United States of America signed a public order creating NASA. It's a federal agency dedicated to space exploration itself. Next, Dwight D. Schoenhofer also created a security for USA. NASA's abbreviation is National Aeronautic and Space Administration. Soviet Union Sputnik 1 and 2. Soviet Union Sputnik was the first spacecraft to visit space and the first country to launch a spacecraft. A month later, they launched Sputnik 2, which carried a dog named Laika, 
making the Soviets first to send a living creature to space itself. This was a victory for the Soviet Union over the United States of America. Their spacecraft had made a, had made a number of failed attempts. Response by the USA. In, when a Sputnik launches, there is public panic in the United States of America. President Dwight D. Schoenhofer, the then President of the United States of America, does not see it as an external threat, though. After the launch of Sputnik, a new private company started to emerge. And in 1957, Soviet Union first attempted a satellite named Vanguard TV-3. When it was launched, it was immediately crashed back into its launch pad, making the Soviets making the Soviets a clear victory, though. The first man on space. The first man on space was Yuri Gagarin. This is a photo of Yuri Gagarin. Let's talk about it in detail. He was, Yuri Gagarin went to space on April 12, 1961, and became the first man on space. He, he, he orbited the Earth 108 minutes a single time. When he came back to Soviet Union, he was as, treated as a celebrity. But he died, sadly, died on March 27, 1968, during a routine, routine flight accident. Came to the moon. September, on, September, on September 12, 1962, President Kennedy delivered a speech at the Rice University Stadium, providing the clear goals for Americans to win the space race by launching the Apollo 11 program. But the Soviet Union thought it as a dog, though. But Apollo 11 was launched successfully on July 16 on the Cape Kennedy Space Center. Four days later, at 10 20, on July 20, 1969, and 10.56 p.m., Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. This was a clear victory for the United States of America over the Soviet Union. Those own lunar projects has made a number of failed attempts. Between 1963 and 1965, 11 rockets has been failed, carrying small cushions or small airbags. Everything was unsuccessful. After the launch of Apollo 11, the space race that to the past space race was coming to an end, and the new old fist had happened. This is a photo of Venara 8 when it was launched. It was a Soviet probe, though. It is in Venus. This is an artificial photo of it. Let's, lead, let's talk about it in detail. Venara 8 was the Soviet Union first interplanetary flyby to Venus. It was launched on 22 July 1972. The probe operated a full 15 minutes, sending back about the data of the amount of light reaching the surface and confirm the pressure data and the amount of light and the temperature, too. And the U.S. achieved the first Mariner 2, the first interplanetary flyby made by any spacecraft in Earth. The spacecraft was the first spacecraft to visit any planet beyond Earth. And it also changed how we could see our Earth closest neighbor as a runway hot house or a hot ball of fire. Before the launch of Mariner 2 and Apollo 11, on Mariner 2 and Mar on Venera 8, many person thought that Venus could contain life in it, but it was a false message. Who won the space race? The space race was won by the United States of America due to the Apollo program. As, as this, what about the Cold War I discussed a little before? Cold War was coming to an end, so both the countries was coming to a peace relationship, due to which they constructed the International Space Station in 1998. But the space station was not constructed by these two countries. Also, the Japan Space Agency, NEXA, and the, Canadian, and, and the Canadian Space Agency, along with the European Space Agency, was constructing it. And as a symbol of relationship, both the countries, United States of America and the Soviet Union, launched the Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975. And also, many countries launched their spacecraft by now. Japan and China in 1970, France in 1965, and Canada in 1962. This is a photo of the International Space Station. 
hair has solar panels to get energy from the sun and become sustainable. And also, agriculture could happen inside an indoor warm house due to which they, they constructed this. Also, Mars could attain this soon, soon after it. Now let's talk about the present space race. Test space race is going on now. Yes, space race is going on from the United States and the Soviet Union race from 1960s. But it's not between a couple of countries. It's between many countries and many competitors. It's between the fast going economies of China, India, Japan, UK, France, Italy, and also the previous USA and Soviet Union, along with SpaceX and Blue Origin. India and Space Race. One of the boosters available from a country is PSLV. P there was two missions to moon by PSLV, Chandrayaan 1 and Chandrayaan 2. Chandrayaan 2 was launched in September 2019 and landed there in, sep in September 2019, but it was a failure due to a technical issue. Additionally, there have been of two people of Indian origin to go to space. Ibe Rakesh Sharma, who flew on Solu 7 space station as a part of Soviet intercommerce program. And they were Kalpana Chavla, who died with her crew in 2003, when she was re-entry into her Earth atmosphere, her, co her ship Columbia broke upon into re-entry into Earth atmosphere. India is also creating its space station, Gangayan, that is expected to launch in late 2023 or the nearing 2024. Also, it has made a record of carrying, uh, of carrying 73 satellites in a single rocket to space. The last rocket, the last world record was done by the Soviet Union, carrying just 33 satellites in a rocket. Also, the Mangalyan program to go to moon was also a significant thing, and it was a first, it was a first spacecraft by ISRO, a in, new interplanetary fly by, by ISRO. Japan in space race. Japanese rockets has not only delivered spacecraft to the inter, spacecraft to orbit, but KTB cargo spacecraft for the International Space Station. Japan is the current partner of the International Space Station. It has sent several astronauts in space station and space shuttles. An interesting news is German. In an interesting news is Japanese journalist Akima Tohorio flew to the Russian space station Mir as a space fleet participant. A run, uncrewed mission, relevant, run, run to moon exploration include Salin, which orbited the moon, and Hibosa 1 and Hibosa mission to return the gust grain sample from the moon and return it back to Earth. Also, there is agreement between the US and Japan as a Japanese astronaut to go to space, and it, uh, but it will be funded by US. But the nature of the agreement was not fully announced. You see, next is CNCA, which is a Chinese space agency. Let's talk about in detail. China Space Agency is just, exa is just one of the three independent countries involving in it. It has sent several astronauts in space and launched two space stations. It, uh, the most recent mission by, by China to moon is the Changi probe in 2019. It was the first spacecraft to soft land and spacecraft in the lunar hemisphere. It also has, China has made a world record in it. China has does not have moon exploration for its five-year plan, but eventually expanding the human's presence in space and also on Mars. Let's talk about the Mars race a little after it. The European Space Agency is an intergovernmental organization of 22 member states dedicated to space exploration itself. It consists of 2,200 staff and has an annual budget of 4.9 billion euros. The countries responsible for European Space Agency are Austria, Belgium, Kyrgyz Republic, Denmark, France, Estonia, Finland, Norway, Sweden, Hungary, Ireland, UK, Switzerland, Romania, Italy, Poland, and many other countries are also involving in, the, in, in, the, in European Space Agencies, DLR. German Center for Air and Space Fleet Program is responsible for Germany's aerospace, energy, and transportation research for Germany. 
It cooperates with numerous national and international authorities who are in research on space for research and development. DLR acts as German Space Agency and responsible for implementing the German Space Program on behalf of the German Federal Government. It, it is funded by the German ministers. As of 2020, it has an annual budget of 1.261 billion euros. Next is ACI. ACI is to regulate space exploration activities for Italy. And it is and it is new for the space exploration. It cooperates with numerous national and international partnerships who are well versed in research and development. ACI is responsible for both drafting the aerospace program and implementing it. Italy also gives European Space Agency to Council of European Countries and also tells its interest in foreign collaboration. The blue origin. Let's talk about the private companies involving in space race. Space race, Blue Origin LLC is an American spacecraft manufacturer, launcher, and space flight communicator. It is founded in 2000 by Beth Jejos with the stated goal, with the stated goal of launching many spacecraft to the space. Blue, Bo, Rob Mizoram joined Blue Origin in 2003 and served as the company's president before leaving the company in 2018. Bob Smith is the current CEO of Blue Origin. Blue Origin is headquartered in Kent, Washington. It also makes rocket engines for the United Launch Alliance and also to the US. US has, Blue Origin has got two point, $275 million from NASA led to United States of America for sub-landing flights and lunar landing objects. It also has sent a spacecraft to space, a new Shepard rocket, which is an NS-23 mission, but it was a failure in September 2022. NS-6 SpaceX. SpaceX was founded in 2000 by Elon Musk with the stated goal of reducing space exploration costs. SpaceX is an American, American satellite manufacturer, launcher, and communicator. And, with, and do, while reducing the cost of space exploration, colonization of Mars become very easy. Also, SpaceX has made numerous achievements in space. These include the first private company to send a liquid propellant rocket to space, and the first private company to send an astronaut to the International Space Station, and the first rocket to the International Space Station, and the first private company to send humans on space, and the first private company to send, recover, and, or, and recover an orbit and spacecraft. It has launched several rockets. It includes the Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, Starship, Blue Starship, Crew Dragon, Cargo Dragon, and also heavy satellite launch vehicles. And also the Inspiration Mars include the mission to Mars and a crewed mission to Mars that too. But the nature of the agreement was inactive to in, since 2015. Mars race, or the race to Mars, is a competitive environment between many countries who are well versed in different space races. And many scientists think it as a new space race. Also, SpaceX has, has also in, informed that it could be a base on Mars soon, and due to which the great colonization mission of Mars would come true. But the CNCA, the China Space Agency, and the American Space Agency, NASA, are on a tactic to put humans onto Mars. The top 10 space agencies. The number one agency is NASA, which is, which, which is created by Dwight D. Eisenhower at the second position is European Space Agency, which, which consists of a bunch of European countries involving in it. And also the third one is CNES, which is a French space agency. And the fourth one is RK. The fourth one is NEXA, which is a Japanese space agency. The fifth one is the Russian Space Agency, RFA. And the sixth one is TLR, the German, the German Space Agency. The seventh one is ACI, which is an Italian space agency, and it's the seventh position now. The eighth one is, is our own country, ISRO, to be a proud to say this right now. 
the ninth one is C and C A, which is a China, China Space Agency. And tenth one is B and S A, which is a Britain Space Agency. Now let's talk about the future space race and how it could be. Back to the moon. Apollo 17 was the last crewed mission to moon in 1972. So the Artemis mission could be launched, which is launched in 16 November 2022, with the stated goal of creating a base on Mars and people could move on Mars. It includes the, it, it will land on Mars in 2024, and also it includes the first woman, woman on moon. Also, SpaceX has informed space tourism activities in 2023. So this includes competition for countries to colonize moon. This is a photo of the Adramedis mission when it, was, when it could land on Mars. Moon, it, we could discuss it brief in Artemis mission in detail. Artemis mission is a robotic human exploration program create, which is funded by four space agencies. NASA, American Space Agency, NEXA, Japan Space Agency, along with CNCA, which is a China Space Agency, and Canadian Space Agency, and European countries, involving in European Space Agency. And the Artemis mission's main aim is to create a permanent base on Mars, due to which the trip to Mars become very feasible, and they could soon a base on Mars. Mars colonization. The people could move to Mars in 2030s to 2040s. But the only downside of this is could take approximately 500 days to reach from Earth to Mars. SpaceX has also informed based on Mars, due to which there could be a competition. And NASA has also informed to set a base there. Also, Elon Musk stated that we are going to nuke Mars. You hear me correct, to nuke Mars, due to which the poles of Mars could contain water in it. So water content could come down and melt to water, and the CO2 in the ice could warm the plant. But there is also disadvantages in it. The, the st are many, uh, there are many dust in Mars, as it contain electromagnetic things. So if when we are nuking Mars, the, ma the, the atmosphere could come into this that's due to which the colonization of Mars could be more, not be more efficient. Also, uh, uh, SpaceX has also made the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy star ships into making a fuel as methane, due to which Mars atmosphere contain methane, due to which the trips to Mars to Earth become very easy. <laughs> the conclusion part. Many, while we are colonizing other planets, as we could see aliens, what if aliens were more superior than us, and Earth was the only planet to contain life in it? To answer these, all of this question, NASA has sent a James Webb telescope. James Webb telescope has sent beautiful images of the galaxy and found more than 5,300 exoplanets outside our solar system. In that, 59 are potentially habitable. The nearer one is Praxima Centauri B, which is 4.3 light years away. If we move on the speed of light, it could take us four years, three months to reach there. But with our current technology, it could, re it could take 75,000 years to reach there. It could take more than 7,800 7, 7, generations to reach to Praxima Centauri B. The 90% habitable exoplanet was found as Tacit 1e, which is found in the transit star system with this 359 trillion kilometer away from us, away from us, or which is 1,200 light years away from us. On nearing future, there could be a more important thing to colonize Moon and Mars by the near in this century, and to searching exoplanets for a near future and colonize other planets above our solar system. This is a photo taken by the James Webb Telescope. See how beautiful it is. I want to thank my school management for giving this wonderful opportunity. I thank my teachers and my parents and my friends to give, the, give their time to speak there. I end my lecture by saying a quote which was told by Yuguri Gagarin. I, was, I have been lived on space. I could live and die on space itself. 
it describes the beautiful image of galaxy and describes the beauty of space. Thank you. A warm greetings to all our present here. And I'm Chandresh from Gray 9C. I'm here to present a lecture on the topic, our mental health, importance, and stigma. So first, let me explain the structure of my lecture. First, I will, I will be explaining the introduction, the negative aspects of the topic. Next, the positive aspects of my topic and the general knowledge, facts, psychological facts, and then the conclusion. Our mental health importance and stigma. Mental health, mental health refers to a person's psychological, emotional, and social well-being. What you do, what you think, and what you act is known as mental health. Mental health refers, uh, also refers to the absence of mental disease and the presence of good health. One definition has been the accepted worldwide is that mental health is the state of cognitive and behavioral well-being of a human. Stress is a common factor that we face in our daily life. A baby from a birth to death, we are facing stress. School student, college student, adult, and even our grandparents face stress. Stress makes your mind more contaminated. The only solution for that is yoga and meditation. Yoga shares your physical health in 50% and mental health shares uh, in, your mental, in your mental health at 50%. This can be understood in a simple concept that even in your school, you might see you have an equal period time duration for physical health and mental health. And now, what are the common benefits of meditation? Meditation is likely to be more related to my topic. It improves your brain concentration. The concentration level of your brain should be increased in order to, to be a topper of your class. It improves your breathing efficiency. For concentrating on our work, how meditation helps, it also helps in a, a captivating the lungs and improve the breathing efficiency increases pain threshold. What's pain threshold? In order to overcome any diseases or any other physical diseases or impacts that you have, it's known as pain threshold. Laxes your mind. As I told before, it, you might be at a stress. At times, if you do meditation, it's very important for a man to do that. It induces physical relaxation. Not only helps in your mental health, it also helps how to develop, in order to develop your physical health and your physical relaxation. It might be muscle cramps or more and more. It reduces emotional explosions. What is emotional explosions? Sometimes you may, you may be at a happy mood. Sometimes you may be at a sad mood. Sometimes you may be at an angry mood. This changes dramatically in a day, nearly for 10 to 15 times. Actually, guys, that shouldn't be there. Always maintain a constant mood to your mind. That might, that might be happiness. Have a joy, joyness and a smile always in your face. So it, can, it helps you with connect to other people. It also lowers blood pressure and helps you connect with others. As I said before, the cognitive state and behavioral well-being of a human. Behavioral well-being of a human. How you will be at a behavioral moment when you converse to others, you will be at a behavioral well-being moment. So meditation helps most commonly in your whole life. Meditation is nothing but take up your hands and gently put on your thighs. Close your hands and make a stress-free mind and be happy in your life. As we spoke about stress, meditation keeps, is the only solution which keeps yourself calm and pleasant. Stigma. What's the term stigma? Why is that used in my lecture? Yes. Stigma is often an unfair feeling that rises in the human mind. The negative aspect of thinking that rises in human beings' life is known as stigma. Really, there's a severe lack of mental health awareness in a country. I literally saw four things 
which made me realize this. The Ministry of Women and Child Development, I repeat, the Ministry of Women and Child Development said that it's okay to hit children and that it was better in her generation. The children were hit and not taken to psychiatrist. Has this taking to psychiatrist is a horrible thing in today's modern world, right? This, sta this statement by the Ministry of Women and Child Development uh, in, was posted in Twitter. Nearly 10 million people had read this message. But each and everyone commented it in a negative manner. Let me say a psychological fact here. Psychology says that a human always absorbs first the negative thing of anything that happens before him while you're connecting with others. The children were hit and not taken to psychiatrists. And even I'm taking it in a negative manner as we, we are seeing in a daily life that in, Many of the countries have rules and regulations to not hit children. The technology, the modern world has been changed. IICU, Pelengluru, and University remove ceiling fans to prevent suicides. According to them, suicides happen only because of ceiling fans and not on other matters. Other matters in the sense, parents forcing their children to take random courses like IIT, JEE, NEET, UPSC, and none among the toughest exams in the world and push them into another life. The worst part of it is that this is what the major, the major of a country thinks, and not the minor. Suicide prevention should definitely happen. And I'm here to ask a big question. If you have a real courage to face suicide, why don't you have a real courage problem and overcome the problem? That's a big question mark. And it's your duty to answer that question mark in your life. A private hospital doc doctor has been dragged by an unknown number, nearly for a week. At last, she took some overdosage of some kind of anesthesia and been dead. This caused a huge mental illness more than 20 million people who saw this message. Uh, uh, she, he or she collected all his personal details and that started to threaten her. As she's a doctor, she took overdosage of some kind of anesthesia and been suicidal. What is the cybersecurity part of the government doing? In 2013, Flip Butkin, a psychiatrist student, found a game called Blue Wave. Not really games give you happiness, right? Or anyone here who does not like games or does not have a close relationship with games. Every one of you like games. But this game is not a game which gives you happiness. It is a game which leads to death. Let me explain in depth. It first, in first five levels, it will ask you to do some random task like uh, what a normal game asks you. But it contains 50 levels. At the last level, it will ask you to fall from your terrace. And nearly 30 million people have, have watched this news and been, uh, got mental illness. So that shouldn't be there, right? And this is just for general knowledge, as this is a CBA report of the death cases. Some might have no evidence and some have psychological autoplay. Stigma is actually classified into three types. That's self-stigma, public stigma, and institutional stigma. Self-stigma refers to take ourselves in a negative manner, consider ourselves as a bad one, and not any other one who says as bad. So always consider yourself as a good one and who have full of positive thoughts in your mind. Public stigma is known when you tease others or rag others. So that shouldn't be there, right? Institutional stigma refers to the disc discrimination. Discrimination should it occur on the basis of anyone's or religion. Because that might cause a huge mental illness or lack of mental health in everyone's mind, right? Even you think that human beings only get mental illness, even animals and birds get mental illness. How? We have home and shelter to live. But we start to destroy the home and shelter of animals, that is forest. And they cannot, ex ex they cannot explode their uh, actual explosion, emotional explosion, but they can feel inside themselves, as they also have sense. 
even birds. And now, exam causes also mental illness. Until the grade of nine, you would not realize this. But after com completing your ninth standard and entering to the tenth, you will know, to, you'll know how exam causes mental illness. If students score low marks, there will be three subdivisions of classes. A for average, A for topper, B for average, and C for below average. So are you crazy? No. Separation of classes also have mental illness. How? If a child scores high mark, he'll be pushed down to A class. And if a child scores low mark or below average, he'll be pushed to C class. And you and your friend, starting from your kindergarten, and you have been separated, start to feel lonely. Now you can understand that in small, small matters, we have lack of mental health. And it's our duty to answer all question marks. Watching serials and dramas. B, grandparents, our parents, even we watch serials and dramas. That also causes huge lack of mental health. And because the audience start to expect what's going to happen, the next. Expectation is the word highlighted here. The audience start to expect what's going to happen the next day, next hour, or the next week. So that expectation leads as that to their life, and they start to forget what's, gonna, what's going, what's happening around them. Take everything as just a problem or a solution, not as your life. This is a very important thing that's happening in this modern technological world. Watching mobile phone in kids. Kids use mobile phone more and more. And their eye may get radically damaged. The UV rays may fall on their eyes and they might get mental illness. For a normal human being, IQ level is up to 12% to 13%. But it has been get reduced if children start to watch more mobile phone. So parents are always expected to watch, uh, to make their children to watch phone at a limited level. Phone should be part of the life, not our life. Of mental disorders are said to be as mental health. Mood disorder, anxiety disorder, personality disorder, psychotic disorder. These are four classifications of uh, mood disorder, disorders. First, mood disorder. Sometimes you might be at a constant joyful, happy, relaxed, indifferent, rebel way, confused, sad, anxious, and angry. So these all are common kind of reactions that you, that you converse with others, right? Always start to be with a smiling face and maintain a constant mood so that human is the more superior species in the world. He can crack all his disabilities and make it as abilities. Whatever he wants, he can discover that. For that, his highly developed brain makes him useful for that. But sometimes, people tend to ignore the state of their minds. So that's actually explained in mood disorder. Anxiety disorder. First, let me explain what is the main cause of anxiety disorder. Have you ever heard the term heart attack? Yes. The anxiety disorder is the base reason for a heart attack. For a normal human being, anxiety shouldn't be there. It causes nervousness and stage fear. Always be happy and spread positive thoughts. Personality disorder. You might see your grandparents or parents sitting with their neighborhood and discussing about their problems and your problem. You might take their family problem as your problem and make it as life. Again, I repeat, problem may be a problem and not as your life. So that also causes lack of mental health. Psychotic disorder. Before explaining this, I would like to exp uh, explain a small concept about this. Psycho or psychopaths. This term, your parents might be used to say, hey, psycho, like that, in an angry mood. But now I'm in a jolly mood and I'm saying uh, psycho. Psycho, also Crystal clearly mentioned as psychopaths. Psychopaths are because of lack of mental health. They have mental illness. They become expectant because they're not getting correct love and affection from people. 
they are at the extreme level of mental illness. So, nothing. The only solution for that is special care and affection. A study published in 2020, Joker, a movie, is an extremely violent movie about a psychopath who start to kill others because of mental illness. So I said, I'm repeating again, the only solution for that is uh, yoga and meditation, love, care, and affection. And now this is for your gender knowledge and facts. Types of mood disorders in seasonal affective disorder. People who develop a deep depression mindset always in winter. And spirits lift only with the coming of spring. Do we know who are spirits? And why are we actually celebrating Halloween? Spirits are not connected spiritually, in religion or not worship. They're con con connected with our mental, mental health. And they're mentally connected with us in a lot. They cannot live like this. They will come around, uh, their memories will come around our mind and start to circulate. And that's why you always remember your grandparents or forefathers. Suffer annual depressions. Annually, you'll get depressions before the day of New Year. Because on the day you have to celebrate light, before the day you, you, you will see what are the financial activities that have happened over the year. Play also a role. It is a hormone which causes a huge depressions. And now, What's psychology? I think every one of you heard this term psychology because the study of human and human mind is known as psychology. It's an interesting subject. You might choose that for your career. Now coming up to the positive aspect of the topic, it's very important for me to first start with creativity. Creativity is something that you face in your daily life. You apply it in your handwriting, calligraphy, art and crafts and etc. Whatever your talent you have, you exhibit that with your creativity. It's upon your thinking level. Spending time with family improves your mental health for both your parents and yourself. So it's good to uh, spend time with your family, right? Or anyone here who does not like to spend time with their family? Everyone likes to spend time with their family, as that's a happy and playful manner we play with them. Cooking is a joyful activity. It is a fun activity. It improves your mental health. You can do cooking with your family, friends, relatives, and anyone. So that also improves your mental health. Reading enhances knowledge. Reading enhances really lots and lots of knowledge. Also, you'll be benefited with fluency in English while you're conversing with others, lack of grammatical errors while you're speaking or writing. So, reading book contains and enhances knowledge actually, contains a number of benefits. Achievements. If you actually engage with any number of activities in your life, you will never have stress. But if you take it in sad mode or at a constant angry, you will be with stress. If you immerse into any number of activities with joyness, that will uh, convert into lack of stress and a gain of mental health. And now, it's time to conclude my topic. Mental health also is a term of importance and stigma. It is, very it is very important for a man to take care of his mind. And now, let me recapitulate what I've actually uh, conveyed in my lecture. First, I've explained what's mental health, how mental health would be, and what's the structure of mental health and then about stress. And the only tip for that is yoga and meditation. Yoga and meditation. And more, we have seen some gender knowledge and facts. And about university, uh, who remove ceiling fans to prevent suicide, and a comment of Women and Child Development, Ministry of Women and Child Development, and a game in 2013, which was found by Flip Batkin. And then about case and CBI reports, a psychological facts, and positive aspects of a topic, which includes reading books, cooking, and, ex uh, and etc. And now, mental health can be taken both in importance and stigma manner. But why don't we go on the right path? We always should choose the right path in our life. 
in order for that, our highly developed brain should be at a psych psychology of making good decisions. So first, you should know how to make decisions in your life. And then thank you for this wonderful opportunity that my school management has provided me. I extend my thanks to teachers who have supported me throughout the lecture journey. And I thank also my friends who motivated and molded me into this position. That was a great opportunity for me that I have ever in my life. Thank you once again. Good evening. My name is Shivesh. I am from grade 9C. Today, I am going to give a lecture on speedy development of India after independence. After gaining independence from Britishers in year 1947, 15 August, we Indians face numerous challenges and we have mixed feelings. Because there was a partition between Hindu and Muslim, which lead to division of India into two parts. One is India and the other is Pakistan. During this partition, many innocent peoples were killed. Apart from this, India faced other problems like illiteracy, poor economic, and there is no big industries, so there is no good economic growth for India. The first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, laid a strong foundation to make peace and harmony among the various citizens. Education played an important role in development of India. Prime Minister Nehru saw that there were more literate people, so he promoted education across the India. In our day-to-day -day life, we face many challenges like what to eat, what to wear, and where to live. Similarly, India also faced many challenges. Nearly 8 million refugees had came to India because they were forced to evacuate and came to India in seeking of jobs, house, and money. There were 562 princely states under control of Maharajas and Nawab. The government of India want to make these 562 states as one country so that people will be united and be happy. The Sarda Vallabha Patel, he is the deputy prime minister of India. He made the uh, most of the princely state as one country. So he is known as Iron Man of India. Discrimination. There was discrimination between upper caste, lower caste, religion, gender, and even in languages. In rural areas, in farming sectors, agriculture was based on monsoon. If there is monsoon, crops will grow and people will have food to eat. But if there is no monsoon, crops will not grow and people will don't have food to eat, which will lead to poverty and famine, so that people will start suffering. In non-farming sectors like barbers, weavers and carpenters, these were also affected. Because if there is no food to eat, so they will fall ill. If they fall ill, so they should go to doctor and they don't have money to give to their doctor. So they will suffer a lot. In urban areas, people working in factories, they will live in slums area. And they don't have rights to education, water or other public places. India want to give them a place to live and give them a right to what they need. India want to make the irrigation system good and agriculture uh, development also good. So they introduced five-year plan like Green Revolution in year 1960. India had an aim to develop the India. So they started a space program. They transported the rocket parts in ox cart or cycle. In, the, in year 1960, India had started Green Revolution. With the help of technology, India had made a huge development in agriculture. India is the first largest producer of pulses and second largest producer of wheat and rice. After 10 years, India had started white revolution. With, it is also known as Operation Flood to make a deficient country as a milk capital. India produced 22% of world's milk. After getting independence, India had launched first nuclear test under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. It was generally denoted as Smiling Buddha and people kept the name as Peaceful Nuclear Explosion. The word Smiling Buddha came because on that day Buddha Jayanti was there. 
So Indian scientists kept the name as Smiling Buddha. After getting independence, India had launched many programs to curb diseases like malaria, TB, AIDS, and polio, and many other diseases. In 2014, India was declared as polio-free by World Health Organization. India had made a huge development in infrastructure. The government of India took some initiatives like uh, increasing transportation networks, energy system, telecommunication, and urban infrastructure. In, uh, India has some of the major projects like Bharat Mala, which make the connectivity of the roads, and Atal Tunnels, which make the connectivity of the tunnels. India had an aim to boost the trades and the economic growth for India. The government of India also focused on the renewable energy infrastructure with the help of uh, solar energy and wind, er wind energy so that the uses of fossil fuel will be less and the global warming level will, will be decreased. India had developed cities into smart cities through some initiatives like promoting sustainable development and implementing advanced technology. The government of India had improved in telecommunication so that it has improved in broadband connectivity and which has increased the internet access and opportunities of the persons. Still, India had to support its population and economic growth of India. A constitution is written. B. R. Ambedkar is the father of constitution and he is the chairman of drafting committee. He had an important role in framing the constitution. Between December 1946 to November 1949, there was a serious constitution assembly. This assembly was very serious and nearly 300 Indians had came to this meeting. This meeting was about political system of future India. This meeting was held in Delhi. It was chosen in Delhi because Delhi is the capital of India and it is in center part of India. So the meeting was held in Delhi. The, the constitution was formed in January 26, 1950. It gave equality and justice among the various citizens. This constitution gave three features to the citizens. First feature, universal adult franchise. People above 18 years old, they can elect their representatives into power. Nowadays, it has changed to 21 years old. The prime minister who changed to 18 to 21 years, he was Rajiv Gandhi. Universal adult franchise took away discrimination regard social, economic, and political discrimination. The first election was cancelled twice, and it was held in year 1951. Because nearly 17 crores eligible voters elected 3,200 MLAs and 489 members of Lok Sabha. Only 15 persons of voter were educated. Thus, India was vast and complex. In the first draft, nearly 40 lakhs women name was not considered. By seeing this, the first election was cancelled twice and it was held in year 1951. As a democratic country, we fought for decades to get independence from Britishers. In return, we were blessed with right to vote. To vote, we need some documents like Aadhaar card, PAN card, voter ID, and other government documents. Second feature of the constitution, equality. This feature gave equality to the, all the citizens, regardless religion, gender, and even in languages. Some people said that our India can be as a uh, religion-based country and as a Hindu country and other religion can leave our country. But people, they don't speak, uh, hin they, they are not uh, Hindu, they should go to other country. The, but they were against this creation. The Prime Minister uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Deputy Prime Minister Sardawal Patel and other Congress members. They said that our India cannot be as a religion-based country. The, uh, beside Muslims, there are other religions like Christians, Jews, Buddhists, and other religions. This feature gave equal job opportunities for the, all the religions like Hindus. 
third features of the constitution. The constitution of India gives special privilege to poor and disadvantaged people. People, they don't have money. People, they don't have food to eat. People, they don't have place to live. So they can get benefits from this feature. The practice of untouchability, which was a stigma and stain, was a fair name of India, was abolished. Adivasis or scheduled class were also granted seats of job. Out of 489 seats, 25 seats were for them. In the percentage, we can say as 5.11 percentage of seats were granted to them. India had introduced three subject lists to make an equality among the various citizens and various governments. They are union list, state list and congren list. These lists are very beneficial for India because it made a clear division of powers among the various governments. Union list. It is controlled by uh, state, uh, central government. It look after taxes, defense and foreign exchanges. State list. It is controlled by state government and it look after education and health. People are not treated well. People are not getting good education. The school of the fees is high, so they can consult with state government and they can help in their matters. Congren list. It is controlled by both state government and central government. The opinion of the central government would be taken. The state government can say their opinion, but it would not be considered. They look after forest and agriculture. If people are not getting good food, so they can consult with either state government or central government. Is Hindi the national language? Back in 90s, when some people said that Britishers had left the India, so why English language should be in India? It should also live and replaced by Hindi. But people, they don't speak Hindi, they have other opinion. They said that if English language should be removed, they would form uh, another country, those who don't speak Hindi. By seeing this, constitution came at the final decision that Hindi would be the official language, not the national language, because Hindi is a language which is more spoken in India. But English language would be in India, it would be not banned from India. It would be used in services, codes, and communication between two peoples. How were states formed? Back in 1920s, when Indian national government gave a promise that after getting independence, that each linguistic group would get a place to live. But after getting independence, they didn't take a single step, which provide a huge disappointment among the various speakers. The Malayalam speaker, Karnataka speaker, Telugu speaker, and Marathi speaker, and other speaker, they came with a demand for a linguistic state to live. The strongest protests came by Telugu speakers, in year 1950. When Nehruji went on a campaign during the general election in year 1952, he saw a black flag written that we want Andhra. The after many months, on October 1, 1952, uh, the Vajrayan Gandhi named Putti Shri Ramahulla, he had came on a hunger strike in demand for Andhra Pradesh for Telugu speakers. After 58 days of hunger strike, the Porti Sri Ram Hullat passed away. In the news it had came, the entire Telugu speaker came in chaos. They said that now, without him, how would we get a place to live for uh, Telugu speakers? There were many conversations. Finally, the central government were forced to give a separate state to live for a uh, Telugu speaker. On October 1, 1953, a new state has formed named Andhra Pradesh. By seeing this, other linguistic communities also came at a demand for a linguistic state to live. In year 1956, a remote uh, report came out and saying that how many states are there and how many speakers are there and how many parts will be for them, or it is beneficial for India or it is bad for India. There were many meetings kept in Delhi. Uh, the large Hindi-speaking nation was also divided into many parts. In year 1960, the Bombay was divided into Maharashtra and Gujarat. 
after six years, the Punjab was divided into Punjab and Haryana. Planning for development. India had an aim to develop our India. So they have some of the objectives like uh, lifting India and Indians out of from poverty, building modern technicals, building large industries. So there will be economic growth for India and other countries people can attract it to it and come to India to buy goods. So there will be economic growth for India. In year 1951, in year 1950, uh, there was a broad agreement between state sectors and private sectors. These sectors are very important because it uh, gave a job creating industries and it has to produce many goods so that there will be good economic growth for India. In year 1951, the first fire plan was introduced. It was mainly uh, in, focused on the economic growth for India and it gave many strategies to uh, how to uh, get a good economic growth for India. After a few years, in year 1956, a second five-year plan was also introduced by India. This was mainly uh, focused on the uh, big industries so that uh, goods will be go export from the India and there will be economic growth for India and other country peoples can attract it to it and come to India to buy goods. The, uh, these sectors were under control of state government. India had implemented many five-year plan. The last one was 12th five-year plan. This was from 2012 to 2017. NITI Ayog, the National Institute of Transforming India. It was established in year January 1, 2015, which has replaced the planning for commission. And it is very beneficial for India because it gave many strategies to overcome the problems and how to make a good uh, economic growth and how to make a good progress in social development. It has promoted sustainable development and it has reduced uh, poverty and inequality in the country, in the India. The idea of planning for development came in year 1931. Finally, after World War II, in year 1951, it was implemented after getting independence. India had made a huge development in space technology. The Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, was established in year 1966, 1969, which has an aim to develop the space technology. The Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, has launched Mars Orbitary Mission to Mars on November 5, 2013, through PSLV C-25, the name of the mission was Mangalayan. ISRO has launched many satellites and rockets, and it has launched Chandrayaan-1 lunar mission, which has found water molecules on the moon. The India's first uh, satellite was introduced. The name of the satellite was Aryabhat. India had launched 10 satellites through PSLV C9 and setting a world record. ISRO likes to promote space education uh, for the every children. So it kept a program named ISSO, Indian Space uh, Science Olympiad. Through this, uh, the students can learn about space education and they can build their own satellites. The first uh, human space mission of India is scheduled in future. And it, the name of the mission is Gaganyaan. After this, uh, India had launched another program named Student Satellites Program. In this, students are allowed to design, build, and launch their small satellites to any planets. The first, uh, the first student satellite was uh, named SROS-1. It was successfully launched. The, by seeing this, ISRO encourages the every students to learn the uh, space education and they can build, own they can build their own uh, satellites. Let's see some achievements of India. India, had, ha, India has a free press. India has kept many um, uh, gen general uh, elections. India has uh, independent judiciary. 
still india is a democratic country other countries like saudi arabia and pakistan they are shifting to a democratic country and to army country the in those days the average lifespan of indians was approximately to 32 years to 35 years coming up to 2023 it has increased to 72 years to 75 years uh, india had a good india had improved in uh, education and they had kept uh, planned many education system india had uh, made a huge achievement in sports in cricket uh, india had won two world cups in year 1983 and 2011 and cricket uh, badminton pv sindhu has won many tournaments when pv sindhu went to 2016 rio olympics she saw uh, she had won a silver medal for the india in the athletics in, uh, when uh, neera chopra went to 2021 tokyo olympics he had won gold medal for india in javelin india was a once a hockey nation till 1980 india had won gold medal india's economic system is good and it ranked at fourth india's defense system is good and it ranked at fifth in those days the symbol of the middle class family was a car named maruti 800 the person who has a maruti 800 car he was known as the richest person in india the first person who bought the maruti 800 car was given the car key by the prime minister indira gandhi let's see some problems in india on the other hand india has some of the problems like discrimination there was discrimination between upper caste lower caste religion gender and even in languages there was clashes between religion and gulf between uh, caste in some part of india there are still water issues which uh, people are still suffering a lot in some part of india people are doing more blackmailing and they are getting more money so they can they will become rich and they can eff- uh, they can get effort they can afford a big house they can afford uh, uh, they can live in they live in uh, five star hotels and uh, they can afford education for their children on the other hand uh, poor people they can afford education for their children they will live in slum houses they will live in pover- uh, they will live, they will go to poverty they, they don't have water supplies and they don't have good food to eat in real sense there is no equality before the law conclusion of this lecture india had made many uh, various achievements in various field india had some of the challenges like building india there were 562 562 princely states which uh, the government of india want to make as a country they want to make the irrigation system good and uh, reduce the poverty level and discrimination level and people will be happy there this were the challenges of india which they have overcome and india as a top rank india is still facing uh, some of the problems like discrimination and discrimination and poverty which the government of india is still rectifying in overall journey we can say that india has a great success thank you hello everybody i am pranav aditya of great na i am here to take a lecture on the topic how to raise a fish in home in right way fish makes both beautiful and entertaining pets whether you are a beginner or an expert there are few basic fish ownership method to follow to keep your fish healthy and happy so ensure that your fish is comfortable with the right size tank and appropriate plants and decoration some fish can live for a long time so establishing a cleaning and feeding routine will make the fish ownership more fun and less stressful learn about the nitrogen cycle the nitrogen cycle is nothing but how your aquarium stays clean without it your fish may be stressed out and likely to pass away yearly the first step to the nitrogen cycle your fish feces this waste contains a toxic chemical substance called ammonia ammonia which is also produced by the leftover food in the fish tank so be sure you are not overfeeding them the ideal level of ammonia in your fish tank should be 0.25 parts per million the beneficial bacteria called the nitrosomonas bacteria digest the nitrates and turns it into nitrates 
which is visible in a brown film in a fish filter. Before getting your fish, run your filter for a while, run your filter for a while and put fish food in the fish tank to feed bacteria in it. When a brown film appears in your fish filter, you should not wash it. It is nothing but the nitrosomonas bacteria. If you wash it, your fish will be suffer from ammonia poisoning. The third thing is nitrates are toxic to your fish. The ideal level of nitrate in your fish tank should be 0.0, .0 parts per million. The beneficial bacteria, called the nitrobacter bacteria, digests the nitrates and turns it into nitrates. It is also visible in a brown film in a fish filter, as well as the nitrosomonas bacteria. Nitrate should be kept below 20 parts per million. Plants assist in removing nitrates. Plants like Java moss, Java fern are some examples of this. But you should do at least one fourth of water change every week to keep the nitrates level down. The cycle starts again when you put fish food in the fish tank. So you should only buy your fish when the tank is fully cycled. That means the nitrate and ammonia should be 0.0, .0 parts per million and the nitrate should be below 20 parts per million. The second thing, how to choose your fish? First of all, you should choose whether it is a freshwater fish or saltwater fish. Freshwater fish is the best choice for the beginners, and it requires low maintenance and easy to take care for. And they have only less aquarium health issues. And these are low cost, and it is easily offered by the beginners. Fishes like goldfish, placos, guppies, or some example of freshwater fish. Saltwater fish can be only maintained by the fish experts because they have many health issues and they are hard to take care for. And they are quite expensive. Fishes like saltwater angelfish, clownfish, or some example of this fish. However, they are quite beautiful. Go with a small breed. Small fish are peaceful breeds and they require a smaller tank and making them a good choice for the first time fish owners. Fishes like tetras, zebra danios, octocniclus are some example of this. Some fishes are thought to be kept in the bowl. Fishes like goldfish and pita. And they can, actually, they cannot kept in the bowl because they can quite grow quite larger. The smallest fish tank you can ever keep is three gallons. Few, there are two types of small breeds, schooling fish and soling fish. Schooling fish swim together all the time, whereas Swirling fish only swim together when they are afraid. We need parents and friends to feel safe. Same way, the fishes also require companion fish to feel safe. Choose the companion fish very carefully. While choosing the companion fish, you should go beyond the color and appearance and focus on the behaviors instead. Most of, usually, you should either put aggressive fish or non-aggressive fish together. If you mix the type, Usually, the aggressive fish will attack the non-aggressive fish and kill them. Fishes like goldfish, guppies, or some example of non-aggressive fish which can coexist friendly in a single tank. And fishes like angelfish, chichil, are two types of aggressive fish which can live often together in a single tank without harming one another. The fourth thing is, you should get your fish from a reputable dealer or store. While choosing from store, you have added security of seeing the actual fish you are going to buy. And most of the stores also have a refund that if your fish dies prior to due time, you can exchange the fish and can get some accessories. But if you choose the reputable dealer, you will forget all those choice and you have a main advantage in it. Because you have a main advantage that you can choose a varieties of fish breeds in it. In Tirpur, we don't have 24K gold on Aravana so that we can import this fish from other states like Bangalore or, Hi Bangalore or Karnataka. Setting up your tank. Get the right size tank first of all. The larger your fish will grow or the more number of fish that you have will require a larger tank. As a general rule, you should have, if your freshwater fish can grow till one inch, you should have 4.5 liters of water in the fish tank. Same way, if a saltwater fish can grow for one inch, you should have 2.5 liters of water in the fish tank. However, this rule doesn't apply all the time. Some energetic species such as shrimp require more room to thrive. And you should also consider the bio loads of the how 
bioloads is nothing but how much ammonia a fish will produce. Higher bioload fish require a larger tank. For example, ghost, goldfish, ghostfish, flacos are some example of this. And smaller bioload fish require a smaller tank. Place your tank in a good location. Your fish tank can be quite heavy, so invest in a quality stack. After getting it, try not to move too often. And you should avoid keeping the tank in direct sunlight to avoid algae growth. And you should keep in the minimized ground level to, to overcome the possibility of tipping over. And there is a good rule that you should not smoke where your fish tank is there, because the content produced by the smoke will affect the water quality in your fish tank and will reduce the oxygen level in it. And also, if you have uh, pets or if your fish jump from the fish tank, try to buy uh, lead for the tank to avoid deaths due to jumping over. Install your heater. Most of the, heat, most of the fish will require a specific temperature. To maintain this, you want a heater in placed in the tank. Most of the fish require 72 to 84 degree Fahrenheit. Some fishes like goldfish require cold water to live. So this can be maintained by the heater. You should, uh, there are two types of heater which will stuck, st stick in the side of the tank and some will go, go under the substrate. And you can, you can see how to place the heater in the tank on the back side of the direction placed in the heater's box. Install the filtration system. There are three types of filtration system. Mechanical filter, chemical filter, and biological filter. Mechanical filters are good choice for the beginners because it doesn't require more maintenance. Mechanical filter will reduce the pollutants present in the tank. And mainly, filter means it will reduce the pollutants and catch debris, which is the fecal matters. Biological filters have active bacteria, which will maintain the chemical level present in the fish tank. Chemical filters have active carbons, which will absorb the pollutants produced in the tank. But you should keep your tank near a functional electrical socket, because you need to make, plug many devices, such as light, filter, and heater. Add in your substrate. A good thumb rule is that you should have one gallon, you should have one pound of substrate, such as sand, rock, or gravel, subs, uh, gravel for one gallon of water. Select and place any decorations in the tank. Most, um, mainly, most of the people choose plastic, plastic products because they are easily maintained and easily, uh, it is easily washed. And if, before placing the decorations in the tank, you should wash it because it will have many pollutants and germs in it. And you should choose a Choose a decoration which will not harm the fish because the plain smell might fake and it will have sharp objects. The fishes, um, you, you, there are many types of decorations. You can even add um, sword like drift tool structure or rock. If you place a drift tool, you should choke it for water for 30 minutes and keep, the, keep it in the wa cold water for one week to. To, uh, to maintain it. Select and place any plants in the decoration. Most of the, f most of the fish owners choose plastic plants because they don't know the benefits of a live plant. Before placing the live plant, you should also wash it because it will have some bacteria which will harm the fish. Even take my ex own example, higher fishes like guppies, which will give birth at any time. So, it, Usually, the mother fish will eat the uh, fries. So to avoid that, I place the plant named foxtail. So the fries, after giving birth, the fries will go and hide in the plant, and it will also produce some uh, oxygen to them. And mainly, condition the water and fill up your tank. Before adding the water, you should give them a dechlorinating agent, which will which will uh, kill the bacteria present in them. And you should not add a new water. You should add only the water which is already maintained and cleaned. Float any new fish when you buy. 
most of them will release their face when they buy from the store so that it will get a shock and die between, die soon you should float a face for 15 to 30 minutes to accumulate because the uh, water temperature in your fish store will be different from the water temperature in your fish tank so usually if you float the fish in the tank for 15 to 30 minutes it will accumulate and the temperature will be same so that your fish will be get adapted to the temperature in your fish tank some fishes like octocni class require drip irrigation for that you need to hold a air tub placing a tube which will produce one one drop of water per second for 30 after 30 minutes you can release that fish in the tank so that it will get adapted to the temperature so we can also help the fish not to die soon because it will not get shock if you do accumulating maintaining your tank and fish don't overfeed a good rule is that you should do you should only feed the fish twice a day and the so, uh, the size of the eye is enough feeding usually some fishes require a larger food like fishes like koi carp require more food but fishes like guppies require a little amount of food if you feed the same amount of koi carp's food to the guppy it will get choke, food choking and it will also cause many diseases like ammonia and nitrate spike test ph level weekly the the specific ph level in your freshwater tank should be 6.6 to 8 if the ph level is too low add crushed coral to the fish tank if the ph level is too high you can add peat moss to the filter or add driftwood to the tank it will create the water to uh, pale yellow but it is completely safe for your fish do weekly pa partial water change most of them will clean the tank by by removing all of the water if you remove all of the water most of the fish will get shock and die prior to due time so if you change 20 to 30 percent of percentage of a water it will be enough for freshwater fish it requires 20 to 30 percentage of water change but saltwater fish it requires more like 70 to 80 percentage of water if you don't have filters or anything you can add rock salt to the fish tank so it will kill the bacteria clean your filter media in the filter if it's close to overflowing most of the fish owners like me will clean the filters thoroughly but you should not you should only clean the fish fil filter media the first part of it if you clean all those things the ammonia and nitrate level will be reduced and your fish will be suffering from ammonia poisoning and you should if you remove the all filter media it will also increase the ammonia and nitrates level and with the nitrate level will be about 20 parts per million treat any health problems most of the fish will have swim bladders like goldfish which will swim upside down so avoid that you can add like healthy foods like broccoli or boiled peas to them and if you have a ill fish you should remove and keep it in a separate tank because the disease may spread to all other tank fishes creating a stimulating environment for your fish pick out a tank that's at least two feet long you will think it is a larger tank for a small fish but think of that you are living in a jail for a one year what will happen same way your fish will also need a bigger tank most of the fishes like koi carp can grow quite larger so that you should have more than like three to five feet of tank so it will live for a long time fill the bottom layer of the tank with substrate or some other some other to dig to make the fish to dig and enjoy usually children will like to play in the soil right same way the fishes also like to dig around the soil and they will get food inside the soil so you can add a substrates like color color rocks sand or colored gravel semen before adding them you should wash them thoroughly and you should slightly put them in the tank if you put a very harsh the fish tank might broke provide tunnels or nooks to the for the fish to hide in most of the fishes like chichils ghost fish uh, like to hide for a long time they will only come out of the tank come out of the hiding place when they when you feed the food food to the fish so if you provide safe 
tunnel for the fish to hide, they will feel safe and they can enjoy swimming around them. Place, place objects like fake plants in the tank to stimulate their brain. You should add plastic plants, but it should not have saw edges or the plane should not flake, so that your fish can, live, uh, fish can enjoy swimming around them. And most of the fish, you can keep a small ball, in, a floating ball inside them, because they will like to nudge the ball and push it uh, around them. Add a mirror to the size, side of the tank for fish to look at easy, in reflection. Most of the fishes like beta fish or flower on will live alone. If you add any other companion fish, they will attack them and kill them. So to make them feel safe and enjoy, you can add a mirror in the side of the tank so that they can see their reflection and can enjoy for a long time. But some fishes like chichil will attack, the, attack its own reflection so that you want to see their behaviors and should place the tank near them, place the mirror near them. So switch out or add new objects every once in a while to keep the fish engaged. See, your, see um, if your fish have the same decoration all the year, it will be boring for them, so that you can change decorations on them, and even you can give them some toys to play in the tank. Interacting with your fish. Spend time watching your fish to relax yourself. Psychologists also prove that watching your fish will make you feel calm and reduce stress. So if you see the fish swimming around, you will also get stress-free. Train your fish to follow a target if it's just getting to know you. You can dip your hand in a water and can place a piece of food in them, and you can keep above the surface level of the water so that the fish will jump and catch it. So it will make the fish and you very enjoy, so that your fish will also feel safe with you and it will notice you when you are coming near them, they will thought that you are going to feed them. So there are many cool tricks to teach your fish. Even your fish can jump like three to five centimeters above them, above the surface level of the water. Some fishes like goldfish, beta fish can do this trick. And you can also encourage your fish to push a ball. The ball should not be quite heavy and it should float. The size of the ball should be the size of their head so that they can easily push. You should, be at, you should give attention to them. Whenever they are touching the ball, you should give the piece of food so that they will keep on uh, nudging the ball to get a treat. Avoid tapping on the glass to get your fish's attention. If you tap, tap on the glass of the fish, the fish tank may break or they can hear the, lose their hearing abilities. And some of them get shocked and likely to hide all the time. Keep the fish healthy. Feeding your fish the right amount for its species and weight. Ask your fish shop owners to how much you should feed per piece so that you can easily know that how much pieces of food you can feed them. Also, you should feed the right, right species of food to the fish breeds. Think, if you eat a grass, it is not possible, right? Same way, you should give a specific number of food and amount of food to the specific species. Use a gravel sink pond to clean out the tank. The, your fish tank can be quite heavy so that you cannot hold them and hold them and cross them to fill the water down so that you can have a gravel sink pond. You can keep it then and press it so the water will come out easily. But you should do only 20 to 30 percentage of the water, water change. And it will also re, uh, remove the debris and mucus present in them. Change 25 percentage of the water out each week. As I said, freshwater fish will require 20 to 30 percentage of water change, and the saltwater fish require 70 to 80 percentage of water change. Choosing a dry fish food, you are fish then. Research your fish, fish species. As I said, what will happen if you feed a guppy fish food to the beta fish? It will eat, but it will also die because you are feeding them a wrong species. You should ask uh, fish experts to what fish food you should feed. Most of them will feed that uh, pellets that will in color of green and red, but it is harm to the fish. You should not feed them. There are specific 
specific food that can be fed to the fish. And also you need to choose that. There are bottom feeders, middle layer feeders, and top feeders. So if it is a top feeders, like koi carp and etc., you should have a floating pellet. If it is a bottom layer fish, fish uh, you should require a uh, you should require shrinking pellet, and if it, uh, some fishes like catfish will have their mouth upside down, so that it, they can only catch their food when the fish food sinks and come to the soil level, so that you should have sinking pellets to them, and you should check the protein content in the fish. Uh, usually, fish will require 5.6 of protein to a fish. But usually, you can feed broccoli or some vegetables to the fish to make them even healthy. Make sure your fish food is small enough to your fish to eat. Like, as I said, if you have a bigger piece of food and feeding your guppies, what will happen? They will try to eat, and they will get cho uh, food choking and die at due time. And um, if you follow my steps, you will, get to, you will maintain your fish tank easily and you can reduce the uh, fish deaths due to these things. East or West, fish is the best. Thank you. They may come through. Welcome to On and All present here. I am Priyadarshan of grade 10A, and I am studying in Frontline Millennium School, Tirupur. Now, I am going to lecture on the topic, the cultural history of sports. From hard-fought combats to nightly tournaments, and hunting to games and gamblings, sport has been central to human culture. The cultural history of sports is all about the extensive history from classical antiquity to today covering all forms of aspects of sports. The cultural history of sports are divided as antiquity, medieval age, renaissance, the age of enlightenment, the age of industries, and the modern age. The documented history of sports goes back at least 3,000 years. In the beginning, sport was often involved in the preparation for war or training as an hunter which explains why so many events include such as throwing of spears, stakes, and rocks, and sparring one-on-one -on -one with opponents. With the first Olympic Games in 776 BC, which includes events such as food and carriage racing, jumping, wrestling, and discus and javelin throwing, the ancient Greek introduced the formal sports to the world. Movement was seen as an obligatory life activity among humans during primitive ages who viewed movement as a lively activity. The need to be constantly prepared for the certainty of the life struggle gave humans a rare physical fitness which involves muscles as well as nerves. At this point, sport was emerged out from the exercises and the competitions that the athletes should prepare their body and mind for war, and this played a major role in the development of role of sports in the development of sport culture. Although the ancient Greek strove to ensure that the Olympian athletes were able to perform at their peak, equal importance were placed on critically examining the nature, purpose, and values of sports and physical activities in Greek life. In the ancient world, the greatest success an athlete could achieve is to win the Olympiad crown. The Olympiad Games were held for every four years for a thousand years from 776 BC to 393 AD in honor of Zeus. The traditional date of founding of Olympic Games was 776 BC, but its unofficial date was back further. In the ancient Greece, the Hera Games was conducted for only women for every four years, and only young girls, not married women, were allowed to participate in these competitions. In the ancient times, between 500 to 300 BC, the champions were seen as a special people in the period when the feasts were made for the purpose of worshipping gods. All sports-centered activities were launched to end up 
the religious civil war that were taking place. The Athens school system was totally based on critically examining the nature, critically examining the nature, and its aim was to develop, uh, develop physical, mental, and moral attributes of the citizens of the city-state. Thus, the physical training system, gymnastic, were emerged for the first time. When a healthy perception of life developed, education, in which physical, physical training played an important role, gained importance. Various competitive gymnastics remained the preserve of athletes, and the competitions of holy games were also returned to round up the list of competitions. Sports was considered as physical training for health, and competitive gymnastics were also highly regarded. Unlike other Greek civilizations, Spartan women were, uh, were practiced and trained physically. For Romans, some body movements served the preserve of purpose for preparation for war and the military. Romans received physical training as war exercises. Activities suitable for Romans. War ambitions were used to create their own human ideal type, a strong, huge muscled four square man. The Olympic Games was banned by Emperor Theodosius I in 393 to 4 AD. Another dimension of the sporting lives of the Romans was their penchant for spectator oriented activities, epitomized as chariot racing in the circuses and gladiatorial battles in the amphitheaters. During the Middle Ages, Women were excluded and the physical training carried out in the name of recreation and not in the name of sports. The ancient education system was imitated during the Renaissance and in the 15th and 16th century BC, the school training system was begun again. An overview from ancient times to the Renaissance. The Greek educational ideal which emerged during the 8th to 6th century was aimed at developing the generous fitness via gymnastic as well as the music of our body. That is, developing the body, spirit in an harmonic body, in this way providing a beautiful body, mental development and spiritual and moral hygiene. These were expressed by the word Kalokagatya, which means both beautiful and good, based on the words Kalos and Agathos. Thus, the use of physical training and sport as the most suitable means as discussed in the first ancient Greece. To achieve the ideal Kalakagatya, three conditions were required. They are nobility, correct behavior, and careful teaching. Physical beauty is just not referred to the external appearance. It also refers to the mental health. The humans who had these qualifications was considered as ideal humans. The vital point of aristocratic culture was physical training. In the sense, it was sports. The children were practiced for various competitions under the supervision of Pedro tribes, a physical education teacher, and learned, uh, and, and learned wrestling, boxing, discus and javelin throwing. The aim of the sport was to develop and strengthen the body, hence the character. In the ancient Greece, the children attended wrestling schools because it was believed that playing sports will beautify the body as well as the, as well as the human spirit. The, uh, the palestra was a special building within the ancient gymnasiums where physical training and wrestling were practiced. The education practiced in this era, covering, covering gymnastic exercises and music education. And its aim was to develop a heroic mentality, but only for the royalty. With this goal in mind, education aimed at disciplining the body, raising an agile warrior by developing a cheerful and brave spirit. The Renaissance movement, which emerged, which emerged in the Europe who, and whose ideas informed the modern world, 
and developed many theories related to physical exercise as well as education. And this attempted in, up, in applying these ideas in various ways. The development of these ideas carried out in the age of enlightenment. The concept of education and approaches to physical training during the renaissance. The word renaissance means rebirth. The humanist educational model, which was concordant with the epitome of the renaissance, was miscellaneous creative idea. And its aim was to create an all-rounder advantage human being, homo universal. At the same time, such an education ideal required the necessity of the aristocratic character. This epitome has no longer provided education to the students at the school. In the 14th century, the humanism life epitome was claimed. The humanism movement was gradually developing and spreading. However, in this phrase, humanism-based formation and practice was not in question. The necessity of the physical training along with the education have been emphasized. And because of this reason, physical practices and uh, games have been suggested for only young peoples. It is possible to see how the humanist formed the foundation of the Renaissance, work started from 14th century to the 18th century, and working from Italy to Spain, Germany, France, and England. Almost all of the humanists stated the significance of the sport in their own, own written works on education. One of the humanists, Vittorina D. Feltre, have, may have seen it as a most pleasant goal in his life to raise a uh, group of teenagers and fed and, whose, and, they, and they were educated poor but talented children in his home. Feltre was also learned classical education in his school, which was known as Joyful Residence. In accord with the ancient Greek educational concept, he claimed that benefits were provided by the, by the education on basis of body and soul through daily practices such as swimming, riding, and swordsmanship and generating love. 196 Harmandar Demiral and Ildiran towards nature via hiking and he also emphasized the importance of games as well as tournaments. Enia Silvio di Piccolomoni is also a worthy for attention alongside his religious character. And he also thought that the physical training should be emphasized in uh, emphasized and this beauty and power should be improved in this way. D. Piccolomoni attracted attention towards the importance of education, importance of education in the seventh century. He, uh, Juan Ludwig Weiss, a systematical philosopher who had multiple influences, in one of his written works, D. Tridentis Disciplinus, which was published during the 1531, advised such practices as competitive ball throwing, hiking, jogging, wrestling, and braggartism should begin from the age of 15. Popular games and their history. Golf. The game of golf was dis descended from a game which was originated in the kingdom of Fife on the in on the eastern coast of Scotland in 17th century. While there were similar other games in the parts of Europe, which includes swatting a rock with a stick around a predetermined course. Uh, the sport as we know it includes the innovation introduction of the golf hole, which was invented during uh, the mid 15th century. The game of golf and soccer suffered from something of a setback. As Scotland prepared to defend its border against English invasion, the, the rising popularity of games was thought to be responsible for men and neglecting more useful, 
more useful pursuits such as archery and swordsmanship. The golf and soccer was officially banned in Scotland in 1457. This prohibition lifted in 1502 with the signing of Treaty of Glasgow. In the 16th century, King Charles I, King Charles I popularized the game of golf in England and Mary Queen of Scots, who was a French, she, uh, she uh, influences this, uh, this game of golf, golf to his homeland. The, f the first references to golf at Scotland's most popular, most popular golf course was uh, St. Andrews was in 1552. The clergy people allowed the public access, public access to the link of the following years. The golf course at Leith near Edinburgh um, was the first to publish a set of rules, um, set of rules the, for the game of golf. And in the 1682, it was also a site of first international golf matches during which the team was pairing the Duke of York and George Patterson, who was played for Scotland, bet two no, English noblemen. In 1754, the, in uh, St. Andrews Society of Golfers was formed. Its annual competitions relied on the rules of, relied on the rules of uh, Leith. And in the, uh, 1759, the stroke play was introduced. The first 18, 18 hole course was constructed in 1764. In 1895, St. Andrews inaugurated the first, the first women's golf club in the world. Boxing. The earliest evidence of boxing can be traced back to the Egypt circa 3000 BC. The, the boxing was considered and uh, introduced to the ancient Olympic Games in 7th century, in which time boxers' hands and forearms were covered, were bounded with soft leather thongs for protection. Romans later traded these soft leather thongs for metal studded gloves called cestus. At this point, after the fall of Roman Empire, the boxing has totally died out and did not make any comeback till the 17th century. When boxing made its own Olympic debut in the 1904 Games at St. Louis, the USA was the one and only country who entered and as a result took home all the, all the medals and certificates. Since its initial admittance to the Olympic program, uh, the sport was of, uh, involved at all of the subsequent games, with the exception of 1912 Sc Stock Hall Games, in which the boxing was outlawed there. But Sweden was not one and only place where fisticuffs were illegal. For a better deal in the 19th century, boxing was not considered as a legitimate sport in America. The bare knuckle for bare knuckle boxing was outlawed as a criminal activity and boxing matches were were raided regularly by the police hitting with different extremities of the body such as kicking and punching as a human aggression has excited around the world throughout the human history being a combat system as old as as old as wrestling thus in the term of sport competitions due to the lack of writing in the prehistoric times and lack of references it was not possible to determine rules of any kinds of boxing in prehistoric times and only in ancient times it can be inferred through some intact uh, intact sources and references to the sports the origin of the sport of boxing is unknown but according to some sources it has a prehistoric origin in the present, which was attempted in the 6th millennium BC. When Egypt invaded Nubia, they learned the art of boxing 
by the local population and took the sport to the Egypt where it became popular. The earliest visual evidence of boxing from Samar and Egypt both in the 3rd millennium BC. The boxing from, uh, from Egypt has spread to many other countries including Greece, eastward to Mesopotamia and northward to Rome. The relief sculpture of Egyptian Thebes 1350 BC shows both spectators as well as the boxers. The earliest Middle Eastern and Egyptian depictions showed the contest where boxers were, were uh, clenched fisted or had a band to support their wrist. The, uh, the earliest evidence of gloves can be found in Minoan Crate, 1500 to 1400 BC. Various types of boxing was existed in India. The first references uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the Vedic epics such as Rig Veda 1500 to 1000 BC and Ramayana 700 to 400 BC. The Mahabharata describes the, the two combatants boxers with clenched fists and fighting with finger strikes, knee strikes, kicking as well as head bowls in the, in the time of King Virata. Hockey. Ice hockey was played, in a, was played between two skaters, uh, each having nine players, um, with three, diameter, three inch diameter, 76.2 millimeter vulcanized rubber disc called puck. This puck was often frozen, often frozen in, the, in the high level games because to reduce the amount of bouncing, bouncing and, uh, and friction on ice. It was mostly played in North America, Europe and to various ex, uh, varying extents in the, in the many countries in the world. It is the popular game of Canada, Finland, Latvia, the Czech Republic and Slovakia. This ice hockey was the national sports, national sports to the to Latvia and national winter sport in Canada. Same as this, hockey was played uh, with three inch diameter, but not vulcanized rubber disc. It it was played with a wooden disc, and this uh, hockey was first played in Canada in 1875. In at Victoria Skating, Victoria Skating Rink, and I conclude that sport is the uh, is the uh, is the major to develop our uh, body and human spirit. Thank you. Black holes are some of the strangest and most fascinating objects in the space. They are extremely dense with such gravitational attraction that even light cannot escape from their grasp. Hello everyone, I am Sindhamalini of Great Tinye and today I am here to lecture on the topic, the mystery of black hole. And today we are going to see black hole discovery, how many black holes are there, black hole images, elements of black hole, types of black hole, how do a black hole die, the theoretical twin and we will end up by saying some black hole facts. Black hole discovery. Before starting, let me uh, tell the definition for the term black hole. Black hole is a place in space where the gravity is too strong that even light is not fast to escape from it. And the gravity is too strong because the object has been compressed into extremely tiny space. This usually happens when a star is dying. Because of no light can get out from black hole, we can't see black holes and black holes remain invisible. And the Milky Way could contain nearly 100 million black holes, though detecting these black holes is a very difficult task. At the heart of the Milky Way, there lies a supermassive black hole known as the Sagittarius C star. This Sagittarius C star has a colossal structure of 4 million times the mass of Sun and lies approximately 26,000 light years away from Earth. The first image of a black hole was captured in 2019 by the Even Horizon Telescope collaboration. The striking photo of the black hole at the center of MH7 galaxy thrilled many scientists across the world. Albert Einstein first predicted the existence of black hole 
with his general theory of relativity in 1916. The term black hole was coined out many years later by American astronomer John Wheeler in 1967, after decades of black hole being known as only theoretical object. The first black hole to be discovered was the Sinus X1. This Sinus X1 is located within the Milky Way in the constellation of Sinus D Swan. And astronomers did, uh, saw the first signs of black hole when a sounding rocket detected celestial sources of X-ray in 1964. In 1971, astronomers determined that these X-rays uh, uh, were coming out from a bright blue star orbiting a strange object. It was suggested that the X-rays were a result of stellar material being stripped away from the bright blue star and gobbled up by the dark object. Here, the dark object is nothing but an all-consuming black hole. Black hole formation. A black hole is formed when a star, which is a mixture of several gases, such as hydrogen, helium, and other elemental gases, become unstable. This instability comes in star when it is about to complete its life cycle and about to die. A dying star can either convert into a black hole or a neutron star or a white dwarf. Most of the stellar black holes are formed by supernova explosions. People may also ask, can our sun turn into a black hole? And the answer is no, because our sun is a too small star and it does not have much mass. In the core of the sun, hydrogen fuses with helium which produces heat and energy. But this fusion reaction is not only for producing heat and energy, but also it produces radiation pressure which uh, which balances the gravitational pull of the sun. Once hydrogen converts into helium, the helium converts into carbon. Once helium converts into carbon, the life cycle of the sun may end and our sun may turn into a white dwarf. But in the uh, gases present in the core of large stars, which is nearly 3 to 20 times the mass of sun, uh, continue this fusion reaction until they form element uh, uh, heavier elements like iron, and beyond which the fusion reaction stops and there is not enough radiation pressure to balance the gravitational pull of the sun. This results in violent collapsing of the core leading to a supernova explosion. After supernova, all that remains is a dense core and hot gas called nebula. If the mass of the uh, star is large enough, a black hole can be formed. Otherwise, the core will become an ultra-dense neutron star. If, the, if for a large star which have the ma mass that a black hole can be formed by direct collapse mechanism and there is no uh, supernova explosion is required. Apart from stellar black holes, supermassive black holes are thought to be formed by these reactions and they grow in size by feeding stars, dust and galaxy, uh, galaxy dust and many more. How many black holes are there? According to Space Telescope Science Institute, one out of every thousand star is massive enough to become a black hole. Since the Milky Way contains nearly 100 billion stars, our home galaxy must harbor some 100 million black holes. Though detecting black holes is a difficult task, and estimates from NASA suggest that there could be as many as 10 million to a billion of stellar black holes in the Milky Way. The closest black hole to the Earth is dubbed as the unicorn. The unicorn is situated nearly 1,500 light years away from the Earth. The nickname has double meaning. Not only does the black hole candidate reside in the constellation of Monosaurus, famously known as the unicorn, it is also incredibly low in mass, that is up to the three times of the mass of Sun, and this makes this black hole a nearly a kind one. Black hole images. And here, I am not going to talk about the images that comes in Google, which is animated. This is the real recorded images of a black hole. MH7 black hole. In 2019, uh, the Even Horizon Telescope collaboration released the first ever recorded image of a black hole. This black hole is situated nearly 1,500 light, uh, uh, 55 million light years away from the Earth. This, uh, this black hole was shown by the telescope when it was examining the even horizon or the past area from which nothing can escape from the black hole. The image maps the sudden loss of photon. It also opens a whole new area in research about black holes. 
And now astronomers know how do a black hole look like. In 2021, astronomers revealed a new view of the giant black hole at the center of MH7 galaxy, showing what the colossal structure looked like in polarized light. As the polarized light waves have different orientation and brightness, the image shows us the black hole even more in detail. Polarization is a signature, uh, signature of magnetic field, and we can uh, observe that the ma black hole's ring is magnetized. Sagittarius A star. At the heart of the Milky Way, there lies the supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. And the photo of this black hole was released in 2022, and this black hole is situated in the Milky Way. This is an enormous, uh, enormous black hole with 4 million times the mass of Sun and lies approximately 26,000 light years away from the Earth. Elements of a black hole. There are three main elements of a black hole. Outer and inner heaven horizon, singularity, and the accretion disk. So now let's start with the even horizon. Even horizon is the spherical boundary around the mouth of the black hole, past which light cannot escape. Once a particle crosses the even horizon, it cannot leave, and the gravity is constant across the even horizon. According to NASA, a black hole gravitational influence becomes so great that uh, light is not even fast to uh, get out from, us, from it. As uh, Albert Einstein's special theory of relativity tells us, no signal can exceed the speed of light, and humanity can never hope to get a signal from one-way boundary that is an even horizon. These even horizon effectively acts as cosmic gate gatekeepers, preventing us from directly observing the secret that lie in the heart of the black hole. Hence, they can reveal a great deal, of, uh, great deal around the environment around them. To say in simple words about this even horizon, it is nothing but the spherical boundary around the mouth of the black hole, where the gravity is too constant and once a particle crosses this even horizon, it cannot leave. Singularity. Singularity in the heart, uh, center of the black hole it is the ultimate no man's land, where the, uh, where the whole mass of the black hole is concentrated, and all uh, uh, space-time and conception all completely break down. And this singularity does not exist. Something has to replace the singularity, but we are not sure what it is. A crescent disk. A crescent disk is a disk uh, are of, uh, formed by a massive object uh, using gravitational, uh, using extreme gravitational forces, and which pulls the objects around them, creating like a disk-like structure. Typically, this ends, uh, en ends like forming a disk-like structure uh, around the black hole, uh, showing the uh, showing the even horizon, and the uh, it makes the boundary of the black hole. Types of black hole. Scientists have found, uh, found major four types of black hole. Stellar black holes, supermassive black holes, intermediate black holes, and binary black holes. Stellar black holes. Small but deadly. When a star burns through last of its fuel, the object may collapse or fall into itself. For smaller stars, those up to the three times the mass of sun, the core will become a, a neutron star or a white dwarf. But when a large star collapses, it continues to collapse, and uh, the core of the star will become a stellar black holes. Black holes formed by collapse of individual stars are relatively small, but incredibly dense. One of these packs three times the mass of sun into a diameter of the city. This, uh, they gr uh, this stellar black holes also grow in size, by feeding on the stars, interstellar uh, dust, and many more. Supermassive black holes. Small black holes populate the universe, but their cousins, supermassive black holes, dominate. These enormous black holes are even millions or billions the mass, uh, times the mass of sun, but same in the diameter. These stellar black holes are thought to be found in pretty much ev every heart of the galaxy. Intermediate black holes. Intermediate black hole is, is uh, estimated to have 100 and 1,000 times the mass of sun, and for scientists does not believe that the intermediate black holes could exist. But a research have found that intermediate bla intermediate size black holes could also exist in arms arms of spiral galaxies. 
in 2014, uh, a study reported that there is an intermediate black hole in the center of an armed spiral galaxy. In 2021, astronomers took advantage of an ancient gamma ray burst to detect one of these intermediate black holes. Binary black holes. Binary black holes are thought to be formed by two theories. The first one is that uh, when a two star in a binary form revolve them each other and in their life cycle, which leads to formation of a black hole and they continue to revolve around them, at one point they will uh, merge and form a supermassive black hole. The second one is uh, a supermassive black holes attract a stellar black holes from other side. The, these ones, uh, these one, uh, when stellar black holes reaches it, it starts to revolve around the supermassive black holes and slowly the supermassive black holes uh, consume the stellar black holes. How do a black hole die? A black hole, uh, the, the ultimate fate of our universe is unknown, but it does not stop the astronomers from finding out what it is. The end of our universe may be, it may simply evaporate, and it is same for the black holes. Scientists uh, from Rabaud University were, were examining the uh, Stephen Hawking's special theory of how a black hole died, which was caused by a famous phenomenon known as the Hawking radiation. This theory was predicted by the theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking in 1974. As Albert Einstein, theory of gravity tells that particles from uh, particles uh, uh, form an anhelate in and around the black holes. Stephen Hawking predicted that when a pro uh, particles uh, come out of the black hole, some were stuck into the even horizon. When, once every particle go out of a black hole, the black hole may uh, die. But this does not happen fastly. This needs a billions and a trillions of years. The theoretical twin. The theoretical twin is nothing but the white hole. This white hole acts opposite to black holes. When, uh, why, as nothing can escape from a black hole, nothing can enter into a black hole. There is a theory that uh, a, a black hole from one universe is connected to a white hole from another universe through a wormhole. Once a particle enters this black hole, it passes, uh, passes through the wormhole and reaches this uh, white hole and it is scattered out of that university, universe. These, uh, these uh, white holes are also formed when, uh, when a black hole is going to die. But these were a theory and this was not proved yet. Black holes fact. The, when you fell into a black hole, the theory has suggested that it, uh, you may fall into the black hole. There, uh, when you fall into a black hole, you may stretch out like a spaghetti, which causes the spaghettification but you will die before you reach the singularity of the black hole. Also, there, uh, there is an another theory that the even horizon are the walls of fire. When we enter the even horizon, our body will burn. The myth and fact. Black holes suck, but black holes really don't suck. The suction is caused by uh, pulling something into the vacuum, which the massive black hole is definitely not. Now I conclude by saying that black holes are one of the strangest objects in the universe, but we have found what it is, but we are not sure what is inside the black holes, and we need to find everything in the universe. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am Sarvesh K from Great NU. Everything that can be automated, that will be automated. With this quote, today I am going to start my lecture on the topic, the history and impact of Internet of Things. Now, let's start with a simple question, what is IoT? The Internet of Things is a physical object or a group of such objects with sensors, processing ability, software and other technologies that connect and exchange data with other devices over the Internet or other communicable devices. The Internet of Things has been considered as a misnomer because they should not be connected to a public Internet. Instead they should be connected to a private network and be individually addressable. 
the field has evolved due to the convergence of multiple technologies such as ubiquitous computing, commodity sensors, increasingly powerful embedded systems, as well as machine learning. Traditional fields of embedded systems with wireless sensors, home control systems, automation, including home